पीछे से खुलते इधर से खुलेगा
very warm greetings for the day, everyone. I am Sejal Chopra, and with immense joy and enthusiasm, I extend a warm welcome to our distinguished faculty members and all delegates and dear colleagues to this first of its kind one day CME on radio pharmaceuticals, chemistry to precision medicine, organized by the Department of Nuclear Medicine, PJIMER, under the aegis of Indian College of Nuclear Medicine. This CME will serve as an access for experts and professionals in the field of nuclear medicine, facilitating exploration and discussion of latest advancements, trends and challenges in radio pharmacy. With a captivating area of keynote speakers, interactive sessions and an open QA session ahead, our aim is to nurture collaboration and allow the exchange of knowledge among the delegates. In this sense, we look forward to an enriching day, brimming with insights and fruitful discussions. So, on board with that zeal and joy, the organizing committee extends a heartfelt welcome to our chief guest for today, Professor Naresh K. Panda, Dean PGMR Chandigarh, the head of Department of Nuclear Medicine, Dean of ICNM, and our guiding mentor, Professor B.R. Mittal, Secretary of ICNM, Dr. Kanaya Lal Agarwal, Professor Anish Bhattacharya, Department of Nuclear Medicine, PGI, and Professor Baljinder Singh, former president, SNMI from PGI. Your presence here today is deeply appreciated, sir, and we are honored to have you all with us. I would now request the organizing secretary, Professor Jaya Shukla, to escort our chief guest, Professor Naresh Panda, along with other esteemed dignitaries, Professor B.R. Mittal, Dr. Kanayalal Agarwal, Professor Anish Bhattacharya and Professor Baljinder Singh to the stage for the inaugural ceremony. very much. Now we'll proceed with the inauguration ceremony. I hereby invite Ms. Komal Preet Kaur to extend our gratitude by presenting a bouquet to our Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Naresh K. Panda, on the Department of, uh, on the behalf of Department of Nuclear Medicine. Thank you, sir. I now invite Ms. Aarti Agarwal to present a bouquet to the Dean ICNM, Professor B.R. Mittal, as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Parina Malik to present a bouquet to the Secretary of ICNM, Dr. Kanaya Lal Agarwal, as a gesture of our gratitude. I now request Ms. Zehra to present a bouquet to Professor Anish Bhattacharya as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, sir. I now request Ms. Sakshi to present a bouquet to Professor Baljinder Singh as a gesture of gratitude. Thank you, sir. Dear faculty members and delegates, let us commence this CME by seeking the divine blessings of Goddess Saraswati, the embodiment of wisdom, art, and eloquence. I kindly request everyone to offer our respects through the Saraswati Vandana. May our endeavors be guided by her grace always.
Inauguration ceremony. I now request our chief guest to light the ceremonial lamp, signifying the illumination of wisdom and prosperity. May I request Professor B. R. Mitral and other dignitaries on the dais to kindly join him. Thank you. Thank you. everyone. Now I would like to coordinately invite Professor B.R. Mittal to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guests and delegates. Good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone. Professor Naresh Panda, Dean Academic PGMR, Dr. Kanhaiya Lal Agrawal, Additional Professor and Head, Nuclear Medicine, Ains Bhavaneshwar, and Secretary, Indian College of Nuclear Medicine. My colleagues, Professor Baljinder Singh, Professor Nish Bhattacharya, Professor Jaya Shukla, invited faculty, faculty colleagues, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Nuclear Medicine and Indian College of Nuclear Medicine, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you for today's CME program on radio pharmaceuticals from chemistry to precision medicine being organized under the aegis of Indian College of Nuclear Medicine. At the outset, I must extend a hearty and warm welcome to Professor Panda, who has kindly consented to grace the occasion by being the chief guest for today's event. Thank you, sir, for being here with us and gracing the occasion. I also thank Indian College of Nuclear Medicine Governing Council for consenting to have the academic activity on this radio pharmaceutical first of its kind under the banner of ICNM. <coughs> Nuclear medicine nowadays has become part and parcel of every specialty, especially the oncological management of patients. And radio pharmaceutical form the backbone for this specialty. As we see day by day, daily we get newer and newer development in radio pharmaceuticals and ultimately for the oncological treatment, oncological diagnosis, it's very, very important. And the new radio pharmaceuticals have revolutionized the cancer care and these bring new optimism to the field of nuclear oncology. Precision radio pharmaceuticals accurately target tumors while minimizing damage to healthy tissue. So targeted radio pharmaceuticals offer new hope for longer health spans. We all know like about uh, now it is nearly 80 years when Iodine 131 
was discovered and used for the treatment of <coughs> thyroid disorders. Nowadays is the era of theranostics, that's a pair of radionuclides which can be used for diagnosis as well as therapy. So in such gallium-68 and lutetium-177 form such a pair, and lutetium-177 these days is being used for so many treatments like neuroendocrine tumors, prostate cancer. It has, in fact, revolutionized the treatment of prostate cancer using lutetium-177 PSMA, and it has become a very useful therapeutic radionuclide. Although preventing cancer may still be a moonshot, but advancing towards a healthier future appears increasingly within modern medicine's grasp. Targeted radiopharmaceuticals coupled with advancements in diagnostic imaging and treatment planning enable the physicians to map the precise location and extent of tumors and deliver radiation doses with unparalleled accuracy, maximizing therapeutic efficacy while minimizing side effects. With collaborative efforts to refine therapies and expand access, precision approaches promise longer and better lives for millions of people worldwide. The goal is clear to translate longevity gains over the past century into tangible enhancements in lifelong health and well-being. Precision radiopharmaceuticals represent a step towards better, longer lifespan and better lives for all. Dear delegates, we hope this CME will refresh and enrich your knowledge, not only in your everyday practice, but also your patients and ultimately the society in large. Dr. Jaya has taken a lot of efforts to plan this science day pro program, and I'm sure you will definitely gain from this. I wish all the participants a pleasant stay in the, this city beautiful. I once again warmly welcome you all. Thank you very much. Jain. Thank you, sir. Your expertise and welcome address has truly inspired us as we embark on the CME. Now I kindly invite Dr. Kanayala Lagarwal, Secretary of ICNM, to share a few words with us. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Professor Panda, sir, Dean, uh, PGA Mayor, uh, Professor Mittal, sir, my mentor, Head of Department of Nuclear Medicine and the Dean uh, ICNM, uh, Professor Bajinda, sir, my teacher, Professor Anis, sir, my teacher, and Dr. Jaya Sukla, who has done a very good, uh, very good uh, uh, scientific program for this CME. I'm here uh, from the side of ICNM, so already Mittal, sir, is there as the Dean ICNM. But uh, it is always good to be here, where you have made so much, so much of memories uh, as a uh, SPGI is my alma mater, and you have stored that memories. So meeting friends and uh, everyone, there is no doubt that, that, un, that this is the uncontested truth that PGI always gives the best academic feast in the nuclear medicine. Uh, ICNM is the uh, basically the academic wing of the SNMI, which has the uh, mandate of doing the or uh, spreading the academics in the nuclear medicine inside the fraternity and also outside the fraternity to the other colleagues of the branches. And we are doing this job by uh, encouraging our colleagues to do the ICNM activities. And I am thankful to uh, Jaya Madam that uh, she uh, collaborated uh, with ICNM and. Uh, uh, it's our honor as the uh, ICNM uh, office bearer that we have collaborated with Jaya Madam. Uh, Dr. Mittal is always the uh, great leader in showing the academics and uh, we can see the this radiopharmaceutical CME which is from the chemistry to the precision medicine and uh, someone has greatly said that Suno tum khwab dekho, main use pura karke aata hu. It is, it, the talk has to be bilateral always in the radio pharmacy and the nuclear medicine clinics. Otherwise, uh, if you made something and you don't give it to the clinic and you talk, don't talk, it won't be fulfilled. It can't come into the practice. 
and also if the practitioner can't say you what is the limits of where we are lacking so probably the radio pharmaceutical people won't make a good trace of for you so with that uh, i won't take much time and best wishes for this academics and um, it's good that i met dr pandas sir just one line i think he remember or not i met him last in 2015 december in the second floor of the aims academic building so i was having my interview and he just met me uh, sometimes you make just 10 seconds of presence make lot of difference and i still remember there was lot of confusion clouds uh, around me when i thought whether i should join a institute where everyone is denying and uh, he was just coming out i came out of the interview room dr rakesh sir and dr bal sir were still inside and sir told oh you have come from he recognized me and uh, he told you have come to join here oh you will be the founder faculty member and that word founder faculty member i still carries that weightage because uh, that actually when i was uh, balancing my uh, should we join or not that point i think i still remember so sometimes it 10 seconds of your talk with someone uh, makes some great difference so thank you very much uh, to the pgi mithal sir jaya madam baljinder sir for allowing me to be here thank you thank you sir and that was truly an inspirational speech for all of us now i humbly request our esteemed chief guest professor naresh k panda to grace the podium with his presence and deliver his address to our delegates and faculty members uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen um, professor b r mithil head of the department and dean indian college of nuclear medicine professor baljinder singh uh, dr kanaya agarwal professor jaya shukla professor anish bhattacharya other dignitaries uh, in the audience um, faculty members and dear residents first of all i would extend uh, my thanks to the organizers to have given me this invitation to grace this occasion uh, and meet all of you i am particularly happy to see dr kanaya agrawal uh, doing so well and uh, i must appreciate your appreciation for your teachers which will actually stand you in good stead this doesn't come so often these days and keep it up this attitude you get immediately by saying there your teachers you get their blessings immediately so keep it up dr kanaiya um uh, thank you very much and this uh, cme is we all know and um, congratulations to the team leader professor b r mithal i know him for many years to have made a wonderful department stand alone department of nuclear medicine he is again the founder head of the department of uh, nuclear medicine here we all know as a as a i also have interest in head neck surgery and i know the the uh, you know the great faculty members which this department can boast of you they are available on 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 a on a phone call immediately they will solve your problems i am really greatly impressed by their sincerity and dedication to man, patient care and i think credit goes to dr b r mithal and the other team members of the department one thing which uh, i appreciated i was looking at the program and the program says the future looking at some of the you know youngsters being given an opportunity to talk about future because this is one thing where the youngsters can keep their mind and can come out with what's the plan for the future the youngsters are the future of our country and dr gijaya very good you know these sessions are important uh, the weather has become little friendly and since it's a one day cme i'm sure people who have come from outside can can visit the city beautiful the flowers are in full bloom you can visit the the rose garden and the lake and the rock garden for which we are famous for Uh, with these words thank you very much all of you thank you dr jaya and dr mithil for this invitation jai hind thank you for your motivational words sir now may i have the honor of requesting professor b r mithil to extend a memento to our esteemed chief guest as a token of our profound gratitude Thank you sir we are truly honored to have you as a chief guest for today 
Now I would like to request Professor Anish Bhattacharya to present a memento to Professor B. R. Mittal, symbolizing our appreciation and gratitude. Now I would like to request Professor Baljinder Singh to present a memento to Dr. Kanaiya Lal Agarwal as a gesture of our sincere obligation. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Jaya Shukla, organizing secretary of the CME, for her vote of thanks. Good, good morning, everyone, the, all the dignitaries and the delegates. It is my pleasure and honor to propose the vote of thank on this occasion. First and foremost, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the PGIMER Chandigarh for providing me a ideal platform to move forward. I extend my sincere, uh, sincere thanks to our chief guest, Prof Professor Naresh K. Panda, uh, Dean PGIMER, for gracing this occasion despite his busy schedule. Your presence has added immense value to this event. Thank you, sir. I would like to convey my special thanks to Professor B.R. Mittal, Head Department of Nuclear Medicine and Dean uh, College of uh, Indian College of Nuclear Medicine for his dynamic leadership and support, without, uh, which has played a pivotal role for organizing this CME. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Kanhaya Halal Agarwal, Secretary ICNM, for extending his, his support for this CME. Thank you, Dr. Kanaya. I am grateful to Punjab Medical Council for granting four credit hours for this event. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Rajinder Kumar and Dr. Harmandeep Singh for unwavering support and assistance in arranging all the logistics. Your dedication is truly commendable. I would like to thank Professor Baljinder Singh, Professor Anish Bhattacharya, Professor Ashwini Sood, and Dr. Har Harpreet Singh for your support and encouragement. My special mention goes to Dr. Yogesh, Somit, Sejal, Arti, Munish, Komal and Abbas for their valuable help and support. Organizing this event would not be possible without you. Thank you, all my youngsters. I am grateful to my residents, technologists, physicists, sisters, and all nuclear medicine staff for their constant support and readiness to help whenever it is needed. A special thanks to all faculty members of PGI, our speakers, our chairpersons, for sparing their valuable time to grace this occasion. I sincerely acknowledge the financial support from BRNS, Department of Atomic Energy, our um, international collaborator, AIP uh, Miami, uh, BJ Madan, Syra Therapeutics, SDS Life Sciences, Biomex Corporation, and Labdos. Your support has been instrumental in the success of this event. I extend my thanks to Mr. Manoj, Mr. Anil, Mr. Sumit, Mr. Nand Kishore, and Mr. Vijay for their logistic support. Uh, a heartfelt thanks to all participants who traveled all th over the India to Chandigarh to make this event a success. And I also extend my gratitude to the delegates who joined this CME, CME on YouTube. My special thanks to print and electronic media personnel for covering this event. Last but not the least, uh, my heartfelt thanks to everyone who was involved directly or indirectly and making this event a success. The, your effort and contribution are deeply appreciated. Thank you once again, everyone for your support, dedication and commitment. Let us continue to strive for excellence in the field of nuclear medicine. Thank you, Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words and dedicated efforts throughout the CME. 
Now I request everyone to please stand up as a mark of reverence for our national anthem. <laughs> everyone. I express my sincere gratitude to all the distinguished faculty members and delegates for sparing their precious time to join us in this inaugural function. It's my pleasant duty to extend an invitation to all of you to join us for a cup of tea outside. Thank you.
I welcome everybody back from a refreshing tea break. So, further embarking on the CME, our welcome session journey of radio pharmaceuticals transposes their evolving landscape and hence uncovering their pivotal role in advancing healthcare and diagnostics. To chair this session, I would like to invite two very prominent fraternities in our field. Professor G.P. Bandhupadhyay, sir, former president SNMI, who also started Radio Pharmacy at Ames, New Delhi, and Professor D.K. Dhawan, UGC Emeritus, sir. and Professor D.K. Dhawan, UGC Emeritus Professor, Department of Biophysics, PU Chandigarh, on the stage. to the chairpersons. Thank you, sir. I'm very thankful to the organizer. I am very much thankful to the organizers of this uh, CME and especially to Professor uh, 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 Mittal and Jaya <laughs> Aging is ah, Now, actually, actual in actual in actual you know meaning, the radio pharmaceutical. It is the backbone of nuclear medicine, or you can say it is the work horse of the nuclear medicine. So first of all, we are going to start our lecture by our prominent speaker, Dr. M. R. A. Pillai, who was uh, heading the radio pharmaceutical section in IAEA about 10-15 uh, years back, and is well known for his uh, books published by IAEA. So his topic will be on uh, the small is beautiful even in radio pharmaceutical. Actually, it is an economic word. It was started by the, you know, uh, the, the you know, economist of, the, of uh, you know, London who said the, the low economic group is much more influential when you talk of the higher economics. So in this in these words, I am going to call Professor M. R. Pillai for his talk on small is beautiful even in radio pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bandhubadhyaya, and also to Dr. Chavan. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Jaya Shukla for inviting me to this very important CME. In fact, my idea for my wish to attend this uh, CME was the title of the CME. That is uh, Precision uh, Radio Pharmaceuticals, Chemistry to Precision Medicine. So in order to get precision in uh, nuclear medicine, we need good radio pharmaceuticals. And uh, my feeling is that if you want good radio pharmaceutical, that radio pharmaceutical has to be small. <coughs> so this is the point which I am going to emphasize on my 30, 20, 30 minutes. 20, how much time? 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. In my uh, next 30 minutes, I will be emphasizing that point. Radio pharmaceutical science has been evolving for the last um, 90 years, and I am part of that 
for the last 48 years. So almost about 50% of the radiopharmaceutical science evolution, I am uh, part of that uh, entire science. I had been seeing that growth of radiopharmaceuticals from a very, very small faculty to one of the most important faculty in the medicine. Today, nuclear medicine is much well recognized, acknowledged, and sought after by every medical faculty, every medical faculty for accurate diagnosis and niche therapy. You know, how are these wonderful molecules, radio pharmaceuticals, uh, have come into picture? This is very important. It is like, you know, it's a discovery of a radio pharmaceutical is like an idea picked up by a scientist, by a chemist, from somewhere. For example, in the 80s, uh, people had already prepared a lot of technetium radio pharmaceuticals for uh, liver, kidney, excretory function, those sort of the things. Then people wanted actually a radio pharmaceutical for the heart and the and brain. And there was a proposition that neutral lipophilic complexes can permeate the blood-brain barrier. And at the University of Missouri, Columbia, a professor called Murman was working with a ligand called PNAO for nearly 20, 25 years. You know, he has made complexes of PNAO ligand with all metals, whichever is possible. Then this idea, this uh, Professor David Troutner thought, why not I make a technetium complex of uh, PNAO ligands? He made the technetium complex of PNAO ligands at, and it entered the brain. And that there came our first brain perfusion agents technetium HMPAO with a slight modification from the PNAO and the University of Missouri, Columbia, Professor Troutner had the patent right for this important radio pharmaceuticals. You now, which is the most precise uh, medicine ever invented? I'm not talking about the most precise uh, radio pharmaceutical ever invented. I am asking which is the most precise medicine ever invented. I will clearly put it that it is iodine as inorganic iodide ion. Because it is administered orally, we are eating it like food or drinking like water. And uh, it is taken up by a very precise mechanism called sodium iodide imported protein. Nearly one third of iodine what we ingest is taken up by the thyroids. And if it is a hungry thyroid, it's a carcinogenic thyroid, more will be taken up. And thanks to this medicine, which came almost um, uh, 85 years back, thyroid cancer, at least uh, two types of thyroid cancer, is completely curable and in use since 1940s. And this medicine, what may come, what uh, scientific developments may come, iodine is not going to be replaced with any other medicine for thyroid cancer, that is what my feeling. So it's a small molecule. And how do we get precision in radio pharmaceutical? It is actually the ATME properties. The absorption has to be good. It has to be distributed well. The metabolism has to be good. And whichever is not taken up by the disease, it has to be excreted. And how do we find the pharmacokinetic? How do we find this molecule is precise? We do the pharmacokinetic studies. And the weight of iodine is, um, is hardly 131 uh, Dalton. And uh, very precise mechanism, which all of you know, I am not going to explain. Now, coming, moving from sodium iodide to sodium fluoride, what's the difference? Sodium iodide is allergen, fluoride is allergen. But the radio pharmaceuticals behave differently. It is not seeking the thyroid, but it is seeking the bone. Because the hydroxyapatite uh, particles, uh, hydroxyapatite crystals in bone is able to take this uh, sodium fluoride or simply fluoride ions and concentrate in the bone and more in the metastatic bone. Beautiful radio pharmaceuticals. See the contrast. The image is so beautiful. Uh, I will say a nuclear medicine physician is not needed to interpret this uh, particular uh, image because the radio pharmaceutical is precise. That precision is coming because we are using a small ion of 18 molecular weight to get this uh, precision. Now another molecule, FDG, FDG the molecular weight is 171 Dalton. The glucose is taken up by 
uh, transported through glucose transporter uh, protein and the hexokinase enzyme is uh, further converting it to glucose uh, 6-phosphate. The glucose, 6, uh, trans uh, glucose transporter is able to take glucose uh, FDG to the cells, but the enzyme is smart. This is the property of the enzyme. Enzymes are smart, and we will be using this uh, smart property of the enzymes in developing radiopharmaceuticals later. So this particular uh, blocked mechanism is what is affecting, what is giving us the precision in nuclear medicine. Today, FDG is the best medicine, best uh, radiopharmaceuticals for imaging proliferative diseases. Proliferative diseases because this FDG enters into the cell and it is not getting metabolized. So a blocked meta metabolism is also important when we are starting to make radiopharmaceuticals. Now, I cannot um, skip my talk without telling why fluorine is so important. In chemistry, we always talk about the bond energy. Carbon-fluorine bond energy is the highest bond energy you can have it. And that is precisely the reason why FDG is made in Delhi, it is transported to Nepal. It is made in Delhi, it is transported to South. It is transported, made in Chennai, it is transported to uh, Colombo. Because the carbon-fluorine bond is perfect, highest bond. Your FDG, your F18 may decay, but FDG can remain as FDG for that amount of time. This is what God has given to us. This is what, not the chemists have made it, but the chemists have identified it. Now, coming to technetium radiopharmaceuticals, this is where, um, you know, the second generation of um, radiopharmaceuticals came. First generation was actually iodine, hippuran, uh, rose bengal, and other things. Technetium radiopharmaceuticals, look at all the technetium radiopharmaceuticals, whatever we are using it, they are all small molecules. And these small molecules, these small molecules are able to do accurate diagnosis and see that particular image what I have put it. The image of the striatum taken by a um, radiopharmaceutical called Trodat. Trodat is uh, targeting it there. You know, if the molecular weight of this was high, probably such a beautiful image we could not have got it. There was a very beautiful, um, very epoch-making discovery in 1975, the production of monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies, uh, you know, was produced and uh, antigen antibody reaction is one of the highest specificity reaction what is possible very good specificity and i started working with uh, monoclonal anti not monoclonal antibodies i started with antibodies for developing radioimmunosity i am a radioimmunosity to start with it and the moment the monoclonal antibody had come all of us thought all of us thought that we have the magic bullets let us take the monoclonal antibody, radio label it with the technetium, let us label it with um, uh, any therapeutic isotope like iodine or um, whatever was available at that time. And we have the precise medicine. That is what we all thought about it. And I also thought the same thing. I went for my postdoctoral research at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And uh, my project was actually to radio label monoclonal antibodies with rhodium-105. We developed excellent chemistry with the, in the Dr. Troudner's group. Dr. Troudner is on photograph I have put initially. We developed excellent chemistry. As a chemist, we did not fail. We, did, uh, we made a very nice uh, bifunctional chelating agents with which I can label monoclonal antibodies with rhodium-105. And rhodium-105 is a very beautiful isotope. But there were two faults. One, rhodium-105 is a difficult to produce isotope, so not good. And monoclonal antibodies are large molecules with the molecular weight of 150,000. What happens? It has to move, you give the injection of the monoclonal antibody to the patient, and it, the ATME properties are very poor because it is a large molecule. You inject into the blood, it will remain in the blood. It will not go to the tumor for the time what we want it. Then what happens? The radioactivity does not um, know that it does not reach the tumor. The, radioacti the radioactivity is going to be emitted and it is going to irradiate tissues which, are, which don't need radiation. So we have seen the introduction of a few good products. Sevelin was introduced with uh, indium and yttrium labeled. Buxar came with iodine-131 labeled antibodies. 
So unfortunately, all these products got withdrawn from the market because it lacked precision. Mind it, immunotherapy is a success. Immunotherapy using cold monoclonal antibodies is a success. And the problem is when we use it to radio label um, monoclonal antibody with short lived isotopes and try to inject it. We moved on to peptides. In the 90s, there was a very nice um, discovery or very nice invention coming from Krenning's group. Why not we use the peptides? Because peptide receptor interaction, peptide receptor interaction is one of the very good interaction what is taking place within the body. You may have a hormone, insulin is there, but unless there is a insulin receptor in the cells, insulin will not be taken up by the uh, the, by, by the cells. So, enzyme receptor, uh, sorry, peptide receptor uh, binding is one of the well-established mechanism what is taking place in within the body. And then came our dotatate. All of us talk about dotatate. Gallium uh, dotatate uh, gives very nice images, very beautiful images with uh, um, <coughs> gallium uh, 68. And with the lutetium-177, we can have the same uh, targeting. So this is, um, what's the advantage of peptides? The molecular weight has come down. From 150,000 for the antibodies, the molecular weight has come down to, if it is dotted tight, I think maybe 1,400 or uh, 1,500. And nowadays, some peptides, we use it up to about 3,000, 4,000 also. But then the quality reduces. The smaller the peptides, better is the ability. Because there is a very specific targeting because of receptor binding and have very good atme properties. It is absorbed by the tumor, it is a absorbed by the body, distributed well into the tumor, uh, what and whatever is uh, the metabolism is not taking place. That is, once it is in the tumor, the radioactivity will decay, but not the peptide will come out. Then excretion is there that you give 100 milligree of uh, dotted tape to the patient. I'm sure maybe about 90 milligree is excreted. Doesn't matter. That remaining 10 milligree is actually giving the radiation dose what is needed for therapy. So we are all sold out for peptides then. We know that there are not only somatostatin analogs, there are oxytocin, bombazine, substance B, neurotensin, CCK, gastrin, integrin. So in the 90s, we were all behind peptides because we have got one successful peptide called somatostatin and analog peptide, dotted tate. We went on searching for other peptides. You know, it's like what, what you call it as a bandwagon movement. It is moving nicely, so, so everybody, every scientist will get into that bandwagon to look for the peptide-based radiopharmaceuticals. But do we have so many peptide-based radiopharmaceuticals to name it after 30 years? No. We, we are still happy with the dotted tate. Maybe one or two more are available. This is one of the very important uh, discovery what had taken place in uh, nuclear medicine. The nuclear medicine uh, practices have changed in the last 10 years or 15 years thanks to these molecules called enzyme inhibitors as targeting agents. So we should know a little about the enzyme. What happens uh, in the enzyme? Enzyme always has got a substrate. The substrate will bind with the enzyme and the substrate will be broken into two and one of the part or both the part will be used for some body metabolism. This is what the role of the substrate. Now, instead of using a substrate, instead of using a substrate, we can use an inhibitor. The inhibitor will block the enzyme so that further reaction is not there. That means it is going to remain there. What would have happened if I would have used a substrate for making a ready pharmaceutical? It would have gone and uh, touched the, um, gone and reacted with the enzyme, and it would have broken into two, and it would have come back to the bloodstream. So that's where the enzyme inhibitor has played a major role. <coughs> now. Are we the first to, are we the nuclear medicine people or the radiopharmaceutical chemist the first to use the enzyme inhibitors in medicine? No. Enzyme inhibitors are well known in, uh, in medicine because, you know, the methotrexate, 
what is used for um, treating uh, cancer is an enzyme inhibitor and there are many other enzyme inhibitors which are being used in medicine and this is what one of the very intra very intelligent scientist in the john hopkin uh, university he thought why not i take this uh, small inhibitor molecule it is not that he has synthesized this inhibitor this inhibitor was synthesized by chemists working in other universities and not only this inhibitor they have synthesized many other inhibitors so this particular molecule which is a small molecule you know two amino acids combined through a urea bond combined through a urea bond <coughs> is taken and what he did is that he labeled it with c11 c11 is a pet isotope uh, with 20 minute uh, half life and he published this result in 2002 we have not heard about psm at that time none of the nuclear medicine physicians were aware of psm at that time he labeled it and he made this uh, tracer and he did all the bi- bi- distribution studies and found that this has got a very beautiful excretion in the body of the animals which he tested then he came out with another molecule called the f18 psm or f dc fpyl and this was published in 2011 by john hopkins institute but what is the problem with the americans they have very nice regulation they will not allow you to inject even 2 mg of uh, 3 mg of uh, f18 to the patient unless you go through all that um, documentation getting the approval from the fda and uh, getting uh, going through all that and who is going to go through all that um, approvals because it costs money it costs money to take all that approval unless a ready pharmaceutical company comes and says that okay let me put this money these things will remain as a tracer in the laboratory we call it as orphan drug or orphan ready pharmaceutical there is a good discovery but nobody needs it because uh, they are not understood it and there is not much of business left it and here is where the germans came into picture one of the germans was in john hopkins he went back and they took the same uh, targeting molecule the dipeptide and uh, put a, um, a linking agent and then he put a very nice uh, very very beautiful i will say that one of the best uh, bifunctional chelating agents you can have it that is called the um, hbedcc he made the radio pharmaceuticals and germany the, uh, the regulation was not that good, that uh, um, compulsory they could always uh, inject it um, you know two three milligram of gallium to the patient and also we were supporting them we were supporting them those molecules used to come to india and we were happily injecting it and the psm11 became the radio pharmaceutical of the i don't know the time and none of us have heard about the psm11 in 2015 2014 none of us have heard to psm11 because the first publication has come in 2013 only 2014 i think uh, 40 was the first to start it we started in 2015 in uh, arun shashi kumar who is an alumni of uh, pga he was also very enthusiastic sir we will start so we started that one and these images are actually our images this is not taken from any literature so once you can uh, target uh, with a um, uh, um, uh, <coughs> diagnostic isotope you can also target with a therapeutic isotope that is what is the beauty of the chemist you give a problem to the chemist he can go work around or she can work, work around and come with nice molecules which will work for it so they have uh, de- developed this PSM11 and PSM617 beautiful radio pharmaceuticals and this is uh, you can see in the left the gallium image the right the spect image of the same patient now enzyme inhibitors based radio pharmaceuticals have a large role in uh, nuclear medicine i i definitely feel that nuclear medicine is going to be depending on a lot of enzyme based uh, molecules because uh, 1653 metabolic enzymes are reported in human body many of those enzymes many of those enzymes will be responsible for some diseases and to tracking that diseases the enzyme inhibitors can be used there is a potential for developing a large number of inhibitor based radio pharmaceuticals and also once psma had come it did not take much time for the fapi to come fibrinoplast uh, 
activation peptidase inhibitor it did not take much and uh, i am sure you know at least about 20 30 centers in india are using fatp as a regular molecule and we are also glad we are also glad and happy fortunate that we can also inject so what is the fundamental uh, fundamental difference between peptides and uh, inhibitors you look at the peptides the dr tate you look at it it's a tate i can have a talk i can have a knock but the difference in the peptide is very little you can add a small nh2 or a small oh or a tyrosine something you can add to the peptide but the basic peptide remains the same the basic structure remains the same but when it comes to enzyme inhibitors the molecules can be very very different you can have a, um, the third molecule what i have put is what we use in psma 11 and psa 6 psma 6 on 7 the other two molecules what i have put it they are also enzyme inhibitors for the same psma and any chemist can take these these molecules also and radio label it with um, you know gallium or lutetium it will work as well and this gives a very big good advantage which i'll tell no what is the advantage of um, peptide um, receptor sorry en- enzyme inhibitors because this is the same blocked mechanism of uptake like fdg the same blocked mechanism once it goes to the cells where the enzyme is there it remains there no further reaction so if there is an uh, activity or a radioactivity is along with that it will decay over there uh, giving the radiation dose to the same place and in enzyme inhibitors of the same enzyme for example psma enzyme or uh, fapi fap enzyme need not be the same we can uh, develop any molecules which will act actually work with the equal um, affinity for that enzyme so it is good you cannot have an exclusive right for radio pharmaceutical today okay we have three four fapi molecules and if somebody is coming and telling that no you cannot use it catch out of a good chemist he will be able to make a molecular docking and some computer calculation and say that i will design another molecule and i will put a bifunctional chelating agent to it and add it and innovative chemist can synthesize another inhibitor molecule which will be equally acceptable well and can develop very small molecules as enzyme inhibitors the small is beautiful concept enzyme inhibitors are very small molecular weight hardly 200 300 and hence that may properties will be very good the target will have the radioactivity and non targeted radioactivity will be excreted from the cells from the body <clears throat> will another type of uh, carrier molecules evolve surely yes 40 years back we never heard about um, uh, peptides peptides came in the 90s 20 years back we did not hear of you know we started hearing about psma only 10 years back 20 years back um, you know pomber knew that okay i can use an emitter so surely the chemists are working the scientists are working new carrier molecules will emerge in future and if somebody asks me what would be those carrier molecules i don't know if i knew i would have developed the, the radio pharmaceutical with it but surely you can be com- uh, confident that such molecules will emerge there are lot of small molecules that participate in uh, human uh, biochemical reactions which will be sought by the radio pharmaceutical scientists to make diagnostic and therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals so again uh, you know we supply this uh, molecule fdopa to our uh, people you know you see that molecule what a small molecule maybe 100 uh, 120 molecular weight but you see those uh, commas the beautiful shining commas of the striatum now the clinician the neurologist knows that this is not a parkinson patient this patient had been referred to me as a suspected parkinson patient but i cannot treat him for parkinson i need to treat him for something else so in order to conclude i'll say desirable at me properties lead to precision radio pharmaceuticals if you if the chemist scientists were sitting here if you want to make precision radio pharmaceuticals it should be uh, the at me properties is what is governed so we have to select the right targeting vector once the targeting vector is uh, made selected it can be done by the doctor also the doctors know the biochemistry much better than the chemist who is working in the with the test tubes so once you know that okay this is the vector this is the targeting vector give that molecule to a chemist the the chemist will be able to 
um, make that into a radio pharmaceuticals. And I definitely feel that several more enzyme inhibitors will evolve as successful targeting vectors in the future. And other small molecules will also be identified. Now, this is the bandwagon effect what I told. Okay, now enzyme inhibitors is what is, uh, now we should look at it. Okay, PSMA had come, now FAPI is there. Now, let us go behind enzyme inhibitors. That is not the case. We should always think a little outside and think about other molecules. And I am sure in human biochemistry is one of the most complex uh, biochemistry and there are potential targeting vectors available there. It is only for us to find it out. So to conclude, small is beautiful, not only in economics, not only in economics, small is beautiful even in radio pharmaceuticals. So radio pharmaceutical science is uh, fast evolving and we will have to remember Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So we were um, looking complexes. From complexes, we came to very specific, um, you know, uh, uh, neutral life of uh, complexes. Then we have these bifunctional chelating agents, came peptides, enzymes, and we are doing it. And we have to be continuously evolving. And as a scientist, I started, uh, I, I was also, I'm also evolving actually. I started as a radio immunologist. A radio immunologist, I was going down in the 80s, then I started working in radio pharmaceuticals. Then uh, therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals, technician radio pharmaceuticals and therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals. Then by the 2000s, the, um, the cyclotron and PET became very important, so I started working on it. And we were one of the first group to bring uh, gallium to India and in our nuclear medicine centers. And I'm still looking for some evolution if there is time. So I currently work for a private uh, center, and uh, we are into the market with uh, very, very substantially good um, uh, radio pharmaceuticals for uh, technetium 99 m and also for, we have plans for making uh, cold kits for uh, gallium. And uh, we also are in the last stage of our uh, work for making iodine 131 solution and capsules because I believe that the iodine, there is a shortage of iodine in India and our reactor is old. Our reactor is 40 years old. And how long our reactor will be available for making uh, iodine? Of course, the department uh, has not given a clear, okay, we are going to stop the reactor after five years or 10 years. They have not told it. But it is better that uh, let us be prepared for that uh, time. So there has to be private entrepreneurs in the country. And I'm glad that, you know, uh, we have uh, SDS, uh, they have put their iodine solution and capsules they are supplying. And there is a scope for everybody to be there. This is an all-inclusive society with a population of... Um, Combined population of America and Europe, you know, or maybe Latin America also. So it's a large country having one seventh of the population. So there is a place for everybody to survive. And I will uh, close my talk with this beautiful image of actress uh, Shobana. She is a South Indian actress. A beautiful image. So I, my request or my um, proposition is that, you know, whenever you see a beautiful image in your computer, a nuclear medicine image in your computer, you always think that there is a chemist, there is a nuclear medicine scientist who thought about it 20 or 30 years back, about, back of it and made that radio pharmaceutical. The radio pharmaceutical is the key for nuclear medicine. A, in a, a radiologist don't need a scientist with him. He has the machine. The better the machine, the better is the image. But in radio pharmaceutical, you can invest the highest amount in nuclear medicine imaging or the image of them machine, but the image will not be good unless the radio pharmaceutical is good. So my uh, <clears throat> summing up thing is that we are all, I, I, because this is a very chemistry oriented uh, talk, then that was the reason why I decided to come this uh, to this place. Also, I wanted to see Chandigarh and um, Amr sir. So that was a second uh, inclination for me to come. But this precision nuclear medicine, the title is what brought me here. And uh, putting that uh, very nice title, uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Jaya Shukla, again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pillay. It was really an excellent review talk on radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, we all enjoyed it. And uh, I think it's a very important area 
especially for young researchers, because at times uh, places where you don't have access of, of course, uh, you know, F18 or cyclotone, then they have a need to develop those pharmaceuticals, maybe peptide for location or localization of cancer cells. So I think you can take one or two questions. Right, surely. One thing yes. I want to ask you. you. Yeah. You know, you talk about the molecular weight and all this thing. You know, iodium, what, why not about the volume? Because the iodium volume is 78 angstrom. And the technetium ion is about 74 angstrom. That is taken by the acinar cells. And here also iodine is taken, correct, by the thyroid. So what happens, you know, the volume also plays an important role in the uh, you know, for uh, getting the image of the different organ. Secondly, yes. about the antibodies, you know, one girl, she was doing PhD, she got PhD. Her examiner, we are your doctor, Narsimhan. I was guide and Professor Talwar, whose name was recommended for Nobel Prize. He was co-guide and one of the examiner was from Pasteur Institute for SCG monoclonal antibodies. We have shown blood barrier, when it crosses the blood barrier, the sialic acid also plays an important role in crossing the blood brain barrier attached to the antibody. Okay, I'll answer both the questions. First question is, uh, you know, why not um, uh, iodine and uh, technetium? Yeah. Sure, patagnetate does part of the function of iodine, but not the whole function. No, no. Not the whole function. We can mimic patagnetate for some application, but certainly not for, tra um, uh, uh, for taking the decision how much iodine I should give for treatment. Now, the second question about, I, I remember uh, Dr. Talwar because yeah. he was in the Institute of Immunology yeah. and uh, I started immunology, you know, I mean, immunologist started making antibodies. So, very, very respected name. But, you know, my feeling is that, you know, anything what we talk for uh, 20 or 30 years, if it has not come to the clinic, it is not going to come to the clinic. Did we all, did we, any of you um, have heard about lutetium in uh, 2000s? You are not heard. You are not heard. But in BRC, we were working, I was working, my students, Sujitha was working on lutetium-177 in BRC and we have made some very nice bone imaging agent and we were looking for clinical partners to take that lutetium. But, you know, there was no takers because, you know, lutetium, you know, what is the spelling of lutetium, you know. But when I went to IAEA, I again went to the nuclear medicine departments. Um, I think at that time Dr. Padi was the head of the nuclear medicine department and I told him, you know, can we start some uh, lutetium thing? No, but he was sold about um, rhenium. He was sold about rhenium. So, look at rhenium and uh, lutetium now. Lutetium came into your nuclear medicine 15 years back or uh, 20 years back. But today, can we have a nuclear medicine uh, conference without lutetium? It's not no. So what I feel is that many of the products, we need not drive it. If the product is good, they are all self-driven. Lutetium is a self-driven uh, molecule. And we have to be proud. India is one of the countries who have done the pioneering research in um, lutetium, one of the uh, first, uh, second or third group in the whole world working on lutetium. But I could not penetrate to the nuclear medicine um, uh, physicians at that time, but going, coming with a, from a very respectable institute like IAEA, okay, we had the CRP with 18 participants coming from 18 different countries. So, radio pharmaceuticals will evolve. So, I, I don't know, you know, I have worked with monoclonal antibodies and I have a lot of uh, love and affection for monoclonal antibodies, you know, but that size. That 150,000 molecular weight, you know. No, they reduce it, the number of amino acid also. They reduce it. They yeah, yeah, but 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 acid. you know, you ask anyone of the physician, you know, how many of it you are using it? They are not using it. Yes, Doctor Bartha. Talking about happy these days, and definitely is going to be one of the molecules of the future for diagnostic as well as therapy. The main concern of uh, therapy in FAPI is that the FAPI which we use for diagnosis the, is a very short yeah. residence time in the tumor. Yeah. So is there a way by chemistry that we can tweak this molecule to stay more time in the tumor? Otherwise, the theranostic word about FAPI is going to fail. Yeah. Some work has been done, I know, and it has been published from India as well. But as far as the mass production is concerned, or to be more specific in a hospital radiopharmacy, 
is it possible to do it? Because that will open many, many good avenues because FAPI is a pan-cancer molecule. Many, many cancers. Many cancers. So is it possible to tweak that molecule to have more residence time in the tumor? Yeah, it's, uh, this is another problem with the FAPI, which had been identified very nicely. That is, you, the diagnostic tracer cannot be used for the therapy by simply changing the thing because the ATME property, I will put it that may property, at, absorption is good, distribution is good, but the metabolism is poor actually because it is getting metabolized from the tumor and it is coming out. And I'm sure, you know, the chemists are already working uh, towards that to make uh, those molecules which will not be excreted, which will remain there. And it is true that, uh, you know, already there are uh, one, there is at least one molecule what is coming as that, you know, this for therapy. And if you use this uh, for therapy, the dose delivery is good. And I'm sure molecules will come. I'm sure the molecules will come. And the onus of developing those molecules is uh, left with all those uh, young chemists who are sitting in this place, you know. So think about it. They will be able to do it. You know, nowadays, um, you know, my, my theoretical chemistry is so well accepted. It is there. People will be able to, um, you know, make those molecules first in the computer and then do the synthesis, you know. I'm sure science will evolve, you know. Any other question? Yes, Dr. Bajjinder Singh. I don't have any question, but uh, I just came back uh, attending this Theranostic World Congress in Chile. So there was a panel discussion on FAPI, actually, by the big people, Rodney Hicks and many people. So they, the, as Partha Chaudhary pointed out, that uh, this inherent FAPI molecule has uh, the less uh, tissue retention. That's, uh, in, I mean, there are a lot of modifications going on and all to increase their resistance time. And they concluded that uh, panel discussion by saying that, this is pertaining to Pepe only, that what can't kill me makes me more stronger. So still, uh, this molecule has to be modified uh, to, I mean, uh, to have longer tissue retention for therapeutic efficacy. I'm sure it will be done. I'm sure it will be done. Scientists are working towards that. Not me, but uh, people are working for that. Last question now. Very nice, mesmerizing talk, sir. I'm really overwhelmed. I'm a surgeon practicing mostly oncology for the last 40 years, and I have seen many failures of the modern allopathic system of oncology. So with that idea in mind, can we add some herbal or Ayurvedic products? Tag, you know, you were searching for some molecules, some targets. So I'm suggesting Tulsi, Haldi, Bhanga, Sadabahar, that is periwinkle, aloe vera, they all have strong anti-cancer properties. And Ayurvedic system of medicine uses it profusely. Similarly, they have many minerals called bhasma. Bhasma is different from pure elemental, say, law bhasma, gold bhasma, swarna bhasma, hirak bhasma, diamond bhasma. So they are different forms of elements, minerals. Can we tag them to some radio pharmacy? Just yeah, thank you. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, this question always uh, is raised by a lot of a lot of people because uh, you know Ayurveda is our science and that according to me it is the best science which can ever be uh, discovered and our ancient um, gurus have made uh, Ayurveda wonderful. The difference between Ayurveda and uh, allopathy medicine is that of course we nowadays we have a lot of mixed um, um, drug therapy. The modern medicine always is a single molecule. You talk about the PSMA inhibitor, that's a single molecule. Maybe in the pharmaceutical formulation, they will mix four or five. But we do not know in Ayurveda what the extract, what we are getting from Tulsi. It may have more than 20, 30 components. All put together is actually giving the treatments. Now, taking that concoction of materials and radio labeling will be difficult. Whenever we do a radio labeling, we have to take a molecule which is well characterized and do a well-oriented chemistry to modify that molecule and do the ADME studies, actually. And this is precisely what uh, allopathy medicine also is doing. I am sure, you know, the Hortius Malabaricus uh, book, which in the 16th century, it was all our knowledge, actually. You know, what are the plants, uh, medicinal plants in the Sakya mountains? 
western gods you know this was taken by the british by, by the latin people and um, translated everything and published it as horticus malabaricus six volumes i think now this was brought back to india and by one of the professors and he translated he retranslated it into, into english and malayalam and he was given padma shri by uh, president by president a couple of years back you know dr mani lal so ayurveda is the best science because it is a multi science they like you know nccn guideline for therapy of a cancer they will have four or five drugs and this is what ayurveda gives but unfortunately uh, radio pharmaceutical chemists cannot take all that four or five or 10 chemicals and radio label it and uh, make radio pharmaceuticals we have to catch the single molecule and show it the structure of it and characterize it to finally get it as an approved product but i am sure you know ayurveda should come back to our uh, practices i think you should allow um, i think researchers are working on it they basically have to identify a particular active molecule yeah curcumin is there curcumin is there curcumin is there curcumin people are working on it and in fact there were papers from curcumin no, we from brc brc itself you know now time is going so to be i think we address our deep thanks to dr pille so i think we come to the end of the session so thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you we extend our gratitude to our esteemed chairpersons and speakers for their invaluable contributions and insights that have been shared during this session your expertise has truly enriched our knowledge and enhanced the learning experience of all the delegates so before commencing for our next session in the interest of this more than the efficient functioning of the cme i request all our uh, distinguished speakers to kindly adhere to their allocated time limit also the chairpersons for the subsequent uh, sections are requested to ring the first bell at 12 minutes followed by a second bell at 15 minutes for the kind attention of our speakers Second session, production of radionuclides, a reactor, generator, and cyclotron introduces us to the realm of uh, radionuclide production mechanisms, spanning reactors, generators, and cyclotrons, illuminating the dynamic landscape of nuclear medicine. To chair this session, I would like to extend a cordial invitation to Professor Baljender Singh from Department of Nuclear Medicine, PGI. Second, uh, Dr. Parthaesh Chaudhary, Director, Nuclear Medicine, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, and Professor uh, Dhanapati Halnayak from uh, JIPMAR. to the chairpersons. Thank you, sir. So we move on to the second session of this CME, production of radionuclides, reactor and generator and cyclotrons. Uh, all right. So I invite the first speaker of this session, Dr. Sudipto Chakravarti, and he will, shall be sharing his experience on, with us on production and utilization of reactor produced radioisotopes for diagnosis and therapy. Uh, current uh, status and future prospects in India. Dr. Sudeep Tho. So Dr. Sudeep Tho, all of, all of us know that he is a very eminent uh, radio chemist uh, from Brett and he has been uh, instrumental in supplying all, uh, I mean, um, lutetium based radio ligands to the entire country and he has done commendable job uh, at Brett. So I will I request Dr. Sajid Poo to come forward and take up his talk. Good morning to all of you and thank you chairpersons for your kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Jaya Madam for 
inviting me to and giving me an opportunity to share our experiences on our work, we, what we carry out at Bhabha Atomic Research Center, Department of Atomic Energy. So uh, the topic of my presentation is production and utilization of reactor produced radioisotopes for diagnosis and therapy, the current status in India and the future prospects. So uh, at the beginning, I may take a pardon from the chairpersons. I may overshoot my time for a few minutes, so kindly pardon me. So the structure I have made, first I will give, give a very brief background. Then I will discuss about the current scenario of production of radioisotopes for routine clinical use using the reactors at Department of Atomic Energy. It will be followed by development of new radioisotopes and new avenues using reactor and the way forward. So it is well known that radioisotopes are extensively used for health and prosperity and one of its major use is in human health care or in medicine. So the beginning as Dr. Pillai has already mentioned it is almost maybe 80, 90 years old practice. It has for the benefit of students who are attending the beginning is actually with the artificially produced radioisotope in 1934. Irene Curie and Frederick Juliet made the beginning. They were awarded Nobel Prize in 1935. And this was followed by a remarkable discovery by Hungarian scientist Professor Hebse, who has first shown the utility of artificially produced radioisotopes as radio tracers. So from that humble beginning, now we have at this stage of, in the advanced stage of nuclear medicine practices all over the world. So another major milestone is of course the discovery of Tibdenum technetium generator at Brookhaven National Laboratory and that also maybe 70 years back. So with this beginning, you are all quite aware that radio pharmaceuticals are special class of radiochemical formulations which has high purity and safety for human administration. And the global radio pharmaceutical market is showing an incredible growth of around 4 to 5% and uh, expected to touch 8,200 million US dollar by in another two years time from now. So I will go to the sources of radio isotopes. There are three major sources. First is research reactor. Second is cyclotrons. and Third is another new types of source which are electron accelerators or rhodotrons. In the subject which has been given to me, I will focus particularly on research reactors. So what is the current scenario? How we cater to the need of our country using our reactor at Department of Atomic Energy? So Dhruba research reactor is the lifeline of radioisotopes for more than three or four almost for four decades. It's a 100 megawatt thermal vertical tank type reactors. It has different uh, specifications. The most important is there are 180 positions irradiations of targets in thermal neutron flux ranging from 1.5 into 10 to the power 13 to a higher flux of 1.8 into 10 to the power 14 neutron per meter squ centimeter square per second. And this pictorially we had shown how the target capsules are actually inserted into a vertical column, what we call it a tray rod, and that is put inside the core of the reactor for irradiation of targets to get the radioisotopes. Now subsequent to the irradiation in Dhruva, these are the stepwise processes by which the radioisotopes are actually ended up in hospitals for target preparation, encapsulation, subsequent to that irradiation. Then we carry out radiochemical processing by which the irradiated target is converted into chemically suitable form from where the radio pharmaceutical formulations can be made. And subsequently, they are distributed either current radio pharmaceutical manufacturing center and finally, it is ended up in clinical use in nuclear medicine hospitals. So this gives a list of major radioisotopes for human healthcare, which we routinely produce now. 
and uh, in the in the other part we have shown how their uh, relative person relative uh, percentage actually is changing with years from i have shown from 2017 to 2022 you can just note down that the relative percentage of lutetium 177 in in total capacity of isotope production is rapidly increasing it was just 11.4% around 6 7 years back and i have given the data of 2022 it is almost 40% so i will come to that in later there is a tremendous growth in uh, pro production and as well as the use of lutetium 177 in clinical practice so i will just briefly talk about one or two major iso reactor produced isotopes which are uh, routinely produced one is definitely iodine 131 we need not mention to this audience that what are actually the advantages and benefits and uses so there are two alternate routes by which iodine 131 can be produced one we call at thermal neutron irradiation route where tellurium 130 is the target what is irradiated in dhruva reactor and it ultimately ended up with iodine 131 through a intermediate radio short lived radio nuclide iodine i am sorry tellurium 131 which decays to iodine 131 and the second route is uranium 235 fission just like molybdenum is produced by fission of uranium 235 similarly iodine 131 can be obtained using low enriched uranium target but so far in india we follow the first step where tellurium oxide powder of very high chemical purity and of natural isotopic uh, composition is irradiated in dhruva research reactor to produce iodine 131 the radio chemical separation of iodine 131 from tellurium is actually a very complicated step considering that it involves the handling of gaseous radio isotope because iodine 131 from the irradiated target is liberated in the form of a gas and so far at radio pharmaceutical division where i work around 30 to 50 curie of iodine 131 is produced and till date uh, maybe we have produced 20000 curie of this product and benefited lakhs of patients and uh, here i acknowledge the relentless effort of my colleagues there who continuously strive to meet the demand of nuclear medicine fraternity for the uh, for supplying this particular isotope really their effort is commendable now i uh, go back to the uh, i i come forward to the large scale production and deployment of lutetium this is a major achievement of our department during the last decade and it was pioneered by my guru sitting here uh, dr mr a pillai way back uh, in around 2000 as he has already mentioned but it started from a very modest beginning and in the over the last two decades it has come along in a very tremendous way i can say for the students who are actually beginning the career you may be already know, knowing that there are two ways here also in research reactor how it, uh, lutetium is produced one by direct neutron capture of isotopically enriched lutetium 176 target from where the production is direct the post production radio chemical treatment is also simple and the second method by which ytterbium 176 another element just the lanthanide which comes prior to lutetium in the periodic table the isotopically enriched uh, 176 ytterbium is irradiated and again through a intermediate short lived radio isotope that is converted to lutetium 177 now the issue is that here the involvement of chemists are very important because you have to separate one lanthanide that is your product lutetium 177 from the target material which is another lanthanide so this is a very difficult and complicated step so far in india for routine clinical practice we use the direct method that is we irradiate isotopically enriched target here the challenges are we need to have specific activity of the product more than 20 curie per milligram 
the radiochemical purity has to be very high and it has to be free from all trace metal other impurities otherwise the radio pharmaceutical formulation will not take place as, as per its uh, clinical requirement so thanks to very good thermal neutron cross capture cross section and some kinds of a resonance which uh, uh, integral matter of nuclear physics we can achieve even with our reactor what we are having the required specific activity and purity for supplying to nuclear medicine fraternity so our impurity burden here is around 0.02% which is an inherent co-produced isotope that is 177 metastable radio isotope a uh, metastable lutetium but our nuclear medicine fraternity cope with that this is not a very major issue so this is the specification here also we have a dedicated team of uh, workers I, I just come to this to, to show this outstanding growth in this uh, lutetium production and supply which is mainly driven by the increase in demand uh, we from for last 10 years data we have shown while in 2000, 2013 10 year back we are producing around 200 curie around 5 curie per week now it has come to last year it was more than 1250 curie and the batch size has grown from 5 curie to almost 30 curie in the current year and there are several radio pharmaceuticals you are uh, more aware and more uh, uh, conversant with that particularly psma 617 for prostate carcinoma then obviously the dotated nowadays uh, FAPI 46 and other FAPI derivatives are also used and apart from oncological uses we have hydroxyapatite microparticles for treatment of arthritis then obviously uh, trastuzumab or other monoclonal antibodies for radioimmunotherapy of breast cancers so with lutetium chloride what we supply from baba atomic research center all these products are prepared with very high yield and purity in several nuclear medicine centers across our country and an estimated of around 55,000 doses are administered alternatively now just i want to mention that in another major development in uh, one of our uh, another group at barc we have introduced laser based enrichment technique for obtaining indigenously isotopically enriched target of lutetium 176 by a laser based atomic uh, route by which so far we have produced around 550 curie quantity of lutetium chloride api for clinical use the specific activity and other purity we have found it to be adequate and now it is extensively used for clinical use one lutetium dotated post therapy scan using our fully indigenous indigenous source of lutetium is i have shown it here which uh, is a dotated image thanks to the data supplied from nuclear medicine department of ames new delhi now as i have mentioned i will uh, come to the what are the new developments in in our endeavor obviously one is the fission introduction of fission moly plant at uh, trombe which is a major breakthrough and it will come up with uh, 300 curie six day curie capacity of uh, nine fission produced 99 molybdenum so it will mostly solve the, uh, the requirement of molybdenum 99 in india and have a great export potential with that then we have actually introduced another new route of yttrium 90 production apart from what is obtained from strontium yttrium generator we have found that there are certain specific utility of this radio isotope if we produce it in reactor although its specific activity is very low one major important thing is that we have started developing hydroxyapatite microparticles for treatment of arthritis using this particular isotope and we have successfully developed a therapeutic formulation for this just for example we have uh, shown the image of a patient this uh, bone image practically which shows that the inflammation is significantly reduced now this is a few minutes <laughs> 
we have made 120 doses already prepared and administered. Now this is actually a established breed product. Then secondly, we utilize the reactor in making yttrium-90 glass microspheres for cost-effective alternative to therasphere. With the help of our partners at Material Group, we mimic the therasphere formulation. While therasphere's costs around 13,000 US dollar, the formulation we have made and our uh, previous chairman, Dr. Vyas, has named it as Bhava Sphere, which we can supply at a cost of around 600 US dollar. There are some nitty gritties are there for its uh, real large scale deployment. So far, 15 customized doses of uh, 50 to 150 millicuri has been administered. Now, the same low specific activity yttrium we have used for some kind of a patch therapy. We have made some uh, cellulose paper based uh, skin patches of around 2.5 to 2, 3 millicuri source, 3 millicuri strength, and evaluated. These are approved by AERB for use as sealed radioactive sources. And uh, this has been used for treatment of keloids and other skin ailments in two um, nuclear medicine centers already. So we are also looking forward to it. Apart from that, our colleague, Dr. Rubel, is here. He has made a very important uh, effort and contribution in developing a complicated electrochemical-based uh, technique for getting what we I have mentioned earlier, the difficult no carrier added lutetium chloride separation from irradiated ETRBM target. And uh, we have initially carried out some clinical study in th thanks to our partner at TMH. This is a post therapy scan of. Uh, can you conclude, please? You're already three minutes over time. Just for two minutes, sir. We have no carrier added copper chloride that uh, we have uh, introduced in it. There are almost 100 uh, first clinical translation was carried out at TMC and that Dr. Basu has injected more than 100 doses in patients, both for prostate cancer and few for uh, glioblastoma patients. So this product is also available. This is a new development from, uh, it's a reactor produced product what is available from our side. We have recently introduced RBM-169 for radiation sinovectomy of digital joints. This is not yet for clinical use, but this particular uh, product from pre up to preclinical uh, formulation, we have used it extensively. And now this is almost ready to be introduced for use in clinical practice. So since the paucity of time, I will just conclude over it. We are working on various uh, other formulations also. So what is the way forward? Our way forward is we want to further enhance the production distribution of the routine radioisotopes, molybdenum, iodine, and lutetium, both from Bark and Brit. And we are continuing our, our endeavor for research and development on new production routes and radio, uh, radiochemical separation technology for new radioisotopes in cancer theranostics. And the indigenous availability of enriched targets, enhancement of irradiation capacity, and development of large-scale radiochemical separation facility. So these are our, the future endeavors of department to cater to the need of the nuclear medicine fraternity. And just I would like to conclude by mentioning that in the line of uh, making India vision of government of India, DAE is setting up the isotope production reactor and co-located isotope uh, processing facility on a private pu public partnership mode for significant enhancements in production of radioisotope, primarily for use in nuclear medicine. And we sincerely hope that this, will, uh, this endeavor will see the day of the light around 2030-31. So with that, I, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your Thank you, Dr. Sudipto, for giving overview of uh, the initiatives of BRIT. And undoubtedly, I think you guys have done a very good job in the supply of Nutrition 177. And uh, I really appreciate the efforts of uh, 
DAE in setting up this uh, reactor. This is, I think uh, this is a reactor dedicated for medical. And do you have uh, plans of uh, producing alpha meters by this reactor which is being set up uh, under PPP mode? Actually, producing alpha emitters using re research reactors is a very is a complicated, difficult route. Yeah. More prominently, we had planned to make it using the cyclotron facility, actually. Yeah. Both uh, actinium-225 as well as maybe we are have a wish list of astatin-211. I think there has to be some initiatives as worldwide. Yeah, it is there. Worldwide is there. people are using this uh, medical um, cyclotrons for the production of uh, some alpha meters, even yes. copper-64 as we have already huh. done. And there are some efforts in, in, in mass also. They are producing scandium-44 also. Yeah. We, but uh, there is a big hype for the production of astatin-211, actually worldwide. And there is a community, the world acetine community all over the world. Okay. So mm -hmm. they are into production of acetine, uh, acetine 211. That's a very useful alpha, alpha meter and it's a very flexible chemistry. And some, I think, uh, if you can't set up a cyclotron at a bread, at least you can guide uh, institutes having, I mean, this uh, psych medical cyclotrons, how to produce uh, the, these really useful alpha meters. Uh, yes. Because still we have to import them at very exorbitant yes. cost. Uh, from outside. Agreed, Th sir. Thank you yeah. very much yeah. for your... Yeah. 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 not there, but as yes. Jitta told, this astatine is particularly very, uh, uh, you, you require around 30 MeV cyclotron. World over this astatine, the problem with astatine is its half-life. Yeah. Unlike all the alpha emitters, which are 10, 11 days, astatin half-life is 7.2 I hours. think there's no coordination between the 7.2 hours. Various, so uh, what they are doing, as I know, in Calcutta cyclotron, I think yeah, they Calcutta are, is 30, MeV, they are yeah. 30 MeV. So that is... Yeah. that is And there is a very good half-life that can also be I mean, yeah. sent yeah. to distant yeah. sites, basically. Yeah. Yes, alpha beam. Yeah. So our old cyclotron in uh, VECC, that is all, the only one in, in the country now, which has gives an alpha beam. Thank you very much, Sudeep. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. He has we one question. On lunch time, because he has already given. Yeah, we can we can take the uh, questions later, maybe at the end of the session, if no. there is time. So I call upon Dr. Rubal Chakraborty, who gave us talk on continuing important role of. Radionuclide generator technology in nuclear medicine. With a request that you can please stick to your time. Thank you, Chairpersons, for the introduction. And I once again thank PGIMER and especially Dr. Jaya Shukla for inviting me for this CME. My talk is on the continuing important role of radionuclide generators in nuclear medicine. Radionuclide generators, as you know, is another modality to obtain radionuclides at a hospital radiopharmacy without depending on on-site nuclear reactor or cyclotron. So basically, a radionuclide generator is a closed shielded system in which a parent and daughter radionuclides are existing in a state of radioactive equilibrium. It may be transient equilibrium or secular equilibrium, depending on the half-life of the parent and daughter radionuclides. And based on the difference in chemical properties, the daughter radionuclide can be selectively separated from parent radionuclide. This concept of radionuclide generator, it is based on equilibrium. And once the daughter radionuclide reaches the state of equilibrium, it follows the same half-life as at a parent. And at that stage, it can be separated. And once separated, it again regrows and it can be re-separated. Thus, you can have multiple illusions from the same radionuclide generator system, and therefore we give the analogy of a milking cow because of repeated growth and re illusions from the same system, making the process economical. These are some of the mathematical equations involved in radionuclide generators. There's a parent A which decays to daughter product B, and these are the decay constants, and the activity of daughter at the at time T is given by this equation. And the T max, or the minimum time required to get the maximum activity of the daughter product is given by this equation. 
Coming to the importance of radionuclide generators, they make availability of shortly video isotope directly at user site without depending on on-site nuclear reactor or cyclotron, thereby providing logistic advantage of supplying the shortly isotopes to distant user sites. The radionuclides are obtained with very high specific activity in no carrier at form. As I had shown, we can have multiple illusions from the same radionuclide generator system. Generally, radionuclide generators are easy to operate in a hospital radio pharmacy, and it can be directly used for preparation of radio pharmaceuticals. The overall process is economical because you can use the same system multiple times during the period of its shelf life. The conventional separate, basically it is a separation system. The conventional op options for separation in radionuclide generators involve chromatographic separation, solvent extraction, sublimation, or gel type, out of which chromatography and solvent extraction are more widely used. Coming to chromatography, it is a simple technique and easy to operate in a hospital radio pharmacy. But a major disadvantage of conventional chromatographic techniques is the sorbent which is used has a capacity restriction. Therefore, only high specific parent radioisotopes can be used. Sometimes it leads to introduction of chemical impurities in the daughter eluate. The column get degraded by radiation environment. And sometimes the daughter product is obtained dilute form and it requires post solution concentration and purification. Coming to solvent extraction, it overcomes the limitation of low, using low specific activity parent radioisotope can be used. But as you know, the solvent extraction is a cumbersome multi-step process. It involves radiation exposure to the working personnel, and it can sometimes lead to addition of chemical impurities. So to overcome these challenges from BARC, we have introduced two novel concepts in radionuclide generator technology. The first is based on electrochemical separation and second is based on nanotechnology. The electrochemical separation is based on difference in formal electrode potential of parent and daughter radionuclides. This is the schematic diagram in which you have the mixture of parent and daughter radionuclides, and the daughter radionuclide is selectively deposited on a novel metal electrode like platinum or gold electrode, and subsequently it can be stripped. The major advantage of this technology is it does not have any capacity restriction, even low specific activity parent radioisotopes can be used. This is a very simple system involving a glass beaker and platinum electrodes. So there is no chance of radiation damage to the electrolytic cell. The process is highly selective because it's based on difference in chemical formal electrode potential. It's a simple process, amenable for automation, and you can get the daughter radioactive with very high purity as well as high radioactive concentration. Using this method, we have developed molybdenum technetium, 188 tungsten rhenium, 90 strontium yttrium, and 47 calcium scandium generators. The other approach is based on use of nanocrystalline metal oxides as adsorbents in column chromatographic technique. This is based on the high surface area and selectivity of nanomaterials. The advantages are you can get very high sorption capacity, excellent selectivity, the daughter activity can be obtained with high radioactive concentration as well as purity. With this approach also, we have developed 188 tungsten rhenium, 99 molybdenum technetium, and 68 gallium germanium generators. Coming to the first generator, that is 99 molybdenum technetium generator, also known as lifeblood of nuclear medicine, we know that diagnostic imaging and 99M technetium are synonymous for almost half a decade. And more than 80% of nuclear medicine procedures still use 99M technetium. The 99M technetium decay characteristics fit exceptionally well in the imaging requirements, and it can be conveniently obtained for molybdenum technetium generator, which was easy till until 2008. After this, there are some issues which has now been solved to a great extent. Mostly the generators which are used commercially use fission produced 99 molybdenum. There are some challenges in production of fission 99 molybdenum. The most convenient route for production of 99 molybdenum is through direct neutron capture, that is by N gamma reaction. And this is the most viable option and has huge promise, especially in developing countries. It's feasible to produce in large scale 99 molybdenum by using this technique. In fact, the molybdenum which we supply from BARC is by direct neutron capture route. It's a simple technology. There is negligible, negligible waste generation. However, the specific activity is low. It's up to 500 to 1 curie per gram, and it's therefore not suitable for conventional alumina-based column chromatographic generator systems. Therefore, we have developed a new adsorbent that is known as mesoporous alumina, which is a nanostructured material. 
and this material was synthesized by mechanochemical synthesis by simple grinding of the constituents and subsequent calcination this material is this is a tm image which shows it is nanoparticles are of around 30 to 40 nanometer size of course agglomerated and this was packed in a commodity column and we have developed a new generator known as nanotech gen 1 which has been approved by the ready for committee of da and this generator showed satisfactory performance in obtaining 99m technetium from n gamma produce 99 molybdenum which is low specific activity molybdenum this shows the illusion profile the illusion profile is almost comparable as that of other con con uh, commercially av available generators the other molybdenum technetium generator which we have developed is by electrochemical method in which we take low specific active molybdenum solution direct in the form of sodium molybdate in electrochemical shell we shield it in a lead pot and these are the two platinum electrodes in this based on the standard electrode potentials of molybdenum and technetate technetium in the form of tco2 that is technetium oxide could be selectively deposited on a negative electrode and then the electrode was taken out and was stripped in a small volume of saline solution to obtain very high concentration of technetium in the form. The major advantage of this technique is very high, very low specific active molybdenum can also be used to produce clinically useful amount of 99M technetium. The other radionuclide generators which we have worked on is 188 tungsten rhenium generator, which is a counterpart of molybdenum technetium generator for therapeutic applications. Rhenium 188 has a reasonable half life of 17 hours. It is a high energy beta emitter. It emits 155 keV gamma ray, which is suitable for spect imaging. It's also obtained in a no credited form from a tungsten rhenium generator, which is tungsten 69.4 days half life and rhenium 617 hours half life. They exist in a state of secular equilibrium. The chemistry of 188 rhenium is quite similar to that of 99M technetium, and therefore, a wide variety of radiopharmaceuticals can be prepared like 99M technetium based radiopharmaceuticals. So we have developed 188 tungsten rhenium generator using the nano sorbent as mesoporous alumina, which is again synthesized by mechanochemical synthesis. And the generator was prepared by column chromatic technique. This generator was evaluated over a period of six months. And this shows illusion profile. You can see the illusion profile doesn't change significantly over repeated use. And it's quite sharp in uh, around 7 ml of saline solution. You can get 80% illusion yield of 188 rhenium from this generator. The illusion yield also does not change significantly over the period of six months. And therefore, this generator could be used for a quite some, I mean, around six months period of time, which is the half-life or shelf life of the 188 tungsten rhenium generator. We've also developed this generator by electrochemical means, which again, like 99 molybdenum technetium generator, rhenium 188 was selectively electro deposited on a platinum electrode and subsequently stripped in saline solution. This generator also gives very high purity 188 rhenium as evident from the gamma spectrum of the 188 rhenium. And this is again based on difference in standard electrode potential of tungstate and rhenium ions. Tungstate in aqueous solution can never be electro deposited, whereas rhenium can be deposited in form of rhenium metal and rhenium oxide, which was subsequently converted to pyrinate form. Coming to another very important generator, there is 68 germanium gallium generator, which is changed the scenario in PET imaging without depending on on-site cyclotron. 68 gallium can be availed from the generator and can be used, and it in fact being used for preparation of wide variety of radiopharmaceuticals. The most common options for preparation of generators or the commercially available generators use titanium oxide, tin oxide, or organic matrix-based columns. And some of these generators are not so directly suitable for preparation of radiopharmaceuticals because there is germanium breakthrough and some chemical impurities are obtained in the eluate, which makes it unsuitable for labeling purpose without further purifying it. So there are post-purification modules here available, which makes the system in, uh, in increases the cost of the system. So to overcome these limitations, we have developed a generator based on nano seria polyacrylonitrile composite solvent. And this generator has been named as a BARC germanium gallium generator or GALGEN1. It has been approved by the Ray Foster Committee of DAE for clinical use in India. 
This is the gel photo of the generator, and this shows the elution profile of the generator over a period of 12 months. You can see that the activity of gallium decreases over time because of decay by physical half-life decay, but the profile almost remains constant. You can get in 2 to 4 ml volume of 0.1 molar ACL, you can avail 68 gallium. The elution performance also remains consistent. The level of germanium impurity in 68 gallium was less than 10 to minus 4 percent, while the yield of 68 gallium was more than 70 percent over the period of one year. So this generator was deployed in Tata Memorial Hospital at Mumbai, and several patient studies were done using gallium 68 obtained from this generator. I saw the scan of 68 gallium dota top thanks to Professor Rangarajan from TMH, Mumbai. Now coming to the last generator which I will discuss is 47 calcium scandium generator, which is a new entrant in radionuclide generator technology. The scandium isotopes have tremendous potential in cancer theranostics. 43 and 44 scandium are important pet radionuclides, whereas 47 scandium is excellent therapeutic radionuclide. It has a half-life of 3.5 days. It's a low energy beta minus emitter 162 kV, the average beta energy. The gamma energy is 159 kV, very su suitable for spec imaging. You can see very nice quality spec images could be generated using this radioisotope. The chemistry is similar like that of lutetium, and it can be used for preparation of similar radio pharmaceuticals. The advantage is it is obtained in no carrier rate form from 47 scandium, 47 calcium, which could be produced by irradiation of 46 calcium enriched target by N gamma reaction Durba reactor. And we have taken 10% enriched target. And this 47 scan calcium decays by beta minus decay to 47 scandium. And we have developed an electrochemical technique for separation of 47 scandium from 47 calcium. So this is based on selective electro deposition of 47 scandium on platinum electrode. This is based on the difference in solubility product. What happens is both calcium and scandium ions migrate to the negative electrode, that is the cathode. Both react with the hydrogen, which evolved the electrode, and converted to calcium hydroxide and scandium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide, the solubility product in aqueous medium is 10 to the minus 3, while that of scandium hydroxide is 10 to the minus 21. And therefore, because of its very low solubility, scandium gets deposited in the form of scandium hydroxide, which is subsequently stripped in a suitable volume of 0.1 molar SCN. After separation, this shows the gamma spectrum, which is a very neat spectrum. You can see only one peak corresponding to 47 scandium. There's 159 kV peak. And we could obtain it in a highly concentrated form with very high radionucleic purity. To conclude, from BARC, we have developed 99 molybdenum technetium, 188 tungsten uranium, 68 germanium gallium, and 47 scandium and scandium generator using both nanotechnology as well as by electrochemical route. These generators demonstrate satisfactory performance for clinical use. Some of these generators have been actually approved by the RPC, like 68 germanium gallium and molybdenum technetium generator for clinical use in India. And these novel separation methodologies can be extended for radiochemical separation of other medically important radioactive isotopes for clinical benefits. So we can conclude by saying that research in radiochemistry means hope towards generation of new radioisotopes for use in radiopharmaceutical science. So I would like to acknowledge PGI Chandigarh and especially Professor Jaya Shukla for the invitation. I am indebted to my mentors. Professor M.R. Pillai and Professor Ashutosh Dash, who introduced me to the concept of electrochemical separation radionuclide generators, and Professor A.K. Tyagi and Professor Vibo Kai, who introduced me to nanotechnology in radionuclide generator and radiopharmaceutical sciences. I am also thankful to my seniors, my students, and colleagues and collaborators for their contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rubel, for that nice uh, elaborate generator technology talk. So as I said, we'll take the questions at the end of the session. The next uh, talk, I believe, is an online talk by Dr. Manish Dekshit. And uh, he'll be speaking on radio metals in nuclear medicine, challenges, and prosperity.
I am Dr. Manish from SGPJ Lucknow and I am thankful for the organizing committee for inviting me this uh, nice talk on radio metals production and its features. So my talk topic is radio metal in nuclear medicine challenges in prosperity. What are metals in medicine? As you know everybody, the imaging agent is solely based on the coordination compound which chelate with the radio metal and have a critical role. The use of radio metals are being explored widely in past both as a spec and pathogen as well as in the MRI. These radio metals or these metals complexes with the different chemistry and form as a good imaging agent as well as a therapeutic agent. Whereas the metallic radionuclides are classified in the two categories, either spec-based met metallic radionuclide or PET-based. And some of them are also act as a ther therapeutic radionuclide. For example, copper 67, lutetium 177, and yttrium 90. Whereas the few are exclusively used for, as a diagnostic for such as gallium 68, zirconium 89, and scandium 44. Few of them have the as they are the base pairs, for example, gallium 68 and lutetium are the good diagnostic match pair which are widely used and explored by the different groups around the world. Similarly, copper 64 and copper 67 is also in the same set. Base. These metals are can be produced either in cyclotron or through generator system or these can be available through the commercial vendor or produced in-house. So, in particular, the interest for radio pharmaceutical chemistry or development widely explored the nuclear properties of these radio metals having the rich coordination chemistry, which focused on the ability as well as the feasibility of the production. These radio metals basically used for diagnostic, and few of them are used as a therapeutic. Radio metals are used in both target based therapy or in non target based therapy and are produced either by generator or cyclotron. There are various factors which hold the property of diagnostic application of these rate metals. Since, as you know, with the production of cyclotron or you can say the Lorentz cyclotron having the solid target in 1932, these radio metal production via cyclotron were explored. Since then, in early phase, only gallium-68, lead-103, indium and thallium were explored because the technology is not supporting. But in the last decade, the cyclotron technology or engineering has modified its production capacity and 15 to 18 mb proton, milli electron volt proton energy of cyclotron with higher cooling efficiency and compressor solution solution make the viability and application of these radio metal to us. In typical center or in all center also, these radio metals are either produced in the late evening or night or weekend. So I can find it as a weekend or late night production cap capacity radio metals. So these radio metals can be produced in after ruin production if you have a hospital based radio pharmacy or cyclotron where it, it was in morning session it was used mainly for the uh, F18 production or F18 based radio pharmaceuticals. So for the strategy of radio metal to be used as a radio pharmaceuticals as you know there is a, we, we need a biofunctional oscillator which hold the radio metal which linked with the target molecule via the linker, the target molecule may be peptide, carbohydrate, protein or nucleide, whereas the linker may be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, whereas the metal chelator is, should be a biofunctional with the appropriate coordination chemistry to hold the metal for as the desired time we need. These are the list of the few diagnostics which act as a both radio diagnostic metal also and therapy. For, for example, iodine-124 
act as a diagnostic uh, petrol nuclear where at 131 is a therapeutic similarly yttrium 86 and yttrium 90 copper 64 and copper 67 and many more so in our facility we are focusing basically on production of copper 64 gallium and zirconium and recently we explored the production of titanium 45 2 Apart from that, there are a few therapeutic radium nuclide which are, can be produced with the reactor, not in the small cyclotron, but they are also important for in terms of therapeutic potential. This is the imaging periodic table which briefly narrate the different radio metals which produce either, which emit either alpha, beta, proton or gamma or also electrons and which can be used for as a both as a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic radionuclide. So nuclear and chemical component of radiothagnostics are prerequisite to exact quantity radiation doses. For that, we need an adequate therapeutic radionuclide and having the target molecule, identical and similar radio level chemistry as well as the corresponding positron emitter to evaluate its potential as a diagnostic feature. So, in terms of uh, infrastructure facility at SCPJ, we have all the infrastructure facility which support the production of these radio metals in our small cyclotron. For example, we have a HM18 cyclotron which has the capacity or uh, inbuilt solid target station which produce radio metal with the solid target. We have an automated purification system. We have dedicated hot cells for. Uh, this chemistry, we have the dose calibrator, we have the gamma PET camera to analyze it. Apart from that, we have all the QC equipments to analyze the quality control of these produced radionuclides and radiopharmaceuticals. So our interest to produce radiometallic, we using the our cyclotron is started in March 2018 with the help of the uh, institutional fund to production of copper 64 which have half-life of 12.4 hours and subsequently we started the production of zirconium 89 in July in 2020 and the gallium 68 in, in June 2023 and recently we produced titanium 45 uh, in, in March 2024. So these radio metals are well suited chemistry and they can tag with the biological molecules or small biofunctional chelators. For example, zirconium is a good for immunopet. It can be used for the cell labeling and virus, and it can also be used for the labeling of the macromolecules such as nanoparticles. And different peptides can be labeled with the with the copper or gallium. And for titanium, we are still exploring the exact uh, uh, chelator which can hold titanium for a long time so these can be produced by the cyclone using liquid or solid target so uh, since march 2018 we are producing copper 64 is if you know the copper production are basically on the four different routes either you can do for the pn reaction or p alpha or n gamma reaction but or center we are using the PN reaction using the nickel 64 as an enriched material because this route is more suited and is with the less impurity and high specific activity of copper is produced. So for each and every uh, radio metal production uh, via, via the solid target phase, you need a, a plate, a target material which should be bombarded. And these target material can be prepared either by these five different methods. You can use either press target, vacuum decubition, electroplating, magnetic spectrum, or spark plasma assessing. In our facility, we are using the two phases, the press target system or electroplating solid target preparation. So for copper, uh, the production of copper is divided into four phases. First, the target preparation. Target preparation is done by electroplating. After electroplating, 
when the target rate it was bombardment and purified and after purification the the waste nickel is recycled because nickel cost is way high so to recycle it and to re reuse it in this way we reduce the cost of production so these are the list of the materials which we use for the routine uh, preparation of the target material and this is the pictorial diagram uh, you get a list of the equipment or pictorial presentation of the equipment where we do the electroplating and we prepare the electroplating solution at how home so after this you can see the purple blue color in the 10 ml syringe is ready for the electroplating this solution is electroplated on the gold coin and the and the figure first is the good electroplating figure figure 2 and 3 are not good and so that's why it worked it should be discarded for not to be elect bombarded after bombardment the copper gold coin was transferred to this fully automated dedicated copper 64 purification system where it was put on the bath and the, the automated purification system took around 3 and a half hour to get the purified the copper 64 as a chloride form so we calculated the production cost of the copper 64 via using the nickel 64 and we found that our production cost is just 12500 inr in terms of production yield and uh, in terms of uh, quality so how we achieve this we achieve is this by because we buy the nickel from direct from the a manufacturer which reduces cost from 100 dollar to 30 mg per dollar we did the recycling of metal and we also is to the extra precaution to avoid the cross current metallic contamination to get the purest form of the copper 64 so after production of copper 64 this copper 64 it was well well used for the gbm based patient studies as this copper copper 64 having all the electron also they and this pictorial presentation said that up to 10 nanomolar uh, distance the, the all the electron uh, damage the uh, chromatin strands and this will de denature the dna and this is will act as a good therapeutic potential of all the electrons so this is the representative histories uh, picture of the patient studies we did it or center using or produced copper chloride and if you see on the figure t it's well accumulated in the gbm pay, uh, area of the patient after successful production of copper 64 we uh, move from july to 20 with the help of ia to produce the zirconium 88 89 as a nucleate since zirconium is well explored and known since 1824 and having very hard lewis acid and form a stable complex as in form of the oxalate and and it also chilled well with the dfo so why zirconium since zirconium has a very good half life of 78.4 hours which is best for ideal for the labeling with the uh, molecular biological molecules such as antibodies affinity or dibodies it which have a long blood circulation time and it's has a good positron energy to good for the pet imaging so different chelators of zirconiums are all well documented but most explored were the dfo based so the 3 dfo based dfo sq dfo ncs and dfo star and so are most explored so we also uh, in our study uses this dfo sq or dfo ncs for chelation so nuclear reaction for which for the zirconium production are three either you can use the pn reaction or d2n reaction or alpha xn reaction but as the small cyclotron we have 18 mev and the cross section energy are best suited from 5 to 13 and we have the degrader with the capacity to reduce the from 18 to 12 so uh, the pn reaction is the most explored and is a condition for us also so we use the this yttrium 89 pn reaction to produce the zirconium 89 in our facility so this is the graphical representation of how the production of zirconium 89 first we have to prepare the target the target is bombarded on the side 
in the solid target station in the cyclotron, which was transferred to the purification unit and which in where the zirconium purified as an oxalate form. And this zirconium is tagged with a modified DFO, which was conjugated with the monoclonal antibodies and labeled it and, do, and go for the imaging. So the target preparation, bombardment, purification, and then the quality control analysis were done in-house. So the, how we prepare the target? The, we took the yttrium 89 powder initially and make it a tablet in a tablet form. And this tablet was tagged on the platinum target holder. And this target holder was irritated for, for a given specific time and then discharge it and transfer to the purification unit. So this is the image of the two image of the two target coins. First one is the uh, the coin which we use as a pellet, and the second with the gold base we use the foil. So we did a, a short study about uh, using the different target matter from platinum to niobium to tantalum, and we found that niobium target base is better in comparison to platinum and niobium. So initially at uh, production cycle, we you, you do the manual purification using the ZR resin, but uh, this to avoid the radiation exposure to the worker, we transfer this purification system by modifying the copper purification unit for the zirconium purification also. And since the all copper purification is the tube based purification module, so in instead of doing this one, we have thought that why not we use the cassette based system. So uh, we modified all gallium automated synthesizer for, for more purifying the zirconium 89. And in this way, we can just change the cassette for, and we start a purification of zirconium. And if when you do the gallium synthesis, we just do change the cassette. So uh, in separation efficiency, if you see the chart and graph, we find uh, more than 86% of the elution out from the activity from the cartridge and our purification was more is more than 99% and which, which is confirmed by the this M gamma spectrum. We did the chelation efficiency also with the DFO and it was found that it's more than 99% and our specific activity was in the range of 500 millicuri per milligram. So the, we calculated the cost of production of zirconium 89 and it was found to be a 3,750 cost INR rupees per run. So it got the cost per millicuri is just 626 rupees for, for patient dose of two to three milligram. So this uh, zirconium was used to label with the map. So this is the representative that we have modified the DFO and DFO was tagged with the monoclonal antibody. And we did all this in house and characterized with the 1HNMR and HPLC. So these are the three different uh, chelators we uh, we use DFO squaric acid, DFO succinamide, DFP, and DFO succinamide peg squaric acid for all studies. So the squaric acid is tagged with the DFO and DFO with the map, and this was labeled with the zirconium 89, and we did the some mice experiment to assess the quality of our molecule, which was also confirmed by 1HNMR and the HPLC and, and other quality control data. This is the presentation of how we modified the DFO with the map and how we attach it. And, and this was confirmed by the uh, healthy rat studies. So currently, we optimize the production of zirconium using the foil as well as the solid target or as well as the press target. We did all the DFO modification. We labeled with the rituximab. The clinical trial was approved and we are very soon to start the product. Clinical trial. So, very recently, we also explored the production of titanium 45, which is also a PET radionuclide using the scandium 45 as a foil. This is the new coin we designed with the help of Sumitomo, which can hold the foil and uh, it's very good uh, target metal with the gold backing. And you can see that 
after bombardment how the coin will come a bit dirty we did that of two runs so far with the 10 micro ampere current for 15 minutes and at the same 12 ma milli electron volt energy and we found the 6 milli curie of uh, titanium 45 after purification so we still optimizing the production of titanium 45 and maybe in future we will have the good data for this production so this is all we have in our facility and we have good collaboration nationally and internationally also and we have the funding from the different organization fund of for icmr ia dst and dbt and uh, and we are good with the funds and this is the team with the leader with dr sanjay gambhir and me and other fellows and uh, miss anjali is actively working on production of zirconium and titanium and other people sachin and nidhi are working on the copper 64 production thanks to all and if you need any questions and comment i am ready to pick up you thank you dr manish hello everybody uh, i am dr manish are you are you there online <laughs> okay Okay, anyway, we are already 30 minutes behind schedule. So if there are any quick question for the previous two speakers, otherwise we'll close the session. I would like to thank the chairpersons and the speakers for their valuable contributions. And I'm sure we all learned a lot about radionuclide production in this session. So continuing further, I would like to request Professor Ashwini Sooth to please come on the dais and present mementos to our uh, chairpersons and speakers for this session. Uh, sir, Professor. May I also request our speakers for this session, Dr. Sudipta and Dr. Rubel, to please come on the diets. Thank you, everyone. So proceeding to our third session for the day, Advances in Radiochemistry and Newer Aspects. It delves into the latest breakthroughs and promising avenues in the field of uh, radiochemistry. To chair this session, I would like to invite Dr. Sanjeev Soni, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR, CSIO, and Dr. Vijita Dhani Chadda, Assistant Professor and Chairperson, Center of Nuclear Medicine, PU. Over to the chairpersons. Thank you. Ma'am, no. Am I audible now? Ma'am, I'm sorry. Okay. So, very good afternoon to all. And uh, we begin with the session on uh, advances in radiochemistry and newer prospects. So we have three eminent speakers for this session, and uh, inclusive of the host, Dr. Jaya Shukla. And uh, I would request Dr. Amit Sharma to please come and uh, deliver his expert talk on molecular imaging probes for cancer diagnosis, synthetic prospectives. Uh, to introduce Dr. Amit Sharma, he is Associate Professor uh, in Amity University and a DBT Ramalinga Swami Fellow. Uh, he serves as an Associate Professor, as I said, and earned his PhD in Synthetic Organic Chemistry from Guru Nanak Dev University Amritsar in 2010 uh, 10, 
with extensive experience he has worked as a research scientist at a pharma company in gurgaon for 3.5 years served as a research professor at korea university for 5 years and held the position of dbt ramalinga swami at csir csio chandigarh for almost 4 years his primary research focuses on fluorescence chemiluminescence and pet based cancer diagnostic probes along with their bio applications additionally he explores molecular theranostic agents for targeted cancer therapeutics and investigates combination therapeutics so welcome uh, dr thank ramit you. sharma thank you, you ma'am for the nice introduction and uh, i am thankful to jaya ma'am and organizing committee uh, for this invitation Uh, to talk about what i am doing uh, at amiti and previous that uh, at korea university and csio chandigarh so as the title of my presentation is molecular imaging probe for cancer diagnosis synthetic perspective what i would like to add uh, more here i would talk about molecular theranostic probes for cancer diagnosis and treatment so Theranostic is a term which was tossed by a uh, US consultant John in a press release from uh, company Cardiovascular Diagnostics uh, Diagnostic in August 1998 and over then this term become so famous and uh, it took uh, uh, penetrate in all feel like a cancer and uh, antimicrobial and bacterial uh, everywhere in this field uh, just Uh, penetrate so in case of a uh, uh, person suffering with a cancer the theranostics can help in uh, developing a personalized medicine in which way from the screening in the initial stages uh, to the diagnosis and based on the diagnosis the doctor it can help the doctors to uh, uh, to recommend a particular treatment to that particular kind of a patient and finally the follow up that whether the cancer is coming back or not in that particular patient so why we need smart uh, theranostic for cancer treatment so uh, we all know doxorubicin is a first line anti cancer therapy and it is known as red devil the red is because of its a color and the devil because it induces lot of side, uh, cytotoxic uh, side effects to the healthy tissues so what exactly happen when this drug is being administered to a patient suffering from a uh, cancer at a particular organelle so this drug cannot differentiate between the normal cell and the cancer cell as a result it localizes in almost all through the body leading to the various side effects so it is not like that we as a synthetic chemist are not uh, working in this field particularly the concept was uh, recognized uh, uh, long back and they developed a first generation therapy where the drug was masked with a certain chemical linker which now become active only in the cancer site because of the there are certain biomarkers which are more elevated as compared to the normal cell so this products will act selectively only into the cancer cell so over the time they realize that why not to tag this uh, first generation therapy with a targeting ligand with respect to which the receptors are over expressed into the cancer cells so then we thought we we bring this concept that because cancer can arise from a single genetic mutation why not to include in this design uh, a inhibitor with respect to that certain genetic mutation to improve the overall therapeutic efficacy and i will tell you why this is important and we toss up this term as a next generation therapy so when we as a synthetic chemist when we start our research we uh, we take some uh, molecule which are being uh, i mean reported in a literature and design in such a way that it could differentiate between the normal cell and the cancer cell so this is a simple probe we design as a fluorescent probe for monitoring hydrogen peroxide in cox2 positive cancer cells so we use uh, indomethacin is a cox2 inhibitor non steroid anti inflammatory candidate and when you link this molecule with more than four carbon chain to a fluorophore so the fluorophore we design in such a way that it is responsive to hydrogen peroxide which is known to be elevated in the cancer cell so what exactly happen this is what we do when we synthesize molecule we characterize it with various analytical technique like uh, nmr spectroscopy mass spectroscopy and then we do the preliminary test in the lab so in the absorption studies we 
uh, record the absorption spectra and then treat the probe with the hydrogen peroxide. So you can, you can clearly see in a figure A, there is a difference in the absorption pattern before and after reacting with hydrogen peroxide. So similar trend we see in a fluorescence. So a new peak at 554, if you record in the cancer cell nomine, you can distinguish the cancer cell from the normal cells. And we also, in the figure D, we react that probe to check the specificity that whether this probe is only responsive to hydrogen peroxide or there are other bioanalytes present in the cancer cell too. So we screen that also. This is just a routine approach for we as a synthetic chemist when we design a molecule or a diagnostic probe in the lab. So what exactly happened? The difference which we are observing in the fluorescence and absorption pattern is because of this chemical reaction. When there is a boronate mask with naphthalamide probe, its response is different. But the moment it get interacted with hydrogen peroxide, the boronate, sorry, get, it's fine. I'm audible? I'm audible? OK, but I will be a little loud. So in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, the boronate get converted to uh, the phenolate, and you see clearly the difference between the fluorescence and absorption. This is the simple chemistry behind this design. So now you can clearly see, uh, probably in the images, you can't see the uh, fluorescence coming from this probe. But in the bar diagram, you can clearly see, as compared to the normal cell, the oxidative stress or hydrogen peroxide is more in COX-2 positive cancer cell. So once we uh, validate this concept, then we think that if we induce more oxidative stress to the cancer cell, what exactly happened to the response? So in the figure below, you can see that we pre-treat the cell with the LPS, and you see the response increases. And why endomethacin is more important? Because it helps in targeting of this particular probe to the cancer cell overexpressing COX-2. And with this result, we pre-treat the cell with the endomethacin itself so that the receptors are now blocked. So you can clearly see the response is low. So I mean this probe not only giving response because of hydrogen peroxide, but endomethacin is playing a role so that it can selectively uptaken by the cancer cell. So this was the preliminary study when we were doing, and the idea came into our mind, why not to target the heterogeneous tumor using a multifunctional molecular protrug? So imagine a one micrometer tumor size. It consists of a million of cells. So it is not exactly like that. They all cell are behaving same. Some cell might be under oxidative stress, and some cells might be under reductive stress. So when we are designing a targeted therapy, so mean that we need a more than one activation strategy so that the drug could get activated in that particular tumor containing the cells with different stresses level equally so that the, uh, the tumor inhibition takes place in a better way and regression chances are less. So we published this paper in Journal of American Chemical uh, Society, and this is exactly the design. We use the same design endomethacin with a four carbon chain and design a linker, the thiol linker, and link it with the SN38 anti-cancer drug, which is used for colon cancer treatment. So what exactly happened in the presence of glutathione that thiolysis reactions takes place under reductive stress to give rise to this chemical transformation and active drug is released. And under oxidative stress, the sulfur get oxidized to sulfone or sulfoxide and active drug is released because now this hydrophobic molecule become hydrophilic, hydrolysis happen, and the drug become active. So in figure B and C, you can clearly see, because this uh, we work drugs which has intrinsic fluorescence, we, because this helps us in preliminary data to understand whether drugs are activating or not. So these are the fluorescence response of this particular drug, pro-drug in glutathione and in hydrogen peroxide. Then we do the HPLC study that whether under this condition the drug is completely releasing or not. So these are the uh, few. Uh, cell-based or animal studies, which I am showing here. So you can clearly see from figure A, under the oxidative stress and reductive stress, the fluorescence is increasing because of activation of drug takes place in colon cancer is the model here. Tumor, uh, sorry, colon, uh, colony inhibition assay, you can clearly see as compared to the SN38 parent drug, our molecule is giving good result cell viability studies. And what we observed that we were getting very good response with our molecule as compared to the parent drug. So we then tried to identify with the various mechanism identification. And we found that in figure E, what happened when the cells are, cancer cells are treated with SN38, 
the cells are very smart cancer cells right so they activate the survival factor like akt and p38 one as a result the overall toxicity of that drug to cancer cell decreases over time but our molecule system number one as a positive advantage it helps in recognizing the cancer cell over the normal cell it will not be activated in the normal cell it is driving the whole molecule to the cancer cell and through, during activation it quenches the reductive stress which we have seen in the previous slide as well as the oxidative stress so this oxidative and reductive stress which was initially responsible for activation of the survival factor doesn't work here so mean overall the therapeutic efficacy of our molecule is better than the parent drug we also proved with the tumor inhibition studies you can clearly see in the tail vein injection our molecule is going specifically to the tumor site and the whole body imaging and ex vivo, the fluorescence is coming because of the active drug only into the tumor site. The tumor inhibition studies in figure B, you can clearly see as compared to the parent drug and control DMSO, K1 give better tumor inhibition. And, and the endomethacine also helps in VEGF inhibition, anti-angiogenesis. So this, this finding helps us in dividing further projects. Like in hypoxia, when we are treating patient with a hypoxia activated drug, it is always better to give uh, NASAD as a combination because it helps in anti-angiogenesis so that the solid tumor will go to the more to the hypoxic state and the hypoxia uh, activated drug could work better in this whole system. So this is another report we published, like how we do the diagnosis and based upon this system, uh, this understanding we designed the uh, therapeutics. So in this case, the beta galactosidase uh, is a well-known moiety because it is being recognized by acyl glycoprotein glycoprotein receptor overexpressed only in the cancer cell. So we made the molecule tagged with the fluorescence, and you can clearly see this molecule goes specifically to the cancer cell and then cleavage of galactosidase happen, and due to the change in the chemical structure, the fluorescence response changes. So you can clearly see here, in HEPG cell, we, uh, when the cells are treated with the, our probe, the red color on the upper bar gram, probably you can see the bar diagram occur. But when we increase the activity of beta-galactosidase, the response increases, mean our probe uh, works uh, with incre uh, only in the cell with increased activity of beta galactosidase and we also proved this with a tumor model in hepg xenografts so based upon this design we immediately uh, synthesize a molecule where we linked with this uh, uh, linker the doxorubicin now the doxorubicin itself is very toxic but as this in this molecule this molecule galdox is not toxic to the normal cell this molecule is being uptaken by the cancer cell uh, with elevated activity of galactosidase and it then get converted to phenolate because of the beta galactosidase enzyme remove this moiety and the active drug is released and this is the you know you see the cell lines and tumor inhibition assay as compared to the docs our molecule give better tumor inhibition so i am uh, because i have just two how, minutes two minutes, two minutes. So I'm just keeping, so we also toss up an idea, why not, because in a cancer cell there is a altered uh, metabolism. So why not to push cancer cell to behave little normal and then give a drug in a delayed activation mode so that we can treat the uh, drug resistance cell also. So means switching the metabolism back to the oxidative phosphorylation together with the drug design. So I'm just keeping this slide and this is the molecule we, because I'm short in time, so whole idea was to target the cancer metabolism, reduce the ATP level because in drug resistant cell, the P glycoprotein because ATP mediated the efflux the drug out. So we reduce the ATP so that the no efflux pump doesn't work and now the drug will reside more in the cancer cell, in the drug resistant cancer cell and that can be treated. So this is the whole design. We use a PDK inhibitor dichloroacetic acid and chemotherapeutic drug doxorubicin and triphenylphosphine, which is well-known moiety because uh, it is known to take the whole molecule into the cancer cell mitochondria. So you can clearly see, as compared to the combination DOX plus DCA, dichloroacetic acid, our molecule behave better both in the do uh, DOX-sensitive as well as DOX-resistant cell-like. In the tumor inhibition model also, 
our molecule in the whole body imaging, you can uh, see that with the tail vein injection, it is going specifically to the tumor side, even in the dox sensitive and dox resistance. And from tumor volume and tumor growth inhibition, you can clearly see whether the cancer is in resistant or sensitive to dox. Our molecule will work in that one. So we are right, right now working with a, uh, another molecule. It's a siloxib tagged fluorophore. So whole idea is that why not to translate this knowledge into the clinics? So uh, this molecule give fluorescence response only into the acidic pH and it is being uptaken by COX-2 level. And we are, we are right now working on a COX cancer with PGI. And you can clearly see in a cell imaging, the main probe with the celloxib is, giving, uh, is uptaken by the Cal27 oral cancer cell line and the fluorescence response because of the acidic nature. And the last figure in the patient biopsy, the red color is coming because of the COX-2 antibody and green color because of our fluorescence. So with a simple molecular design, we can help the clinician that this biopsy from a person has a COX-2 level, so you can recommend them anti-cancer drug along with the uh, inhibitor COX-2 inhibitor so the, for improving the survival. So because of the time constraint, these are the important publication. If someone is interested to know what I'm doing, so they can have a look on these public, uh, publication. We have recently published a review uh, with the title Theranostic Fluorescent Probe, and I hope that review could be helpful to the radiochemists because in the previous talks, there was a lot of uh, discussion that what synthetic chemists can help to the radiopharmaceutics. And uh, I'm thankful to JMM again for her, collab uh, for her collaboration because we are working in many projects. I'm not showing them today, but we are doing, but definitely in the next uh, next presentation, we'll definitely discuss about Dr. Ramavalia, Dr. Sheetal. Uh, uh, they are helping me in getting, what do you say, cell-based studies, as well as patient uh, response to our molecule and my international collaborations uh, because I, I feel lucky that if I have some design, some molecules, there are person who are sitting across the globe and they are more than happy to work on that molecule to make a beautiful science. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. If you have any question, you can ask me now and if we have a short time, maybe on the lunch. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for a very nice and lucid presentation. I think we can take one or two questions from the audience side. It's not just, uh, not from a very uh, chemistry point of view, uh, but from the biological point of view. My, my uh, question is that you have been working on COX-2 inhibitors, right? And uh, COX-2, it is, uh, you know, it is an inflammatory marker, more than what we call as a cancerous marker. So don't you see, don't you feel that uh, it is, uh, it could, we could get false positive results at that's, the inflammatory sites? That's very good question. But when we talk about like endomethacin, I said, or siloxib, mm -hmm. so we synthetic chemists, when we use a chemical linker, mm -hmm. we try to make sure that, that they can differentiate between the normal inflammation and cancer-associated inflammation. Another thing is that we are using a response like uh, acidic pH that is only more prominent in the cancer cell. So the diagnostic probe with a linker design and activity biomarker helps us in designing the theranostic probe with a drug tag with the same linker and the marker as activation to release the drug only into the cancer patient for that particular side, so that we can differentiate the normal inflammation of the cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Thank you. So next question is from the we may proceed with our uh, second speaker, Dr. Anil Pandey, who is a professor of medical physics in the Department of Nuclear Medicine, Ames, Sir, New Delhi. And his talk is on role of artificial intelligence in pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm sure it is going to be a very illuminating talk. Artificial intelligence is something uh, which is in buzz all across the globe. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer uh, for inviting me for this particular talk. The role of AI in Theranostic, role of means artificial intelligence in Theranostic. And uh, my talk is uh, having the three parts. First, I will discuss about the Theranostic, 
then AI and its application. Finally, so theranostic, as we all know, pair of pairs of radio labeled molecules that can be used for both treatment and imaging of disease. And well known diagnostic agent uh, iodine 123, sodium iodide. Therapeutic agent, corresponding therapeutic agent is iodine-131. Again, the target here is the sodium iodide co-transporter, and it is used for the treatment of thyroid cancer. The second example is gallium-68 PSMA as a diagnostic agent. Its therapeutic, corresponding therapeutic pair is lutetium-177 PSMA, and actinium-225 PSMA, Again, here the target is the PSMA and the disease which is being treated is prostate cancer. Uh, these are the image like when uh, of iodine-131 as used as a diagnostic agent and again here also used as a therapeutic agent. So the radionuclides that have the same isotopes with use in both therapy and imaging, they are referred as a true Theranostic pairs. Another example here is the iodine-131 MIBC. And uh, again, in the uh, diagnostic and the therapeutic part. Here, the concept comes, the magic bullet and the theranostic. And this concept was given by Paul Ehrlich. He was the German researcher. And the concept of magic bullet was as a specialized drug with chemical and biological properties that would enable the agent to precisely find and kill disease foci with no damage to the healthy tissue. And this concept really revolutionized the cancer treatment. And from this concept, there are various cancer drugs that have been developed. And the same concept was taken up by the nuclear medicine for the development of radio pharmaceuticals. So that the radio pharmaceuticals should go to the target only, whether it is for the diagnosis or for the therapy. Thus, in the era of personalized medicine, the concept of magic bullet, and in nuclear medicine specifically, the radio pharmaceutical play a pivotal role in rapiding, a rapidly emerging field of personalized dosimetry. Now, here also, we, what we are targeting basically in disease state, altered expression or aggregation of a specific molecules. That's what we are targeting. Those that, that whatever the radio pharmaceutical that should go to the where the altered expression is there or the aggregation of certain particular molecules are there in the disease state this should go and bind to do those cells only however in the real practice we know there is no there is no magic bullet exists basically we know that the radio pharmaceuticals when we when we develop a radio pharmaceutical or when we synthesize a, uh, a radio pharmaceutical, it has got a association constant and simultaneously it has got a dissociation constant also. So it actually what it should have happened, the radio isotope should have remained tagged with the radio to the pharmaceutical while moving inside the body. There dissociation should not or would not have happened but actually do it happens and that is the example here the radioisotope will be the free radioisotope will be taken up by the bone or by some enzyme some metal sorry when it will break it will have the different parts and it will go to the different parts of the body so the magic bullet concept is actually not happening but for that purpose, that's what we want to continue our research moving towards the concept of the magic bullet to develop a radio pharmaceutical which should have 
the specificity basically it should go to the target cells not to the normal cells so the research continued in new radio pharmaceutical developments these are the steps the first step is to identify the molecular target then we have to select chemical structure then optimize what its affinity towards the target selectivity these are the some constant which needs to be optimized during the development of radio pharmaceuticals radio labeling metabolism and once this process is complete then we finally go to the in vivo evaluations like in the human uh, our first animal then human now here the identifying molecular target selecting chemical structure and then optimizing these parts if we do the manually without the help of the computer this is labor int intensive time consuming and it has got a financial implication or financial cost is lots of financial cost is involved now the concept comes can the computer will help so here the concept comes of the in silico drug design methods in silico means we are just taking the help of computer so here again the identification of the altered expressions accumulation of the molecules then we are just identifying the biological targets now we go to the known ligands and characterizing the chemical structure see there is lots of development has already occurred in the field so the, how the computer is going to to take the help from that so we already know some known ligands know its property is known chemical structures it's most of the drugs chemical structure is known the receptors which we are trying to target in a in a disease state their structure is also known so what we are just doing it out by utilizing this knowledge which is already existing in the literature we are first finding out the lead molecules which can be the most suitable one out of the thousand molecules so here the computers can help the computer added design has come into the picture so once the lead molecule is identified we are choosing the chelators choosing the radionuclides then the radio labeling and biosynthesis occurs then finally we go for the in vitro and in vivo testing and finally clinical testing once the clinical testing is over we have got the final new developed radio pharmaceutical in general in silico approach focus on a structure and behavior of compounds for the modeling basically it is the computational model by using those computational models we are trying to find it out a best radio pharmaceutical first we are just identifying it out so there are two ways to do it out one is the structural modeling any structural modeling and another one is the behavioral computational modeling in a structural modeling there is two parts one is the structure based drug design and another group is called the ligand based drug design in a structural based drug design the main important model used is the molecular docking second one is the fragment based drug design and third one is the pharmacophore modeling in ligand based drug design here again the three models are there ligand chemical similarity search here the concept is like similar molecules will have the similar properties and so the existing from the literature we are searching it out the similar properties here 
a structure activity relationship the third second in the ligand best is the structure activity relationship means if the chemical has got this type of a structure its outcome is like this if it has got a some particular functional group it behave particularly in vivo like this this idea is there so we just want to do the regression modeling and then by doing the regression modeling we just find it out a new drug if this type of drug we design corresponding chemical property it will have like this and the third one is the again here common is the pharmacophore modeling behavioral modeling it has got the one model is the absorption distribution metabolism excretion and the toxicity how much toxic how much toxic it will be there so these are the two these are the model which is used in in silico design method or the computer aided design drug design if the structure of the target is not available in that case we are using ligand based drug design but if the structure of the target is available we are just using a structure based drug design methods and in the structure based drug design method also the most widely used one is the molecular docking here it's like that once we have got the target identified the chemical structure of the target available then we go for the structure based drug design method and if the target of the structure of the target is not available we go by ligand based drug design methods from that we just have the huh? oh sorry okay take it we have got the lead compounds and then we just develop the can radio pharmaceutical for the optimization purpose okay now here we have got i just told you that the with the existing literature we have got the database of the molecules a structure of the target chemical properties of the other chemicals and from this database or modeling ligand and the receptors most widely used technique is the uh, molecular docking these are the just example of showing that we have got the chelators and it has got the geometrical properties what type of geometry it has got whether it is the target or the chemical compounds this just shows that we have got the existing data it's enough existing data is available which we can use it out in the molecular docking also we have got various softwares are available which uses alag uh, which uses different types of algorithms and the other docking approaches it every software whatever the software is available it has got some pros and cons you can select what type of images it provides what type of flexibility it gives you can just select any one of them now these are the just related with the your uh, computer based design then what ai is going to take a role basically so the ai has got the three component important one is the artificial intelligence has got the machine learning and the deep learning these are the two things which is going to play a big role here also here the machine learning is comes through the supervised learning and another technique is called the unsupervised learning now artificial intelligence works just like the human brain works and the same human brains how the human brain works its model is converted in the computer like this like the same things we have arranged and we say it is a perceptron one is single unit is called the perceptron which works like this and now the con can i have uh, how how many more minutes i have got it's almost over uh, almost over so should i continue okay thank you 
in the machine learning also supervised learning in the in case of supervised learning you can just see what we do here we give some particular inputs and just like here you say this is a pool and we say to the computer this is a pool and the feature of the a pool is given a pool may, might be here color or something else in the case of our chemistry basically i told a structural activity relationship if you see in terms of the chemistry you have got some particular radio pharmaceutical which has got a particular behavior which it, it, it is known already so the chemical compound which will have the functional group or some particular features that features is for one chemical one chemical compound we have got one row so these are the features we just enter maybe like a different functional group and here how it is going to behave will be the output so the from the existing database that's what we do we fill a table now the computer understand that this chemical has got a behavior of like this by this it learns a particular concept and the next if we want to design a drug with certain particular functional group you just give the output he will design and produce a radio pharmaceutical of having the similar nature See, in that way here once he, this learning occurs because of a statistical algorithm which is already in built in the machine learning algorithms in case of especially if you go for the if you go for the deep learning methods how the deep learning works deep learning works mainly on the image based so we have got the chemical structure it has got a three dimensional structure and the target also it has got a three dimensional structure right so by giving this type of three dimensional structure we have got it goes to a particular target again in that way we are giving the supervised learning to the computer and computer itself learn from the images by giving once it learns from the images you can give a particular picture of or intended your radio pharmaceutical radio pharmaceutical which you are going to design it will have the three dimensional structure so how it will behave it can predict accurately because deep learning has got like it its accuracy goes around 90 92% if we train the model very well so there is lots of a scope there to play by the machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms in new radio pharmaceutical development research mm. application if you go for the application part uh, the most widely approach which has used in the radio pharmaceutical developments is the molecular docking a structure activity relationship analysis and the admit model uh, these are again the illustration some of the examples and algorithms about this there are different layers which occurs in the deep learning by which we do, do the training of the model training is really little bit like exhaustive time consuming definitely but rewarding it is very much rewarding here the knowledge is required how to optimize the performance of the deep learning neural networks uh okay in the structure yeah using artificial neural network deep learning neural, neural network the a structure activity relationship it has been quantified also so this quantifications gives like it's a uh, this the quanti once you have got the quantifications it performance optimizations becomes very much uh, better basically in the application we have got the 
application of this uh, in radio labeling of the chemotherapy drugs in the cancers molecular deck for this molecular docking methods have been used and it has proven its accuracy matches with the real life experience that's what they, experimentally they have validated it has used in the cancer it has also used in the development of the central drug for the diagnosis and therapy of central nervous systems diseases and inf infection inflammations also and in the other developing new pet agents also so thank you uh, thank you uh, dr pandey so maybe we can skip the question because already we are late yeah. next we invite dr jay shukla in fact she has invited all of us to be here so she will be talking about journey of radio pharmaceuticals at pgh chandigarh actually you can skip my talk because i was filling the gap as no. there was last minute changes so i thought i should oh, <laughs> yeah so most of the oh, most of the thing dr pelai and have, they have already contributed something which i want to say dr pelai and dr pande so so as we are here uh, to talk about radio pharmaceutical so i am talking about the journey of radio pharmaceutical at pgi i am specifically talking about the radio pharmaceutical which are either developed here or they have been utilized uh, initiated from the pgi so there are at dr pillai rightly said there are lot of radio pharmaceuticals and still there is search but the radio pharmaceutical which are in use they are only, only used in the uh, area so the first radio pharmaceutical which has been developed uh, i mean utilized is fdg label wbc which my colleague professor uh, um, uh, um, professor bhattacharya has developed here at pgi earlier everybody was using hmpo technetium 99m hmpo for wbc labeling but he started Uh, because the uh, because the of the pet better images are produced so he started the radio, radio labeling of uh, leukocytes with fdg the uh, technology is almost similar to hmpo but he has done standardization and some minor uh, some changes not minor minor but very important changes he has done like that in uh, earlier it was acd was used but here he has uh use uh, uh heparin uh, for uh, as anti coagulation agent and uh, you can appreciate that he has very well distinguished the uh, even the infection at the pacemaker lead so you can always talk during the lunch time or the tea time you will get good time to talk to him and uh, and he is always ready to teach this technique to anybody who is interested the second is the this is again done by my colleague dr rajender so the, the it is actually the radio pharmaceutical which is making the change it is not the biopsy but it is the, as sir said the beautiful image and the beautiful thing come from the ra beautiful radio pharmaceutical good radio pharmaceutical so psma uh, uh, which is used for the uh, prostate cancer so gallium 68 psma Uh, helps in guided biopsy of prostate cancer and it gives the only it takes out the only active disease tissue so this is the beauty of radio pharmaceutical guided biopsy so we are using uh, gallium 68 dot noc and uh, also fdg guided biopsy now coming to the uh, collaborative work the we have started gallium uh, sorry rgd which is uh, imaging which is used for uh, imaging angiogenesis so we have started in collaboration with dr sudeepta and uh, he has already uh, established a kit based preparation for hyenic rgd and we have done clinical studies at our center and also rgd which my colleague dr raki is here she has done a wonderful job and she has done her phd in uh, gallium rgd and she has also 
label this rgd with lutetium so uh, we can do therapy for the uh, like uh, tennis patient which are refracted to iodine as i rightly said that iodine is the best thing for the thyroid cancer and there is no replacement but sometimes the cancer is refracted to iodine so for that rgd a lutetium 177 label rgd can be used uh we have also got one um, molecule for angiogenesis uh, imaging that is uh, integrin antagonist carbamid this is given by our uh, international collaborator at uh, usa so we are uh, we also uh, explored this uh, ready pharmaceutical uh, and you can see the beautiful images and we it can also because these ready pharmaceutical which are other than the fdg there is no uptake in brain so we can see uh, brain or the skull uh, metastasis also so uh, generally we what we do is we see the receptors which are expressed on tumor and now there is a new concept which is looking for the micro environment and the, uh, you have all heard about the fapi which is a fibroblast activation protein inhibitor sir has uh, talked about inhibitors so here the it is uh, not targeting the cell but it is targeting the fibroblast which is responsible for the tumor progression and metastasis so the um, generally these fibroblast are in the nascent state and when the tumor is there it secretes some cytokines and some other chemicals which activate this fibroblast and um, this fibro fibroblast activation protein uh, is a Uh, it is responsible for tumor uh, progression so we can sir uh, as uh, dr pillai in his lecture told you that these inhibitors stops the growth of tumor so we can use inhibitors that uh, fapi this uh, fibroblast activate activation protein inhibitors are generally used there are several inhibitors which are now in uh, um, available in the market but uh, as dr partha rightly said that there are no all uh, now it is it is there but mostly the fibroblast act, uh, jo, in fapi in uh, molecules are not retaining for the longer duration so we cannot do therapy recently we have got a um, molecule that is not the, uh, the fapi are the non protein molecules but there is now a protein a peptide that is uh, uh, that is known as fap2286 this is showing very good retention in tumor and you will appreciate that it is also showing the uptake in the, on the day 10 so we have done dosimetry studies and you will uh, see that now dr patha your answer is here now we have a molecule so now coming to the molecules which we have developed this is the lutetium uh, 177 and rhenium 188 colloid particles this was developed by me and long back when i was in aims and dr shamim is here i think he has used in his thesis and now aims and pgi both are utilizing this molecule this uh, formulation for treatment of radiation sonovectomy we can use in house and i have also prepared kits cold kits so that it can be prepared in 30 minutes and it can be used for therapy and these formulation the the same colloid we are using for uh, making customized radioactive patches and uh, this we have developed at pgi and my colleague mr monish helped me in uh, dosimetry studies with and seeing that whether the patch which we are preparing is homogeneous or not so we have seen that the we have we could prepare homogeneous patches and we take the patch of the um, the lesion and then we took uh, on the graph paper you can see here it is, we can draw it on a graph paper to see the area and by this area we calculate the dose and it is a 4 hour treatment now we have reduced from two day therapy to one day therapy and we are doing Uh, we are applying this patch for 4 day that is just a day treatment and uh, people are benefited and you can see some uh, uh, examples so this is another molecule which uh, we have developed here at pgi only in collaboration with my uh, endocrine colleagues idea 
uh, that is ACTH for the uh, ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. As uh, we know that uh, uh, the CRH which is produced in hypothalamus, it is secreted and it is uh, uh, pituitary uh, on pituitary gland there are CRH receptors and uh, after binding this it secretes ACTH which then bind to the uh, cortex uh, uh, adren uh, adrenal and secrete cortisol. So in conditions like uh, Cushing syndrome which is uh, whether it is AC uh, which is uh, it is a uh, um, Cushing syndrome or it is a Cushing disease. Uh, so to uh, delineate the uh, the tumor and the to delineate tumor within the small pituitary, this molecule can, uh, is used. So we have synthesized this uh, molecule here. It is a uh, CRH is a 41 amino acid long. So we lab, um, uh, conjugated it with the DOTA and labeled it with gallium and we got very good images. As Sir said, the small is beautiful, so we are, uh, we explored then because my colleague uh, said that uh, there is a small molecule desmopressin which is used for um, uh, uh, IPC, IPSS, inferior petrosal sinus sampling. So we worked on this a small molecule, this is a nonapeptide and we modified it. Uh, because uh, there is no site for uh, chelation of uh, chelating agent. So we modified this molecule. Now it is a 10 amino acid peptide. As we have modified it, so we have done some uh, docking study as uh, Dr. Pandey was telling. We uh, did uh, molecular mod modeling simulations and we did uh, um, docking studies to see whether it is actually binding on the same site where desmopressin was acting. So we we have done this studies in vitro, then we synthesized this peptide and then we did some uh, um, uh, binding studies with the molecule, with the peptide or the uh, or the receptor peptide which is commercially available and we could show that it is actually very specific as when we uh, we saturate it there is uh, reduction in binding so and you will also appreciate that th this has showing a very good um, distribution there is no distribution throughout the body only the kidneys are visible so it is uh, secreted from the kidney so this is a very good molecule and we have shown, we have done some studies to show the, uh, for the, at what time we should do uh, imaging. So for that we have done, uh, and Dr. Raki, she is here, she ha helped us and, um, um, and you can, you will appreciate that uh, it, it, this is a big molecule, so there is a lot of activity in the tumor, uh, in the liver and with the, uh, Vesopressin, uh, uh, this is Desmo, there is, it is a small molecule, so there is no activity in liver. Then coming to the, uh, uh, okay, we have also prepared the kit, cold kit for this, and we are open for collaboration. So anybody uh, can uh, approach to us. So, and the next molecule is uh, the microspheres, which are used for uh, liver cancer therapy. As we, we all know that therospheres and cerospheres um, uh, are very costly and even a small uh, income group cannot afford it. So what we did is we uh, pre uh, prepared a cost effective. That is, we are giving this uh, molecule in 5,000 rupees only. So uh, it is actually 1% cost of the commercially available therosphere or the serospheres. So it is before the students, it is based on the uh, dual blood supply to the liver as the liver is uh, the normal liver gets supply from the portal vein and the tumor gets supply from the hepatic artery. So we are actually tra tracking the hepatic artery to um, pr uh, to uh, deliver this uh, radioactive uh, spheres to the tumor. So we have done some uh, chemical analysis and we and uh, we have labeled this mi uh, microspheres with the um, uh, FITC so that we can show that it is the microspheres 
which uh, uh, these are these microspheres are actually taken up by the tumor cells so they are inside the tumor and giving the irradiation so we have got two patents in that one for the rhenium labeled microsphere and one for the cold kit and again we have done some studies uh, as the there is crisis for rhenium so we have shifted to lutetium 177 here also we did some studies because it is a long lived isotope so we could do the some studies and we have seen that uh, the lutetium microspheres when enters in the cell it induces the apoptosis and which leads the cancer death so this work is also uh, uh, dr uh, sorry arti and uh, sejal they help me in this and these are few images this is the first image showing the um, uh, technetium labeled microspheres for the um, uh, pre dose therapy pre -do uh, therapy dosimetry and you will appreciate the the good localization of these microspheres within the tumor and this is uh, the patient with the neuroendocrine tumor in the liver after ripples the recurrence was there and we treated this patient with uh, these microspheres and you will uh, um, see that uh, the disease is totally gone and uh, so um, this is a very good modality and um, the now we have developed lutetium labeled microspheres and to our surprise also we could see this microsphere up to 3 months even we could not believe it but that uh, it is a truth and the images are in front of you and because these are internalized these generally the cerspheres and thespheres are bigger in size so they are near the tumor they don't enter into the tumor and because these molecule, these um, uh, microspheres are smaller in size these penetrate because of the enhanced permeability and retention so these and these uh, spheres entered in the cell tumor cells and irradiated so uh, we could get even after 3 months the uh, um, activity we could see Uh, then again this is again a work of my phd student we have developed tamoxifen for um, er positive breast cancers for theranostic molecule and you uh, the you will appreciate that uh, uh, just 2 minutes and and the, uh, i just want to show this uh, the because uh, i want to show the specificity of this molecule this patient after giving this uh, tamoxifen Uh, um, technetium tamoxifen we could not see anything so we just we was very worried so we saw that this patient was on tamoxifen treatment and we, somehow we missed this uh, during history so this is the in vivo quality control in vivo checking that this is specific for the er receptors similarly my uh, other students the priya and the yogesh they, they these two worked on um, trastuzumab fab and we have labeled trans, trastuzumab with gallium and lutetium gallium for the fab molecule because it is a smaller molecule but as sir rightly said that we are little apprehensive on using this because it is most of it is localizing in the liver so uh, though we have developed it and it has showing very good affinity for the tumor but um, unfortunately we are not convinced to use it in the uh, patients so but we did some initial studies showing this uh, this is this work was done by uh, our uh, student dr priya and you can appreciate that it is localized in the uh, tumor the liver and the breast and this is uh, the gallium fab which is localized in the so this is not for the imaging but we can see and we can uh, whether our um, the um, uh, our the um, ready pharmaceutical will work on it or not and uh, the it is showing the specificity also and this is the lower one is the fab labeled with lutetium so you will appreciate that the, the good localization is there this is my team the brigade the young brigade which is helping me in uh, all the radio pharmaceutical work and i am thankful to uh, 
all those my students and my seniors. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Jaya, for embarking us to the journey of radio pharmaceuticals in your center. Uh, we may take one or two questions, quick questions. So if not, we conclude the session. And I must thank Dr. Jaya and the organizing team for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank the distinguished chairpersons and speakers for sharing their expertise in this session. Now I would like to request Professor Anish Bhattacharya to come on the dais to present mementos to our uh, distinguished chairpersons for the session and the speakers. May I request Dr. Vijeta Chadda, ma'am, to please come on the stage. May I request Dr. Sanjeev Soni, sir, to please come on the stage. May I request the distinguished speakers, Dr. Anil Pandey, and Dr. Amit Sharma to please come on the stage for the mementos. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> With this, SME comes to a temporary halt as I would like to coordinately invite everyone for a delicious lunch outside. Please join us to refuel and refresh yourselves and we'll meet after a short lunch.
So welcome, and you may start your. Thank you, Chairman Sir. A very uh, afternoon to everyone. I can see a mixed faculty group from not only from PGI but also from other parts of the country. So, uh, with a brief, brief background of what we do or what might be my role for your current session would be to give you a brief overview how you can protect your intellectual property or your inventions through this IPR regime. I think the country is all together talking about patents. We are all, you know, hearing our innovation index rankings. We are being ranked not only on the global level, but also on the state level. So Punjab, I can vouch, we are on, you know, sixth among all different states. In patent filing, we are fifth ranked as compared to other states of the country. So basically, my purpose of being with you all here today afternoon is that give you an overview of how you actually can go about protecting your contributions in the context of intellectual property. Today, be being just you know 15 minute session, I'll focus more on patents. But IP is not only restricted to patents, and IP is like a entire ocean of protections that you can seek for your in, uh, inventions. So with that background, let us quickly understand what it means, because you all are scientists here, so I might not be the right person to talk about science, but I'll just take you from your science to the legal perspectives because whatever you make in your research laboratories or your clinics is eventually for the benefit of the society. So you are giving back your science to the patients. And while you do this, you know, you will be required to go through the legal systems that are available in the country. Specifically in our field, you will be required to file for your intellectual property so that you can not only monopolize your market and also to also you know give a good competition to whatsoever the products are there in your field so basically understanding intellectual property just my simple one question has any one of you filed a patent or any other intellectual property yes. sir has so since we just have one faculty member i'll just start with the basics very quickly when we talk about property we already uh, always refer to our house flats, cars, phones, gadgets, etc. Because you go to the market, buy that product, buy your property, get a registration certificate, keep renewing it, and you, you know, follow certain terms and conditions of use, and you have ownership to that property, right? What to the property, what you are, you know, actually contributing by investing major active time of your life? you are developing new products you are you know improvising processes you are you know dealing with the patient care so what about that anything that you develop using your intellect is your intellectual contribution and if you go about protecting it under certain legal context that is available in the country it will be become your property and this property will be very similar to what you call property in the general terms and this property is not only, you know, protecting one thing. For example, when we go about protecting our house, getting registration certificate, they will tell you that, okay, this is your residential property. You can, you know, use it for residing yourself. You can give it on rent. You can sell it off, gift it to your children, whatsoever, but with certain terms and conditions. When we say certain terms and conditions, residential properties cannot be commercially used. You can't disturb your neighbors. You have certain, you know, terms and conditions attached to each and every property. When I have a car, I'm, you know, free to use my car throughout my country. But then if I want to take it out of my country, I have to take certain permissions and, you know, get certain clearances. If at all, I am, you know, driving on a highway, there's a certain speed limit which I have to adhere to. I have to get my license, etc., etc. right? So these are the terms and conditions. Similarly, intellectual property also has certain terms and conditions. It will give you protection in different spheres. For example, starting with the basic example of pen, which we all must be having in our pockets. So this pen that you hold today might have intellectual properties in different senses. There is some certain ink flow mechanisms. We have gel pens. We have sabse lamba likhne wala pen, sabse acha likhne wala pen. So, this ink flow mechanism is technology that is going into the manufacturing of a pen. So that is patentable because patent will support 
any technological advancement that might be a product that might be a process coming from landline land phones to mobile phones this is a incremental increase in technology so this is patentable this patent is given for 20 years and again it is a registered property you get a registration certificate after the grant of the patent but what about the brand names generally we go to the market tell them okay i want ciplox by cip you know ciprofloxacin by this particular company so what is this this is branding right the salt might be same in all the companies but you have specific brands and you might follow certain brand saying ki okay this is a good brand i'll take medicine only from this brand similar goes for every product that we buy from the market it might be medical it might be pen it might be car it might be jet you have certain brand to it so that brand gets protected under trademarks again this is a proprietary you know property and generally if the brands get you know valued after a certain period of time when they actually you know build up their brand in providing specific quality service whatsoever but they are not i'll say specifying the quality to it they are not specifying the technology to it we are buying nike shirts because we have a swoosh on that t-shirt they are not talking about this is a recycled shirt this is you know let's say not color bleeding shirt etc etc you are not bothered you are just bothered that it is coming from nike company and that is it so this is again a ip that would protect your name so if you are to give your technology or your let's say research to any xyz company for commercialization so that would require mark protection or a startup probably then that startup would have a protection under trademarks similarly we have industrial designs all the intellectual properties on my slide these are different ips and they have different legal protection to them so i'm just trying to give you a brief background that everyone will give you a certain level of different kind of protection when i talk about industrial design it is basically how the product looks like generally there are many segments of products which we pick because it suits or appeals to our eye what about the designer jewelry or let's say ladies suits sarees even you know ready made garments but that is not restricted to that let's think about when we go out buying for a car so i might have same features same you know more or less mileage etc etc features in different models of by different companies which car i buy is also dictated not only by brand but also how it looks like and that automotive designing goes for protection under the industrial design so every product how it is placed on the market and does not refer to anything that is inside so uh, let's say a uh, cupboard how it looks like from the outside is industrial design it might have two shelves it might have 20 inside so that is not the botheration so every product that is saleable in the market will have industrial design which might get protection if that is new right so this industrial design gets protection for 15 years maximum that is lesser than the patent and at the same time it also does not talk about any technology to it it is the appearance the patent is for technology similarly other intellectual property rights like plant variety protection will pr provide protection to the new plant varieties or the farmer pro uh, you know varieties or the semiconductor layout designs they would give certain amount of protection to the design of whatever you know is being made but particularly to the current audience set i think patents industrial designs and trademarks are of maximum relevance so i've talked about those but otherwise every intellectual property on my slide has certain legal legislation to protect it and only confidential information is something that does not get protection under a particular act the reason is that you know trade secrets are given protection under the contract act again there is certain level of protection so in case we have any infringement we will go back to the courts and ask for protection under those particular acts just giving you example taking you back from the bp you know recording machine how it was first patented and this is a you know united states patent office grant certificate you know grant picture that have taken but ultimately then correlating to each and every product that we see around from chair to pen to jet everything will have certain intellectual properties one or many in the same product 
for example we talked already you know i discussed about the pen so similar is for any equipment in your lab similar is for any you know technological kits that you get in your day to day lives as i already said these intellectual properties they are to be dealt with as you deal with other tangible properties you can gift it out sell it give it for license that we you know generally can relate with hiring something or you can use it yourself manufacture it right so this is again as good as your house or things but it has a added advantage the advantage is if i own a house in this city i would be able to use that house only in chandigarh what about a patent if i patent some technology in india i can you know extend my protection by filing in other countries of the world that might be one to all so if i find my invention worthy enough to be commercialized in different countries i can protect my invention simultaneously on all the interested countries and that would bring back royalty to me from all those countries that i can you know give a good example from the covid vaccine so when we developed the vaccine we you know protected not only in india but other countries where we wish to get commercialization done similarly for all mncs they will not only protect it in their own home countries for example apple phones or etc they will also file it in different countries so this intellectual property is a property which will give you your royalties or your you know recoupment of your investment not only in one country but in simultaneously in different countries so it's anyhow a better property to hold as i already said all the intellectual properties have protection that is coming back from certain legislatures patent act safeguards the rights of patents similarly each and every ip i told you has a certain act so when he, when anyone is copying or let's say you know infringing upon your rights we are liable you know to take legal actions as per the respective acts but not going into much of the legal details because the current you know scope of the session is to enlighten everyone what we can do back at our places because you all are you know you all are from medical sciences so i just example of how you can protect your intellectual property so basically the scope of iprs in medical research is not only in patents but trademarks designs copyrights i forgot to talk about copyrights but it is generally giving you rights over your expression how you write it or how you you know um, take it to the public so that expression gets copyrighted any journal art article that you write blogs you write or you know um, the pamphlets that come along with the devices or even the pamphlets that come along with the medicines the strips right so those kind of pamphlets get copyrights because those copyrights help them protect the language that are using to communicate with their user so if i have made this presentation i have a copyright on this without even going for formal registration so this is the only right wherein we don't require any formal registration but the registration subsists as soon as i fix my expression to certain medium that might be a usb drive that might be like you know any other format so if i have fixed that to a paper or to a usb that gets subsisted all i need to do is if i want to claim rights on this ppt so i'll just simply put a c in a circle and give the year of you know uh, making it public so that will give me protection if i have certain evidence that this is made by me because again hum log protect karte hai kyun hai kisi cheez ko why do we go for formal registration so that agar aapke ghar mein koi aa raha hai so you can show the papers that this home home belongs to me you are not the authorized you know owner so these registrations also do the same thing it's always better if there is a commercial angle to go for formal registration otherwise if you can prove it to the world by certain evidences then you can you know even skip the copyright registration but otherwise for patents etc it is mandatory to go for formal registrations for you to take any legal action we have different classes in all intellectual property rights you know for us to classify our product in what class it should be protected this is similar to the taxonomical you know classifications all fields of technology are classified and there is a complex system 
बट अल्टीमेटली जस्ट फॉर रेफरेंस से फॉर पैटर्न फॉर ट्रेडमार्क फॉर डिजाइन वी हैव पर्टिकुलर क्लासेस सो यू कैन जस्ट रेफर टू एन एक्सपर्ट फॉर गेटिंग द क्लास वेयर इट शुड बी रजिस्टर्ड पैटर्न एज एट ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू इट्स गिवन फॉर अ टेक्नोलॉजिकल एडवांसमेंट इट माइट बी इन द फॉर्म ऑफ अ प्रोडक्ट और अ प्रोसेस इट इज पैटेंटेबल और इट इज रजिस्ट्रेबल फॉर ट्वेंटी ईयर्स इन ल्यू ऑफ द डिस्कलोजर दैट यू गिव टू द पेटेंट ऑफिस दैट डिस्कलोजर इज गिवन इन द पर्टिकुलर सेट ऑफ प्रिस्क्राइब्ड फॉर्म्स आई थिंक it's always better to go through an expert for filing of your patent not only because it you know will help you to draft very aptly legally you know uh, solid claims but also because the format and the you know system is such that you have to comply by all the requirements in a particular format so it becomes easier if you go through an expert but otherwise online filing is freely available on the website of patent office and if at all you are confident enough you can just refer to the filing manual and you can file it yourself but of course even all the technologies that we talk about going for patenting are not patentable because in this is a legal system so it has certain i'll say exceptions to it section 3 and section 4 clearly define what cannot be patented in india and this section particularly gives you you know uh, the legal language but i've just simplified things specifically in radio pharmaceuticals i mean because i think all of the faculty members are from that group so again section 4 says that inventions related to atomic energy should not be patentable this is true for the inventions wherein some you know um, atomic energy usage required for certain you know bigger role is required but i think jaya ma'am's patents are like a big example wherein the pharmaceutical uh, um, Uh, uh i'll say application of radio pharmaceuticals has been done and she has been granted already few patents related to the radio labeling of the diagnostic kits so that can be done but otherwise again in case of any query i think it's best to ask for an expert advice and he or she would be able to help you because i am almost you know done away with my time so i might not be going in for the details of the procedure but of course as you have procedures for other things there is a lot of you know paperwork and things going on which needs to be complied with the patent office procedures general questions are what is the fees who can file or where we can seek help so only three last questions i'll answer before i say goodbye first is who can apply the institution and should apply i mean you should be filing in on the behalf of the institution because it's best one ethically because the institution is either employing you or giving you certain educational qualification degree in lieu of the research that you do so they should be the rightful owners otherwise the act you know clearly says that anyone can file if like you are in dealing in certain other domain so you can file in case you are not in employed in the same domain a radio pharmacist can file a patent in let's say mechanical engineering on his own name or i'll say not can he may second what would be the fees or where to go where to go i think you can you know take advice from an expert generally all states have their patent information centers which are supported by department of science and technology for chandigarh and punjab we are there at sector 26 chandigarh so you can refer to us you can simply route your applications through the ipr cell and we would support the application then what would be the fees in my you know channel only all the fees required would be filed or given away by department of science and technology and we don't claim any loyalty or you know uh, ownership out of the application we are doing it for building up the ip portfolio of the institutions but otherwise the basic fee of 1600 plus 4000 of the examination charges is the minimum bare minimum uh, uh, fees that is to be paid to the government for getting a grant of a patent you can of course you know contact your nearest pics for help they would be you know more than happy to support because any uh, research that is not funded by any other external agency we generally take up applications from those institutions starting from schools up till the research institutions we are you know filing applications for each one of the stakeholders from the academic side just before i end i am giving you you know few examples of applications which have been filed from the institution where we are all here together so this one vertebral plate has been filed and it has already been granted so this was for the plate that is you know made to support the spine um, injuries and the second eos needle this is under examination and we are you know hopeful to get the grant this year 
but i mean for any of the inventions coming out of your respective institutions feel you know free to ask back your ministries or your ipr cells and they would be supporting these kind of filings and you know there is entire system of support not only financial legal also for the documentation support we are well connected with the ecosystem for us you know to facilitate every uh, inventor so with that thank you so much for your patient listening i hope i have you know at least tinkered your interest in the field and if you have any queries i think uh, maybe if the chairman allows thank you thank you madam for explaining the principles involved in intellectual property rights and patents first do no harm or primum non nocer is the essential principle that regulates all medical ethics so whatever we do in medical practice invent a new molecule we should not be harming an individual or the society and dr nasrat is going to elucidate on this principle on her talk on new radio pharmaceuticals ethical consideration dr nasrat please thank you please stick to the time thank you sir thank you very much um at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to interact with you all uh, i would like to mention in the beginning itself that uh, uh, whatever i am going to talk about is a result of a very long drawn interaction that we keep having from different sets of people and especially people in nuclear medicine uh, so it, uh, it draws out from the conversations that i have had with them at different uh, in different capacities uh, so basically uh, what i want you to see here is uh, appreciate that uh, this clinical trial registry of india i just did some initial search i put the search term of radio pharmaceuticals there and uh, uh, i try to see how many clinical trials with radio pharmaceuticals are registered there it was a quick search my search term could be faulty but i did not come up with any but on the other hand the global registry which is clinicaltrials.gov registry if you put those terms you can appreciate that more than 1300 uh, results throw up that is just to say that clinical trials registry has really uh, is really well populated with trials in uh, in um, um radio with radio pharmaceuticals over the globe uh, unfortunately we have really missed the bus uh, i think uh, i'm sorry i think there has been some mistake there one my, of my earlier slides has uh, got removed somehow but uh, that's okay why i think is important for us to understand this aspect is simply because nuclear medicine as we have known i mean in the last 20 years of my stay in this institute it has grown by leaps and bounds you see it earlier it was only in terms of diagnostics that we were looking at it but now it is therapeutics it is theranostics and all these terms i have understood from nuclear medicine only and uh, uh, not only that the projected market of this uh, uh, uh industry um, uh, of radio pharmaceuticals uh, is uh, uh, showing a very exponential increase in fact uh, by the year 2028 some of the market projections uh, uh, predict nearly 11.8% increase from what it was a couple of years ago now that's phenomenal and uh, for us it may not be so much of interest to look into the market aspects of it but uh, i have seen the expanse of utility of nuclear medicine uh, and the radio pharmaceuticals over a period of time and i think it is very important that this discussion comes into um, a general discussion in the group that we are i am currently uh, talking to uh, so when when i just see look at this discrepancy in the results which are thrown in the clinical trial registries and when i see the kind of utility that radio pharmaceuticals uh, um, are throwing up these days uh, why how do we address this discrepancy why is it that we have such a discrepant observation so the question that comes to your mind is are radio pharmaceuticals radio pharmaceuticals being treated as drugs the answer is no 
in our the laws that we are governed by we, the radio pharmaceuticals are mentioned in section schedule k of drugs and cosmetics act and that gives an exemption for them to be treated as drugs now once they are not treated as drugs they cannot be governed by laws which dictate evaluation and clinical development program uh, as a uh, preclinical development program as well for any other drug so that's a kind of loophole but the catch 22 situation is that they get figured in indian pharmacopoeia so over the period of time more and more monographs of radio pharmaceuticals are being included in indian pharmacopoeia so it's a kind of you know virodha bhas kind of uh, or contradictory kind of um, uh, situation i wouldn't say that there was no reason for excluding radio pharmaceuticals from pharmaceuticals uh, for from the definition of drugs there was some reason simply because of the nature of these agents uh, it, there is some justification but it leaves us in a very difficult kind of situation so the next question is does the clinical development program for a new radio pharmaceutical deserve the same rigor as for drugs now you all would know that if you have to develop a drug it has to go move through preclinical evaluation where a lot of studies are done in animals bench studies are carried out all this data is taken uh, and then um, healthy volunteer studies in some healthy volunteers is take done for assessment of safety etc and subsequently it moves gradually to the level where it can be tried out in thousands and thousands of patients in large phase 2 or phase 3 trials so that's the process which is adopted for um, uh, other uh, drug products but it is is it what is needed for radio pharmaceuticals as well i believe it would be needed because anything which is proving a benefit would always come with some potential for causing harm and uh, the whole essence of ethics is that we under we ourselves understand this risk benefit paradigm and we help anyone who is taking that uh, drug or radio pharmaceutical for any purpose understands it very well so if you take a look at uh, i'll walk you through with an example which uh, uh, we faced and i would like to make this declaration that it is not with any malafide interest there was a proposal for the mentioned compound here which seemed very promising for hepatocellular carcinoma evaluation in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma this was submitted by a very enterprising and very competent faculty member of the institute and uh, it was very very well meaningful but uh, what we realize is we as ethics committee it was submitted to ethics committee for ethical approval there were certain questions which came to my to our mind what where was the investigators brochure where were the details of preclinical findings what happened when it was given to animals or what was the stability studies how it was distributed all that we were not aware of then we did not know what was the status of the product in india uh, whether one of these components is approved or both these components are approved then of course as a text committee we had to answer this question can this be regarded as new drug if we go by the documents which are available to us it was not regarded as new drug but this is submitted for us to give us an approval or otherwise so the we were in a big dilemma uh, then uh, if something is not available in india for routine use will it be imported what will be the channel that will be used for of course when we are sitting on a ethics committee it is very important to determine the risk benefit and the way we do it is very methodical we evaluate all the preclinical data and all the clinical information that would be available that for just by saying that it is found to be safe is not sufficient we need the data for that and uh, what is the potential benefit then uh, we have very strict rules about compensation for injuries if a patient faces them during a participation in clinical trials government of india in its best of wisdom has laid down very elaborate mechanisms so uh, um, we we thought that this kind of thing really needs to be done in india but it was uh, the kind of laws that we were governed by or the regulations and guidelines we were governed by we could not move ahead with this granting and approval and in fact the situation was like that we had to establish a dialogue in fact uh, that initial dialogue could be the harbinger of laying down some steps 
which may be of use for the radio or nuclear medicine community subsequently. If we just take a quick look at the situation in other countries, I would like to tell that U.S., uh, which is governed by Food and Drug Administration, all the clinical development programs of any product, uh, which be it radio pharmaceuticals also, is governed through US FDA. And they have very elaborate sets of regulation for moving it through. And the rigor that it achieves is required for this kind of way ahead is just the same as that for any new drug. There are elaborate regulatory guidelines. In fact, in US also initially, Radio pharmaceuticals were not part of these uh, governance mechanisms, but subsequently by the Modernization Act, these uh, it was brought into the fold of the US FDA. The review process would require all the information that I had initially men mentioned. Uh, it would require a very clearly written down protocol with inclusion exclusion criteria, a summary of the risks, uh, risk mitigation strategies, competence of the investigators. All those are looked into just like they are looked into the uh, for any other kind of medical product which is to be evaluated in a clinical trial format. In fact, European Union and Canada also have similar elaborate guidelines. European Union guidelines are rather flexible, I would say, but uh, uh, they are and they are more, uh, you know, something which we could possibly adopt from. And they are more, much more similar to the situations that we face. So I think there are frameworks which are available for guiding us on ethics aspects and regulatory aspects. I'm sorry, I trespassed to regulation as well, because all ethics in India is also governed by certain regulations. So it is important to talk of them in the same breath. So I think we have such legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks which guide ethics for conducting such trials, and we should be referring to them as well. Uh, in, when we come to India, there is a certain different kind of framework which is existing. All, all of it is under the broader umbrella of Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, and which is under the Department of Atomic Energy. Um, I would just like to mention that uh, uh, the utility of these products was realized for medical therapeutic use, and Bahaba Atomic Research Center uh, plays a very key role in this area. There are other committees also, which I have not mentioned here, just because it would uh, take more time. Uh, importantly, the organization or the body which looks into giving approvals for new chemical entities or new devices is represented on board with Atomic Energy Research Board committees. So that is a good thing, which is there that allows us to move around, we start the process. And uh, a very good learning can be drawn from the example of medical devices. Till some times ago, whenever any project would come to ethics committee for getting approval or not, we were lost. Till these two uh, uh, GFRs were uh, uh, circulated by government of India, which made things very easy for us because they clearly stated that they will be governed by the same rules and regulations as are available for new chemical entities or new drugs. So then we knew that we had to apply the same principles and everything fell into place. I understand that it would be it would need to be a little different for radio pharmaceuticals because the kind of toxicity studies and other studies that you would do would be slightly dissimilar. So even with that understanding, uh, some kind of initial startup uh, circulation about uh, uh, the kind of regulations that they can be um, referred to is very much needed. Then there are certain principles. It says that, I mean, learning from uh, this example of medical devices, we can appreciate that there also they said that the studies have to be following good clinical research practices. It is abbreviated as GCP, but it is actually good clinical research practices. And all the ethical principles which are uh, for any other drug uh, entity would need to be applied for the same. So I think that kind of learning can be drawn for radio pharmaceutical. Basically, uh, all 
the decision making process is governed by the broad aspect broad assessment of risk and benefit and as i had mentioned earlier that risk and benefit is by the series of evaluation that would have been done prior a priori before you came up with assessing it in giving submitting a plan for assessment in humans there are aspects which are related to participants rights which are very important and they have to be taken care of because a participant has a right to refuse participation still get the same treatment has a many other rights which i'll touch upon subsequently so these are the two things which are always at the backdrop of our decision for going go no go for any submission which is given to the ethics committee uh so these 12 principles have been laid laid down in our icmr guidelines we needn't move beyond that there has to be a background information it should be scientifically sound this is very important because very many times people come back and argue with us that scientific soundness should not be a regime anything which is not scientifically sound is not ethical that is one thing transparency has to be very clear disclosure to the participant about potential adverse events and unexpected adverse events uh, have to be written down in the submission and have to be explained to the participant and the competence of investigators team it is not one person but the entire team's competence has to be uh, taken into consideration as i was mentioning about above all do no harm that should be the thing they should have been uh, that should be the backdrop of any clinical research protocol then risk mitigation strategies what are the investigators doing to see that the risks are minimized how have the vulnerable subjects been taken care of or compensation in case of injuries now this i say again will perhaps not apply to radio pharmaceuticals as per the current regulations stand and then accountability who is accountable for all the happenings to a participant in the end that has to be clearly mentioned a, a very important document is a participant information sheet which should be as explicit as possible it should be in the vernacular it should Uh, detail in, in simple language the language which a participant can understand should make aware the player should be able to make the participant aware of all his rights and duties his or her rights and duties it should make a mention about confidentiality and points of contact in case there is any uh, thing a miss that the participant experiences then it, the participant information sheet has to be followed by consent which would vary from a situation to situation in times it can be signed by legally acceptable representative in our countries where sometimes people are illiterate we need to have a provision for witness signature a nominee has to be assigned in case of compensation has to be made and a copy of the pis and consent form after signature has to be given to the participant so i'll just skip this um so uh, uh, once an approval is given ctri registration is mandatory sa reporting serious adverse event reporting is now very well defined the process is very well defined for other pharmaceutical products uh, right now that doesn't apply to radio pharmaceuticals and that's where our dilemma is but it would need to be put in place then we also require annual status report that is the kind of rigor that ethical committees require for any clinical trial protocol and i see no reason why it should not be for radio pharmaceuticals there are some uh, scope for a little uh, relaxation in case of academic studies in radio pharmaceuticals but still all the ethical principles would need to be adhered to and now it is required ethics committees to have an oversight of all the ongoing projects as well so that would be an important consideration once these things are applied to uh, radio pharmaceutical studies we have very beautifully written down guidelines by indian council of medical research and i think they should form the uh, backbone of any plan that we make in future with this i'll come to an end of my talk thank you for the patient listening and just 
Calvin and Hobbes, my favorite cartoon, where they say means define, there is an argument about means define end and end defines mean. And finally, they decide that it's the means which define end. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be happy to take any questions. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Nasrat. I think both the talks on intellectual property right and ethical considerations very, very important. Nuclear medicine fraternity usually miss these such type of talks, and both are very learning. And thank you for participating. I have two, one to two small comments or query you can say. Abbas. Like one is radio pharmaceuticals. Few are there in the Indian pharmacopoeia, but as the nuclear medicine developing, newer and newer radio pharmaceuticals are coming, especially theranostic. So how to go what for uh, including more and more radio pharmaceuticals in the IP? First is this. Second, you mentioned about this uh, Radio Pharmaceutical Committee, which is DAE committee, not BRC, but Department of Atomic Energy Committee. I'm also a member of that, and a member from the CDSCO is also there. But that committee entertains projects or uh, research proposal only from the DAE. So we have represented many times. We have asked them, why not from other institutes from India who are doing research and want to develop the radio pharmaceutical, why not to consider those? They say it is not our mandate. So we ask them to write to DA, but so far there is no solution to this. Only institute-based academic search is being done. If we want to do something, put to ethical committee, get the approval and start doing. Even multi-centric want to do, different center can have their own ethical approvals and start. But once it is done, suppose here, and it is a successful, we want to give to other institutes. How to go about this? Because there is no approval for that. And uh, CDSCO also says, and uh, even Schedule K, which you mentioned, exemption, these very soon, these are going to be off. Everything has to be with the provision of CDSCO and has to be registered. So your comments on that, please. Yes, I totally agree. Even if we have started including monographs of radio pharmaceuticals in Indian pharmacopoeia, they are still very, very limited. So I think uh, the way out, if I had to take this call, I mean, this is your specialty, sir. The way out is that you, somebody, either a society of nuclear medicine, Indian society of nuclear medicine, I trust there would be one like that, should take this initiative. And it should be a regularly a done exercise from your end. You just keep on communicating to CDSU. I think they would be open to that. Second thing was about uh, uh, not entertaining products from uh, proposals from uh, other institutes. I think we are doing a grave injustice to the competence which exists in a country right now. I have seen such wonderful things which are being uh, developed, and uh, uh, I see no reason why they should not move through large multicentric clinical trials. In fact, uh, uh, for while reviewing for this uh, um, uh, presentation, I saw the kind of trials that are being done with radio pharmaceuticals. They are well-powered, multi-centric, multi-country studies which are being done, but all of it is largely from the global north. And that is, I would say, the or tragedy of the century because um, some of the work that I have had an op option, uh, opportunity to look at should go from here to the rest of the world, and the way to do so is have your regulations in place. So there should be a representation. Again, I can just say how I would have done, perhaps and there could be better ideas. There should be a representation sent from the Society of Nuclear Medicine with a plan in place to CDSU. I think having it under the umbrella of CDSU with adequate representation from members of um, you know, Baba Atomic Research Center, etc would be a good option. I, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we really don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already have very good guidelines and regulations available with us. We just have to modify them. So. Yes. You talk of this uh, FDA, well, 
and all these things. But what happens, you know, when it is in the form of a radiochemical, then their problem is different. When you label it with radioactive compound, then it becomes radiopharmaceutical. Then you will have to go the quality control process, the process as a good manufacturing practices. Then it comes under drug and uh, drug control and cosmetic acts. Huh. So you uh, second thing is about the sample size. How many patients you are going to try? So, so, so these are all you know questions you will have to answer. What is the sample size? If sample size is very small, you go, you want to get it approved, no one will approve it. That sample size can be taken care of. It can be phase one, phase two, phase three. No, they give not like that. ICMR gives not like that. They give that limited trial. Then so, uh, they give limited trial. I use uh, for my pharmacy for my ICMR. <laughs> Fine. So, so, yeah. So I can answer, but if time permits, or I'll take it later. So it would sample size would totally depend on the question that you're asking. It's a very scientific. It's not arbitrary. Radio pharmaceuticals and uh, the other kind of radio labeled compounds often are used for situations which are very rare also. So there the, the uh, methodology and the pathway would be very different. In order to make this white paper, we need to understand what is the existing framework for other things, and then we can go about it. And I think we should. Thank you. Director General of ICMR, Dr. Rajiv Behel, is a very well uh, learned epidemiologist and he is also the secretary to the department of health research dhr so with that capacity of dhr director general i think he can take up this and they are developing new guidelines for new devices all the devices you know uh, so i think if you write to director general icmr they can make some solution anyhow thank, thank you thank you very much both the speakers, you have done a wonderful job. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank you to our esteemed chairpersons and speakers for sharing their wisdom and introducing us to the ethical considerations and legal frameworks for pharmaceutical development throughout the session. I would like to request Professor G.P. Bandopadhyay to present the memento to the chairpersons and the speakers. Hmm. Next in line, we delve into the fifth session focusing on diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals in disease management where these vital agents are highlighted for their pivotal role in accurately detecting and monitoring diseases. Welcome to our session where we are honored to have Dr. Anish Bhattacharya, Professor at PGI MER and Dr. Rajesh Kumar, Professor and Head at Ames Jodhpur as our esteemed chairpersons. Over to the chairpersons. Uh, so the next session is on diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals and the management of diseases. We have three speakers, uh, Dr. Ramabalia, Dr. Madhavi Tripathi and Dr. Kanaya. So the first speaker and oh sorry, 
Dr. Rajender Kumar is the fourth speaker uh, who will be also speaking. We'll just introduce them one by one. So, Dr. Rama Valia is the first speaker. <coughs> Dr. Rama is additional professor in the Department of Endocrinology. In fact, she's one of the very enthusiastic supporters of nuclear medicine. Mm -hmm. She keeps inspiring us with uh, ideas about you know, what she wants done. That's, that's a very important uh, part of radiopharmaceutical development, you know, the interaction between the clinician and the radiopharmacist. Unless you interact closely, it's difficult. So, a uh, long list of accomplishments which you can all read on the uh, slide. I will not take up any more time from the program. So, Dr. Rama, please. Thank you, sir, for nice introduction. So, I'll first like to confess that I joined endocrinology because I loved endocrinology and nuclear medicine is my second love. So, next to so uh, nuclear medicine has actually made my life very easy. I look after hardcore endocrinology where there are very rare diseases and it's very difficult to diagnose and manage those disorders. So I really needed help. Only ideas are mine. Rest of the work is by Jaya Ma'am and her students. So I'd like to start with the case, how difficult the cases are and how we are being helped by uh, nuclear medicine. So uh, this is for a uh, case, 13-year-old uh, male who had weight gain and poor height gain for three years, had Cushingoid stigmata. Most of us will, must be knowing what is Cushing disease. It's a, it's a state of hypercortisolism where patient gains height and in childhood, the height growth stops. Uh, child keeps on gaining weight and the height is very low below the third centile and weight is very high above the 95th centile. So this is classical description of Cushing disease in childhood. This patient was confirmed to have hypercortisolism which was ACTH dependent. We can see cortisol was high and ACTH was also high. So once we have documented that patient has hypercortisolism with elevated ACTH, then we make diagnosis of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. Now the question is whether it is arising from the pituitary, the master gland, or there is some ectopic source, which is usually a carcinoid, which can be anywhere outside uh, the pituitary. It can be bronchial carcinoid. It can be medullary thyroid carcinoma. It can be pheochromocytoma. So we need to differentiate these two. And the treatment, of course, as the site is different, the treatment is going to be different. So uh, this patient was being managed outside. The patient was only referred to us for functional imaging. So they did uh, MRI, which showed pituitary hyperplasia, which at this time of puberty is taken as normal. So uh, we have some dynamic hormonal tests, which we can do to differentiate ectopic from pituitary source. The patient was subjected to these all the tests, and some of the tests favored ectopic source, while some of the tests favored pituitary lesion. So again, we were nowhere. Patient was subjected to inferior petrosal sinus sampling, which is an invasive test where catheters are taken to inferior petrosal sinus and blood is taken out for uh, uh, how much is ACTH in the inferior petrosal sinus and which side. So this patient was subjected to that inferior petrosal sinus sampling also, and this procedure costs almost 80, 90,000 rupees at our center. Again, this test was inconclusive. So uh, this patient had MRI showing hyperplasia, HDVST was non-suppressible suggesting ectopic source, inferior petrosal sinus sampling was not useful, another test showed that it is pituitary in origin. So we were nowhere. So patient was subjected to dotanoc, which was again normal study. This dotanoc was done to look for ectopic carcinoid. So patient was labeled to have ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome, did not have localization of source of ACTH production, was put on ketoconazole, which is medical management and was referred to our institute for functional imaging. So here we patient was only referred for this PET CT. So MDESMO was done, which showed this is the Excel cut where we can see the lesion here. Uh, and uh, this is PET uh, CT image, which is confirming the lesion. This is again, we can see the lesion. And this is sagittal section. This patient was referred back to the institute uh, with a final diagnosis of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome, pituitary in origin, Cushing disease, we call it as short stature and obesity. 
patient underwent surgery at uh, the same institute and was shown to have pituitary adenoma and IHC was positive was ACTH. So it confirmed that the patient is having ACTH. This was the source of ACTH overproduction. This is the current status. Patient has grown 10.5 centimeters in last one year, has reduced weight and has entered puberty. So that means surgery is successful and it is only selective adenomectomy and rest of the pituitary is actually preserved because the child is growing well and has entered puberty as well. So where is the challenge? This was the first case where uh, Dr. Harvey Cushing described about hypercortisolism and he was also confused from where it is arising. So uh, this, this confusion persists till now. Etiology of Cushing syndrome, 90% are pituitary in origin and 10% are ectopic in origin. Because 90% are pituitary in origin, that's why MRI remains the first modality for diagnosing and detecting Cushing disease. But MRI has a sensitivity only 60%. So we are going to miss the lesion in 40% and the specificity is 85%. It is not 100% because some of the lesions seen on MRI may not be the culprit lesion as pituitary incidentiloma are found in 10 to 15 percent of the cases and even ectopic ACTH production also may be associated with pituitary incidentiloma in 10 percent of the cases further confusing us lesions seen on MRI uh, may not be seen on MRI and even if seen these may not be the culprit lesion so we need sportive tests that if, even if the tumor is seen and its size is 6 to 10 we need some sportive test and these are the sportive tests which we do. However, standalone, these non-invasive dynamic tests carry no value. However, in combination, these are useful. This is our paper on these tests, combination of these tests with various modalities. In summary, if all MRI and dynamic tests and CT chest and abdomen are concordant for a pituitary lesion, it is Cushing disease. If these are concordant for ectopic, then it is ectopic Cushing syndrome. In rest of the cases, we require inferior petrosal sinus sampling as per the protocol, which is an invasive test. It can differentiate pituitary from ectopic source in more than 90% of the cases. This is our paper on IPSS. However, when we need to differentiate whether it is arising from the right side or the left side, then the accuracy is only 60 to 70%. And if we do surgery based on IPSS, success rate is only 50%, which is equivalent to chance effect. So at our center, we do not subject any of the patient to surgery based on IPSS. It is invasive with potential complications and expensive. It is actually not made for corticotropinoma because those are usually central, centrally located tumor. So if even if according to guidelines, we do go for IPSS and say that it is central, but surgery can't be done based on that because it will just say that it is central. It might be on the right side or left side where again, we are not sure whether it is right or not. And surgical success is only 50%. So this is not the answer. So we needed something better. Endocrine malignancy has a very, uh, has a beauty that the receptors are upregulated on them. So feed forward X is upregulated. So therefore, in this uh, anterior pituitary, when there is a tumor, then CRH receptors are upregulated on corticotropinoma. We took advantage of that. So developed CRH PET CT with MRI fusion. So CRH was custom synthesized, conjugated with DOTA and radio labeled with gallium 68 and images are required on PET CT. We could get, uh, get it patented. This is our paper on uh, this modality. This is a case where MRI did not show, reveal a lesion while CRH PET CT is beautifully revealing a lesion uh, which uh, the patient was operated upon and histopathologically proven to have corticotropinoma. This is a case of ectopic Cushing syndrome where there was a bronchial carcinoid which is leading to Cushing syndrome and there is no uptake in the pituitary. Then um, when MRI and IPSS are discordant, then again CRH PET CT came to our help and the results were concordant with MRI and the patient was subjected to surgery and beautifully went into remission. This is a patient with uh, recurrent Cushing disease. Patient was operated upon, went into remission, and now came with relapse. And MRI showed just post-op changes. CRH PET CT localized the lesion, and the patient was re-operated upon and currently is in remission. This is a case of ectopic CRH production, which led to diffuse uh, hyperplasia in the pituitary and diffuse uptake. Although this patient had a lesion, a suspicious lesion in MRI, 
actually would have been operated upon but because there was diffuse uptake we went ahead and did dotanog pet ct which revealed bronchial carcinoid and the patient uh, underwent resection of this tumor and went into remission so but then we started getting referral from all over india to look for uh, these uh, uh, crs pet ct but because the patient when is on medical treatment it leads to up regulation of the surrounding cortical troughs so uh, there comes diffuse uptake on crs pet ct so we needed something better so again nuclear medicine came to our help and we uh, could develop m desmo pet ct and this is in the same patient who was on long term ketoconazole therapy which was showing, showing diffuse uptake and it is showing a focal uptake on m desmo pet ct so this vesopressin has permissive role in ACTH production and desmopressin is a synthetic analog of vesopressin it was modified to facilitate its binding with dota and uh, it was again conjugated with gallium 68 and with jmm we could also get it uh, uh, patented we have done 64 patients with this modality and the accuracy is almost uh, 95% while that of mri is only 76% and it is very useful if the adenoma size is less than 6 or if there is no lesion on mri so uh, this is a patient where mri was showing a suspicious lesion and it was confirmed on m desmo pet ct this was another interesting case where there was diffuse enlargement of the pituitary and stock involvement and there were bronchiectatic changes in the ct so it was a possibility that this is actually a fungal infection or it is some hypophysitis again uh, this m desmo pet ct showed diffuse uptake at that site even the stock so this patient again had corticotropinoma resected so there is no uptake of this tracer in normal pituitary no uptake in pituitary incident tiloma now we plan to do subtraction imaging and neuro navigation based on this pet ct these were the global reactions and people wanted to collaborate for this uh, these two modalities with us coming to another disorder hyperaldosteronism which is one of the most common cause of resistant hypertension that again the confusion is whether one adrenal is involved or both the adrenals are involved and then to differentiate these two we need here adrenal vein sampling so wherever endocrinologists are in trouble we go for vein sampling so this is cxcr4 uh, is a transmembrane g protein coupled receptor which is over expressed expressed in hyperaldosteronism so uh, this is we did around in 16 patients and this is lesion to contralateral adrenal uh, ratio which showed almost 100% sensitivity and specificity to differentiate unilateral adrenal adenoma from bilateral hyperplasia and it had a very good correlation with potassium because potassium becomes very low in hyperaldosteronism due to cons adenoma this is a patient where had ct showed a uh, ct showed an a lesion by, uh, and this cxcr4 imaging showed a bright uptake there confirming that this is the culprit lesion this is a case with bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and we can say see equal uptake on both the sides so this again uh, we are developing another modality etomidate being labeled with gallium 68 for differentiating uh, unilateral hyperaldosteronism from bilateral disease because cxcr4 is not very useful when the lesion size is less than 6 uh, less than 1 cm so we are uh, developing this molecule to further be 100% sure before operating the patient coming to adrenal cortical carcinoma this is one of the most difficult disease in endocrinology most of the disorders can be treated and managed well however this disorder which, which keeps on troubling us we have a database of around 40 patients with adrenocortical carcinoma and we have done these three scans in uh, these patients uh, fapi cxcr4 and iac fapi actually showed uptake in all the patients but we do not know uh, we all, and it also had uptake an, of an additional lesion as compared to ftg pet ct but we do not require a diagnostic modality for acc we required a diagnostic modality for cushing disease and hyperaldosteronism but here we needed therapeutic modality so this is a patient where uh, fap2286 has been used for treating uh, the patient and this is showing retention of the uh, agent even after 10 days of the therapy patient has clinically responded and further further uh, uh, imaging is awaited so localizing the source of acth production is a daunting task 
Gallium 68, CRH, and MDESMO PET CT represent a novel, non invasive, integrated, functional, and anatomical imaging in patients with ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. This is one of the most arithmetic disorders where we have been helped by nuclear medicine. Gallium pen, uh, 68 Pentixa 4 PET CT may be useful non invasively to differentiate ad, uh, aldosterone producing adenoma from idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia in patients with hyperaldosteronism with high sensitivity and specificity. These are the three molecules FAPI, IAC, and CXCR4 has, have diagnostic capabilities similar to FTG PET CT, but FAPI can be used with a diagnostic potential also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rama. That was very, very illustrative of some very new radiopharmaceuticals, especially in the region of the brain where FDG, as we all know, has its limitations. So if there's any one or two quick, direct, relevant questions specifically for this topic from anybody in the audience, please. Sir. Very nice presentation, ma'am. So besides surgery, I also teach research methodology and epidemiology, I think. So we teach that in diagnostic test evaluation, sensitivity and specificity do not go together. So it's inversely proportional. If sensitivity of a test is high, specificity would, would usually low and vice versa. So in your study, both were 100%. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Do not show the accuracy and sensitivity. Now these days, they say diagnostic or likelihood ratio for a positive test LR positive and likelihood ratio for a negative test. Yes. LR negative should also be calculated. Thank you. Um, you have no other questions. Thank you, Dr. Rama. Uh, now we'll, we'll move on to the second uh, speaker. And the second speaker, we have Dr. Madhavi Tripathi. She'll be talking on radio pharmaceuticals for neurological disorders. Dr. Madhavi Tripathi is synonymous with neuroimaging in nuclear medicine, so I don't think any of us, our people, need any introduction of Dr. Madhavi. So good I think you can start away. Thank actually. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Mittal and Jaya, for having me here. And we'll be going through the radio pharmaceuticals and neurological disorders. Now, the initial classification of radio pharmaceuticals for brain imaging was based on the principle of blood brain barrier. Now, this is basically a natural protective me mechanism which strictly regulates what enters the brain. And it is formed by the tight intercellular junctions which are formed by the endothelial cells in the brain capillaries. So while on one hand it protects the brains from toxins and pathogens, on the other hand it poses challenges for the development of pharmacotherapy and radiopharmaceuticals at large. So the tracers were initially classified as diffusible tracers which are typically lipophilic and readily cross the blood-brain barrier and non-diffusible tracers which are hydrophilic and polar and cannot cross the blood-brain barrier as such like pertechnetate and DDPA. But uh, since then we've moved along, a lot of radio pharmaceuticals have been developed and now I would say uh, the classification of these tracers would more aptly be radio pharmaceuticals for SPECT imaging and radio pharmaceuticals for positron emission tomographic imaging. Now further on they can be subgrouped on the basis of what aspect of the brain functional integrity we are evaluating or the pathology in the brain that we are going to be evaluating. So first of all coming to the SPECT radio pharmaceuticals. Now one of the most important group of pharmaceuticals and the ones which are most commonly being used are the perfusion spec tracers. And the two important tracers, of course, when we are talking of pharmaceuticals in India, the workhorse agent technetium 99M, that is what is the tracer which is readily available, the radionuclide readily available, and therefore the tracers would be more importantly technetium based. So we have technetium 99M ethyl cysteinate dimer and technetium 99M hexamethyl propylene amine oxide. The other agents would be the I-123 labeled, uh, labeled iodoamphetamines, which are presently not available in India. We are not being using them. The other uh, uh, tracers which can be used are, again, uh, the tracers used for dopaminergic imaging, that is the dopamine transporter imaging agents, which again, technetium-99M based would be the important ones, technetium-99M trodat 
and I-123 labeled IO flu pain. Now the third group uh, is not strictly a CNS tracer which actually evaluates myocardial sympathetic integrity but is included in this group of radio tracers because it can be used for evaluating CNS uh, uh, disorders like Parkinsonisms. So this would be I-123 MIBG and not so commonly used I-131 MIBG. Lastly would be the tumor imaging agents of which again technetium 99M glucoheptonic acid or GHA, the poor man's pet would be foremost. The other agents would be technetium 99M DTPA methionine and the non specific tumor imaging agents like thallium and technetium may be. Other CNS tracers which can also be used are for studies like evaluating CSF dynamics in cisternography for evaluating normal pressure hydrocephalus, CSF leaks and shunt patency, radionuclide cisternography studies where we primarily use technetium DTPA. But again, this is not a modality which is being used uh, so we would fall back again on the perfusion tracers. Now technetium HMPO and technetium 99MACD, you heard about HMPO in the first slide of today's uh, session, like the first session. And both these tracers are lipophilic tracers. They freely diffuse through the blood-brain barrier. The agent we are using and the agent most commonly the spec radiopharmaceutical for CNS imaging would be technetium 99M ECD. It is readily available to us from BRIT. It is economical and the most important property of having a shelf life of around six hours. Now these tracers are actually lipophilic. They cross the blood-brain barrier fo following which they undergo some form of trans uh, transformation. Like for ECD, it is an enzyme catalyzed hydrolysis of one of its ester groups to a carboxylic acid, which then becomes an anionic complex and does not cross the blood-brain barrier again. So it is retained within the brain parenchyma. The brain uptake is very rapid and amounts to around 5 to 6% of the injected dose with a gray to white matter ratio of 2 is to 1. Now this is primarily the complex. It's available as a kit-based uh, preparation. It's a transgelation reaction which is used to prepare technetium ECD. This is the complex which is there, very similar to HMPO. And the core structure is as this with a coordination number of five. Now technetium HMPO, one of its disadvantages is it is costly to us. The other is its shelf life of only 30 minutes. The cause for the instability of technetium HMPO has been attributed to its high pH after reconstitution, the presence of radiolytic intermediates such as hydroxy-free radicals and excessive stannocyanins. Now we can add a phosphate buffer which lowers the pH to around 6 and then the decomposition is minimal. Methylene blue can be add, added as a scavenger of free radicals and oxidizes excess stannocyanins. So a kit which is available with a stability of 4 hours is there in the market but it's costly to us and for practical terms the pharmaceutical which is maximally used for SPECT imaging in present day is technetium 99M ECD. The uh, critical organ for ECD would be the bladder wall which receives the maximum radiation dose so we have to remember to hydrate the patient and ask him to avoid. So the indications for brain perfusion spec would be in drug refractory epilepsy, it's pre-surgical evaluation and this next of the indications would be hand in hand indications with metabolism imaging. We have to remember in the brain, metabolism and perfusion are coupled. So wherever you are doing metabolism studies, you can also do the perfusion studies. But now with the availability, widespread availability of PET, we prefer PET imaging to SPECT imaging in neurocognitive disorders and the Parkinsonian plus syndromes. Coming back to regional cerebral perfusion, we are primarily using it for ictal spec studies. Now the beauty of these tracers is that they capture a snapshot of cerebral blood flow during the seizure. So it is the only modality which can show you the ictal onset zone in vivo. And that is because these tracers are irreversibly trapped in the epileptogenic hyperemic region at the time of seizure with very little redistribution thereafter. So patient can be stabilized, sent back to the nuclear medicine department for imaging. So, but for performing the ictal studies, the timing is very important. It has to be injected within 10 to 20 seconds of seizure onset. And therefore, they are primarily done in the epilepsy monitoring unit while the patient is undergoing his video EEG study. What we look at in ictal and ictal studies is the interictal hypoperfusion. Hypo so basically uh, to read the ictal study, we need the interictal study and that is why the interictal study is done. And a baseline interictal hypoperfusion becoming hyperperfused during the ictal study is what captures the ictal onset zone. 
and further on the uh, reading of these scans can be further improved using uh, voxel based statistical techniques and we can use ciscos and ciscom which clearly show voxels of significant hyperperfusion and here again ciscom showing you hyperperfusion in the left temporal lobe so this is how the ical uh, uh, perfusion agent like technetium ecd is helping us in the pre uh, surgical evaluation of drug refractory epilepsy to localize the ical onset zone Moving on to the dopaminergic Im imaging. Now, when we talk of dopaminergic imaging, we have technetium 99M trodat, which is a tropane derivative of and it binds to the dopamine transporter, hence the name of trodat. Radio labeling is performed. Either you can use a kit-based or in-house preparation. Radio labeling is by a transgelation method. And as Dr. Pillai already showed you, the two basal ganglia seen as comma-shaped structures in a normal patient with no evidence of presynaptic dopaminergic dysfunction, while in a patient with early Parkinson's disease, you fee, uh, see that the comma is now converted to a full stop and there is decreased putaminal uptake suggesting an early Parkinson's disease. Patient would be more symptomatic on the left side with a decrease in the right putamen. So the indications for dopaminergic imaging are in Parkinsonian syndromes primarily to distinguish neurodegenerative Parkinson's from the other forms of Parkinson's like drug-induced Parkinson's, psychogenic Parkinson's, vascular Parkinson's. And the other indication would be to different, di uh, for differential diagnosis from neurocognitive disorders, primarily differentiating DLB from AD. That's uh, one of the indications for dopaminergic imaging. Now, myocardial sympathetic integrity, as I told you, it basically eval the myocardial uptake reflects the density and functional integrity of postganglionic sympathetic neurons, which are lost in idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So to evaluate a patient of early Parkinson's, uh, you can actually use this sort of imaging. That is, here we don't have I-123 MIBG. We used I-131 MIBG. Here the doses, of course, we cannot give more than two millicurie of a dose. And imaging, you see the images are not a very good quality images, but normally where you find a myocardial uptake in a patient with IPD, you will find a no, or no uptake in the myocardium. And you can label it as, actually the neurologists are more interested in this, but we prefer the dopaminergic imaging to this because we don't have I-123 MIPG. Similarly, you can distinguish IPD from Parkinson Plus also because in Parkinson Plus, the myocardial uptake would be preserved, whereas in IPD, again, there would be a decrease in the myocardial uptake. Finally, tumor imaging with uh, technetium-based agents, technetium glucohyptonic acid, which is a poor man's pet. It is a yes or no imaging. So here you can see the uh, there is uptake uh, basically, the uh, we base the presence of viable tumor on the presence of uptake in the cerebral parenchyma. It's not seen anywhere else. Similarly, in this patient, where there was a doubtful recurrence in the right frontal lobe, you can see that technetium GHA clearly shows uptake in the right frontal lobe, while even the FDG was a little equivocal for viable tumor versus radiation necrosis. Indications for brain tumor imaging would be primarily, though uh, most importantly, to differentiate recurrence from radiation necrosis. And here again, we would also want the amino acid PET tracers, but technetium GHA is a good agent to fall back once you have a doubt whether there is recurrence versus radiation necrosis, and also to evaluate response to therapies like therapies with VEGF in inhibitors like Vivacizumab. Moving on to the PET radio ligands. Now, PET, we have a number of radio pharmaceuticals available and we have various systems which we evaluate. Most importantly, all of us know, again, the workhorse agent would be the F18 labeled fluorodeoxyglucose, which evaluates glucose metabolism. The other metabolism tracer would be carbon 11 alpha methyl tryptophan, which looks at the canurenin metabolism pathway. We can also do perfusion imaging using O15 water, which can look at cerebral blood flow. And we can actually do studies very similar to fMRI studies but the logistics in the production of O15 water is difficult and it's not being done in most of the centers in India. Amino acid tracers, we know that uh, brain tumor imaging, when we talk of brain tumor imaging, it's the amino acid tracers we prefer. The, we prefer the F18 labeled agents, F18 fluoroethyl tyrosine, but carbon 11 methionine is also an equally good tracer for those centers which have on-site cyclotrons. And we can also use F18 choline or carbon 11 choline and the uptake of these traces is based on the amino acid uptake mechanisms. The other important uh, system in the brain which can be evaluated using radio ligands is the neurotransmitter systems. Again, the new, amongst the neurotransmitters, the most commonly evaluated system is the dopaminergic system. And we can use, uh, this is just an, a schematic diagram of the targets on the presynaptic dopaminergic nerve terminal which can be used for imaging, which includes 
the dopa decarboxylase integrity evaluated using f18 fluorodopa dopamine transporters again evaluated using f18 fp cit they are all tropin derivatives and we can also image the vesicular monoamine transporter which stores the dopamine in the presynaptic terminal further on you can have targets on the postsynaptic membrane which are the d1 and d2 receptor imaging so apart from dopaminergic imaging you can also use serotonergic imaging and we have serotonin transporter imaging using a benzonitrile C11-DASP and you can evaluate HT1, 2 tra uh, transporters and a number of other neurotransmitter systems but mostly used for research purposes. The other important group of PET radio ligands were, would be those looking at pathology in vivo. And these would be the amyloid plaque targeting agents. Again, we look forward for F18 labeled agents being available in India. The oldest was the carbon 11 PIB, but we were, are looking forward to the F18 labeled agents. And this is a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So anywhere, any place we want to call a patient pre-mortem as Alzheimer's, we need amyloid imaging. The other target in um, uh, Alzheimer's is tau. And we've got a number of tracers available for that. F18 based would, uh, uh, they're mostly F18 based. We've got the second generation agents, which would, which would work better. We've used the first generation agents. And then we can also do activated microglia imaging using CPK 11195, PBR28 and PBR06. This uh, PET radio ligands would not be complete without mentioning the agents used for targeted therapy and theranostics. Again, these targets have been talked about. You can have the stromatostatin receptor agents, PSMA targeting agents, FAB targeting agents, imaging using the gallium-68 based tracers, and therapy using lutetium and actinium, and of course, lead-212. So broadly, I'll just uh, end uh, the indications in neurosciences are for cognitive impairment, Parkinson's, drug refractory epilepsy, brain tumors, and also autoimmune, paraneoplastic, and carcinoma unknown primary syndromes. We have a number of tracers. The most reliable tracer we fall back to is, of course, F18FDG. We also do, a lot of us are now doing dopaminergic imaging in routine clinical practice. The amino acid tracers are something which we would require if you're doing brain tumor imaging. And also for theranostics, we would require the more targeted therapies like PSMA therapy, SSRE, copper 64. And for autoimmune Again, this is one group of disorders which is coming up in a big way and we're getting at least one or two autoimmune epilepsy patients, autoimmune epilepsy, autoimmune encephalitis, where we're using the good old F fluorine 18 FTG. So uh, if you want, I can show you the images or this basically completes my uh, com the radio pharmaceuticals which we can use for CNS targeting. Huh? Hi. DHA goes to the brain, correct, uh, when blood is very system, but it goes to the cortical region of the kidney also. Is there any similarity between the in GHA will bind again in the when you go to the cortex, it will bind to those megalin tubulin receptors there. And here, you say, as you said, sir, it is based on the breakdown of the blood brain barrier. The exact binding mechanism in the brain is not known. But it, we believe it's something very similar to glucose. On the, on the other hand, when you do FTD, sometimes you, you are doing this in glioblastoma, then it is positive. But when you are doing astrocytoma 1, 2, uh, the FDG is negative. So FDG we know, sir, that in the... So that's because the FDG uptake is based on the grade and the uh, differentiation. So the low-grade tumors would not show the FDG uptake. And moreover, the gray matter uptake would be more than the uptake in the tumors. So that makes appreciation of the tumors difficult. Sir, can you, can... This also depends on the Warburg effect. Otto Henrik Warburg, a yeah. chemist in Germany in 1931, was awarded Nobel Prize for describing Warburg effect, which says that cancer cells, malignant cells, not benign, cancer cells depend exclusively for their energy substrate to glucose. So that's why FDG PET is positive for malignant cells, but not in benign neoplasms like fibroadenoma, like lipoma, etc. Right, right, right. Thank you. It's a Warburg effect, I yeah, think. Right, sir, right. Thank you. I think we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, 
the next speaker there's a slight change in the program because the speaker has to catch a flight so we'll be calling on dr sandeep basu right now uh i don't think dr sandeep basu needs any introduction to any audience in nuclear medicine um sir basu he'll be speaking on therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals for pediatric malignancies सर आपका है ना गुड आफ्टरनून इट इज ए प्लेजर एंड प्रिविलेज टू बी हियर एंड आई हैव ऑलवेज चेरिश्ड माई एसोसिएशन वेन एवर आई कम इन सम कैपेसिटी इन पी जी आई चंडीगढ़ बिकॉज आई कॉन्सिडर दिस इज वन ऑफ द टेम्पल ऑफ सम मेडिकल एकेडमिक मेडिकल इंस्टीट्यूट इन द कंट्री and uh, that's why i would like to thank dr jaya dr mittal and the entire organizing team to invite me to this excellent academic activity of icnm and pgi so in this session we will just have a look on uh, pediatric malignancies and theranostics so neuroblastoma and pediatric ppgl we will see a little bit on i131 mibg both conventional that we are using in the country and what about hsa mibg we will little bit see on the mabg that is alpha emitters meta astatobenzyl guanidine its radiochemistry and where we are in this country some work has been done uh, by the rphd group uh lutetium dotatate in pediatrics what is its present status and pediatric thyroid cancer and i131 a brief touch upon so if we see the neuroblastoma it occurs in childhood and its usual frequency is around 1 in 7000 uh, children the inrg standard risk classification uses age stage histological classification grade of tumor meek and ampli great way you know in oncology we know omics and transcriptomics mutations have come in a big way so for the younger generation it is very important to know this in parallel to molecular imaging so meek and amplification and chromosome 11q deletion very very important for the risk stratification and around 50% of the neuro so what we are talking in terms of neuroblastoma therapy with radionuclide is this high risk neuroblastoma group so if you see the most recent inrg classification i'll try to make it's a very complicated table but i'll just make it very easy so the red colored ones that i have put so meek and amplification at any level of stage qualifies the neuroblastoma to be high risk so if you see here so number 1 is when it is metastatic if i have to see from age a uh, age of more than 18 months important for risk high risk classification number 2 is in the grade if you have the poorly differentiated you have an in, from low to intermediate grade irrespective of the stage meek and classification and 11q aberration that everyone sees today in neuroblastoma in the histopathology that amplification will qualify to this high risk what is the importance of this high risk the overall 5 year efs with the best available treatment is less than 50% so with the respect of radionuclide therapy what we are going to see now is this high risk and probably the intermediate risk where your overall performance with the best of targeted and chemotherapy is not very high i'll go back to the previous uh, slide so what a high risk neuroblastoma is standard treated in the oncology medical regimen is with an induction phase then a local control if there is a possibility of surgery and radiotherapy then systemic remission consolidation and finally the maintenance therapy with either retinoic acid or anti gangliosidine antibodies in spite of this multimodal treatment the survival in high risk neuroblastoma is maximally 50% and that is where particularly in relapsed and refractory disease with this limited options our radionuclide therapy has to play a role and our newer agents have to show its uh, uh, typical potential so at present the trials with mibg that are going on with neuroblastoma is 
Veritas in France and major trials, which is in the combination regimen where it uses MIBG with a high risk cytotoxic therapy. And another is minivan therapy, which is uh, with MIBG, you give anti GD. This is another big agent for probably the RPHD scientist. I will tell you know, these gangliocyte receptors are very highly expressed in this high risk neuroblastoma. So that is another potential target probably radionuclide, radiopharmaceutical sciences should see upon because a good number of anti-gangliocyte agents have now co are coming in market and which is quite effective in high-risk neuroblastoma. So 85 to 90 percent now, what we already know, 85 to 90 percent of neuroblastomas are, are, does show express noradrenaline transporter and which is uh, a typical target for MIVG. With regard to pediatric PPGL, what is its uh, present role? 10 to 20 percent of PPGLs are in pediatric and frequent genetic preposition. If I have to see an adult PPGL and pediatric PPGL, the overall genetic predisposition is seen in 80 percent versus 50 percent. And if we see, there are three group of clusters. So cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. In this cluster one gene, VHL and we all know succinate dehydrogenase. So how is it? If you see this table, so you have this cluster one genes, and then cluster two is red and NF1, and then other the, uh, cluster three. Among this cluster one, succinate dehydrogenase has a higher metastatic, whereas this VHL-related re germline mutation is the most common for the pediatric PPGL. So this is what regards to the, its genetic. So pe pediatric PPGL has a 80% genetic predisposition. And with regard to, again, adult, they are mostly extra-adrenal or bilateral or recurrent and multifocal. So these are the typical features of pediatric PPGL. And they are usually, so we do, when we do plasma metanephrines, we do metanephrine and normetanephrine. Pediatric PPGL, particularly with regard to von Hippel lindeu are typically noradrenergic. So they secrete noradrenaline more. So these are the red colored ones are the differences between pediatric PPGL versus adult PPGL. And with regard to the symptoms, unlike episodic hypertension, that is what is seen in pheochromocytoma, pediatric PPGLs come with sustained hypertension, and 90% of them are usually symptomatic. So with regard to theranostics in PPGL, how do we do? If you see the 2019 ANM classification does it quite well between what will be our first choice agents what will be our second choice and what will be our next. So FIO and inherited FIO, all, FDOPA is the first. So FDOPA is the first agent and second is gallium uh, dotated. So uh, we, except for succinate dehydrogenase. As we discussed, succinate dehydrogenase, when you have that mutation, they are usually aggressive and succinate dehydrogenase in succinate dehydrogenase mutation, usually FDG comes into the picture. So pheochromocytoma, all pediatric pheochromocytoma, FDOPA is the first, and with regard to the theranostics, next comes DOTA and MIBG. If there is a succinate dehydrogenase mutation, then FDG comes second and gallium DOTA comes as the first. Whereas rest of the head neck paraganglioma and other extra adrenal paraganglioma, gallium DOTA is the uh, most important. So this is quite important for the students again. So when you are doing a, uh, a kind of an imaging, so imaging wise, all the extra adrenal paragangliomas, head neck paragangliomas, gallium dota is the one. How much is the difference? It is around 90% with gallium dota versus FDOPA is around 80%. So roughly around, they tell 15% difference with regard to the sensitivity. So we are primarily talking on theranostics. So our usual first agent is gallium dota and then MIBG in this group of patients. So with regard to MIBG, we know all this. So pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, and neuroblastoma are the usual indications, indicators. And what is then MIBG's typical chemistry? A bit on, so it is a, it is a uh, guanethidine analog, which is, which is a combination of benzyl group of bretillium and guanidine group of guanethidine. So you see, this is the guanidine group is this, which Typical formula is NHC, NH22. So this is your guanidine, 
and this is in your benzyl group of betylium. So this is the functional group, ortho, meta, para. So meta position, if, if your iodine is attached, that is MIBG. And typically MIBG is taken up because of this noradrenaline transporter, which is solute carrier family six and member two gene encoded. And the typical uptake first is by uptake one, which is active uptake, which is specific, which is saturable and ATP dependent, and which is 50 times more efficient than your passive uptake. So there are two mechanisms of MIBG uptake. First is active uptake one, which is specific, which is high affinity, which is saturable, and which is 50 times more efficient than the other, which is not actually uptake two, which is a passive uptake. And this is ATPS dependent. And there is a clear cut difference between neuroblastoma and PGL. Because in neuroblastoma, the neurosecretory granules within the cells, as is seen in PHEO and paraganglioma, is almost minimal. So in neuroblastoma, it primarily stays in cytoplasm, whereas in pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, it is within the vesicles. And how does it go into the vesicles? There is a thing called vesicle monoamine transporter. So within the cell, there is VMAT1 and VMAT2 with which it goes. So again, in neuroblastoma, localization of localization of internalized MIBG is mostly in the cytoplasm and with because of the lower amount of neurosecretory granules. And again, one thing is this uptake one, as we have talked about, is by norepinephrine transporter. There are also dopamine transporter, which Madhavi was talking about, DAT receptor, which is a dopamine transporter. And these are all solute carrier six family and then serotonin transporter. One thing of MIBG therapy is always we see that there is a selective platelet decrease. So in tumors, the uptake is norepinephrine transporter dependent, whereas in platelet, there is a thing called this serotonin transport. So why serotonin? Because this is also an uptake one serotonin transporter. So in MIBG therapy, when we talk about, we always are, we always have read that there is a selective platelet decrease, and that has been told to be because of the serotonin transport system. Why is it important? Today, when you are talking about dose escalation, there, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are being increasingly tried, like citalopram fluvoxamine, which are actually a neurological drugs to be primed so as to reduce this platelet uptake when you are particularly thinking of higher dose of MIBG in uh, these malignancies. A uh, bit on uh, high specific activity MIBG. What is high specific activity? In the conventional MIBG, 99% of, so one in 2000 molecules of MIBG only is iodine. It is uh, labeled with iodine. So what we are using presently, the conventional MIBG, more than 99% of the MIBG molecules are actually not radio labeled. And in fact, this cold MIBG is the reason for the pharmacological effects that you sometimes see when you run the drip very fast. So this has come, as you have heard, that is Alta Trace or Azedra in foreign in, and is being experimented in a big way is this non-carrier added MIBG. And what is its importance? Because there is no, this cold MIBG otherwise will compete with the tumor uptake because that uptake one is competitive and it is saturable. So that's why this high specific activity MIBG, how is it done? It is usually done by electrophilic radioiodination, whereas this nucleophilic, nucleophilic means iodine minus, nucleus loving. So this one will be nucleophilic radioiodination with which BRC produces the MIBG, whereas this electrophilic is for high specific MIBG uh, uh, iodination. So, uh, I'm not going into too much details into the chemistry. This electrophilic high specific activity MIBG is typically done with trimethyl silicon precursor or tributyline precursor. These are the typical uh, structure which is replaced with I plus ion in high specific activity MIBG. MABG. So I was just yesterday when I was coming with uh, Rubel and I just wanted to uh, give you this information that uh, this this agent, which is uh, which is usually prepared with bismuth uh, 209 with alpha 2n reaction, this typically requires around 30 MeV cyclotron. And the problem with 
astatine is its half life astatine's half life is 7.2 hours unlike other alpha so you they tell that if you have to prepare mabg it has to be the place of supply has to be within 3 hours distance to be to be able to uh, treat the patient so this mabg has come so astatine has to uh, the advantage of it it has a very good gamma because of its uh, 58% of it is electron capture and there is a polonium x-ray 77 to 92 kV. So you can do dosimetry with MIBG. We have to see there are world over, I think there are three or four trials that are going with this meta astatobenzyl guanidine in, in pheochromocytoma and in neuroblastoma. With regard to lutetium dotate, only one thing to add is here, there are pediatric trials are much limited, but pedi in pediatric, ludo N trial is going on in Nordic society, whose result is supposed to be finalized by three to five years. One thing for the students in pediatric, how much to give? See, I always used to think how much to give this amino acid. Now I see the dose that is mentioned for the amino acid during lutetium dotated in pediatric patient is 20 ml per kg. So important is when we are practicing for pediatric, this should be the dose, which equates to one liter in a 50 kg child. Lutetium, I don't need to tell, but BRC is producing through direct route. We have heard already from the, uh, yeah, fr uh, from the uh, uh, pre previous speakers, we need to prepare again for what are the advantages for indirect route and what are the advantages and disadvantages with direct route. Uh, Carcinoma thyroid, not going in details, but just to tell that there are the more cervical adenopathy in seen in pediatric. Distant metastasis is 15 to 23% vis-a-vis -vis the 2 to 9% in adults. The thyroid, they have a greater risk of malignancy of 22 to 26% vis-a-vis 5 to 10% in adults. Papillary thyroid cancer usually is the 90% of the cases. They have more extrathyroidal extension, more lymph node metastasis, more pulmonary metastasis. The good point of, so all these red colored are the high risk things, but the good point is its outcome. Unlike adult, they have much less disease specific mortality, which is 2% vis-a-vis 8 to 15% in adults, more favorable progression free survival. And this is primarily probably because if it's rate mutation rearrangement, so pediatric thyroid cancer has more rate PTC compared to adult, which is more BRAF mutated. So that's why it is told that despite all these, it is pre frequently detected at a large, much you know, uh, advanced stages, or they have a more propensity for uh, metastasis. They usually have this rate PTC mutations, and they are showing a good. Uh, Again, for uh, just for the knowledge of the students, I have kept this. At present, just remember there are two ways of iodine preparation. One is by this tellurium irradiation, and we have already read uranium fission. India does not produce by fission. As I understand, Apsara is one reactor where they are planning to do fission reaction. But at present, all iodine today is produced at Thruba reactor. And that is where, and it is usually separated at Cyrus reactor at seven for after dry distillation and 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 this neutron uranium fission reaction can come once this apsara u reactor is functioning so with this thank you again for your patient hearing so we just saw the neuroblastoma pediatric ppgl we saw a bit on radiochemistry of mibg mabg dotate uptake of tumors pediatric thyroid cancer i-130 on production routes and indian scenario thank you Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vasu. Detailed uh, talk on something which we don't see very often. Uh, radiation Medicine Center is privileged that you get a bulk of patients, you have the facilities, and you are providing excellent services. I believe it is more or less free of cost for most of the patients, uh, mm, apart from true. some nominal uh, expenses. So um, I think no questions. Thank you, Thank Sandeep. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent talk. There's a change again in the speaker sequence. Uh, we have Dr. Parul. Dr. Parul. She'll be talking on the area of uh, challenges and solutions in lead as a compound. 
मैंने कॉपी कर रखी है आपकी स्लाइड मैं आप इसमें से डायरेक्ट बोल दीजिए है ना मैम सेशन आपका था सेवन्थ में इंडिया डॉक्टर है ना आप इसमें से बोल दीजिए है ना सही Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, the organizers, to invite me to the present this talk here. Uh, and I'm really sorry for the changes. I have, I have a flight at seven uh, at this day here. Uh, so I'll be speaking today on the LED 203 and 212, the challenges and the solutions. So basically, I will be just uh, showing our experience, which we had at, at our department at nuclear medicine at Fortis Gurgaon. Uh, so just to start with, uh, the targeted alpha therapy, as we all know, is in, in which an alpha emitting particle emitting radionuclide is specifically directed to a biological target and is gaining more attention to treat cancers as new targets. And the alpha particle is a naked helium nucleus with a plus two charge, relatively large compared to the beta particle. Its extreme mass suppresses the deflection of the particle and has an initial kinetic energy of a five to nine MeV with a very small particle range of 50 to 100 micrometer and a high linear energy transfer of 100 kilo electron volt per micrometer. So other alpha emitting isotopes which we are for the therapeutic applications which are being used in the nuclear medicine are astatine as we have been listening, astatine 211 which has a half-life of 7.2 hours and which has an alpha as well as a gamma emission and bismuth 213 with a very short half-life of 46 minutes but it has a beta, gamma and an alpha emission and radium 223 with a half-life of 11.4 days. Then comes the actinium 225 which a reasonable half-life of 10 days and a very high uh, alpha energy of 5 to 9 MeV and also a gamma emission of 218 KV. And now the, come the newer version that is the LED 212 with a half-life of 10.6 hours and uh, which has a gamma as well as the beta and an alpha emission. So among these alpha particles possible uh, emitters possible to use in nuclear medicine, considerable interest is growing in LED 212 for targeted alpha therapy. So if we talk about LED-212, uh, it belongs to a radioactive series of a long-lived parent, that is the thorium-228, and it itself is a beta emitter, but it is a parent of a alpha-emitting radionuclide, that is bismuth-212. And in the decay scheme, it emits two alpha-3 beta particles and a gamma rays, and finally decays to a stable LED-208. Also, it includes the emission of a gamma ray with an energy of 238 kV that has the potential to enable the direct imaging with spect of LED-212 labeled peptides. Uh, the promising characteristics for late 212 are like it is the parent radionuclide the parent radionuclide for the therapeutic uh, to bismuth 212 is late 212 it serves as an in vivo generator of bismuth 212 causes and combined release of both alpha and beta particles now one challenge associated with the performing the preclinical experiments with late 212 is the execution of the accurate biodistribution and targeting assays of late 212 radiopharmaceuticals so here comes the late 203, which is the diagnostic part partner, and so they both form late 212 along with the late 203 form an equal element equivalent match theranostic pair. So the pharmacokinetic data which is needed to estimate the dosimetry of late 212 labeled radiopharmaceuticals can be acquired by using the late 203, uh, uh, late 203, which decays by the emission of 279 keV gamma rays with an 80% of abundance. Also, the non-invasive LED-212 enables a non-invasive LED-203 SPECT image to be collected in advance of the LED-212 receptor directed radiotherapy with a minimal risk of adverse event. So now there may be a question when the alpha emitter itself is bismuth 212, why are we using lead 212 for the clinical practice? So to answer to this is that the lead 212 is uh, as an in vivo generator of uh, bismuth 212 is used to effectively overcome the problem of the short half-life of bismuth 212, which has a very short half-life of about 60 minutes. Also, the distinct advantage of targeting tumor with lead 212 over the bismuth 212 is that it can deliver more than 10 times the administration activity of bismuth 212 and also it traverses a time constraint constraint which makes use of lead 212 easier for dose preparation and administration for the targeted alpha therapy 
Now, talking about the generator systems, the earlier generators which were used were the thorium-228 base. However, the experienced radiolytic damage to the support resin, constituent diminished yield, serious radiation safety problems, and difficulty providing practical quantities of lead-212. So, the recently, the, the generators which are being used are the, the radium-224 base, which have facilitated an on-site production of bismuth-212 or lead-212, and they have been found suitable for radio labeling the monoclonal antibodies, peptides, or any other vectors. And also, it has been possible to have the practical quantities of lead-212. All now to talk about uh, lead-203, it is a cyclotron produced, which decays with a half-life of 52 hours, and is followed by the emission of the gamma ray photons with about screw cement, which is the major uh, component, is 81% of 279 keV, and goes to the stable state, uh, uh, goes to the ground state to the stable thallium-203, and it is compatible for the single photon emission. And, by, and the advantage is that unlike some other radionuclides of the lead, lead-203 has no daughter radiation which simplifies the dosimetric calculations. So now whenever there is an introduction of any newer radiopharmaceutical or a radionuclide, we have several challenges like how to apply for the NOC, how to procure, where to procure these radioisotopes, what are the governing rules, regulations and the guidelines regarding the hotline, uh, what are the hot lab requirements, what is the staff requirement, what will be the guidelines for the radiation protection and the guidelines for the storage and the waste disposal. So I'll be discussing few of them here uh, as what we have faced in working with uh, this theranostic pair at fMRI. So, uh, for talking about the NOC, we all know that we have to apply in the ELORA and uh, select the particular radionuclide and then the radiopharmaceutical form and then the frequency. But with the, freq uh, but with the alpha emitters, if you go to the ELORA side, there is no provision of uh, uh, provision of directly selecting these alpha emitters, be, be it uh, the actinium-225 or bismuth-213 or lead-203 and 212. So, you need to apply through the form A uh, as we had done when we had started started working with the actinium-225 and 213 in 2017, and finally you get the, uh, uh, the NOC from the AERB. So similarly, we applied this for the lead-203 and 212. So when the, we had applied, the AERB asked us to, to provide the standard of protocols or the SOPs for the what will be the, uh, how will you elude the generator, what will be the administration guidelines, what will be the post-administration -preca precautions and uh, the discharge criteria and also finally the disposal of the radioactive waste. So we prepared all these SOPs and then submitted it to the AERB and finally we got the NOC. So uh, now coming to the procurement, uh, we know that we have uh, the BRIT or we can import it from the foreign vendors. Now, till date, we do can't, uh, we don't have any uh, we do provision of getting lead 203 or 212 from the Indian uh, Brit, uh, so we have to import it from the foreign vendor. And uh, coming to the lab requirements, yes, we need a biosafety cabinet. Uh, for to maintain a sterile and aperogenicity, dose calibrator to measure the radioactivity, dry heaters, and also the quality control procedures, be it be radio TLC, HPLC, endotoxin reader, incubator, and everything. And since uh, this lead to like lead 203 is available as a unit dose, but the lead 212 is eluted a radium generator. So we need, and since it's a very potent radionuclide, we, the experiments must be conducted in a lead-shielded environment that is sufficient to reduce the potential exposure of the gamma ray, which is uh, uh, gamma radiation emitting via the decay of thallium-208, which is about 2.6 MeV. So as you can see that all the, uh, uh, the uh, experiments in a fume hood and which is lead shielded and the other mandatory requirements comes is the HEPA filtered fume hoods to mitigate the risk of inhalation of exposure of radon 220 which is, which is uh, emitted in the decay scheme of the lead 212. And so the generator uh, also as you can see the charcoal filter is applied uh, so as to prevent the escape of radon 220 into the environment. And the generator can be built periodically and uh, like about 20, at 24 hours to obtain lead 212. 
Uh, however, the uh, labeling of LED 212 or 203 is uh, quite exhaustive. Uh, the LED 21, uh, the extra step with LED 212 is the illusion from the generator. However, uh, the finally, the both LED 203 and 212 are concentrated and purified using a LED resin. This LED resin, resin separates the LED uh, 203 and 212 from the distorted radionuclides, and then the purified LED is finally used, uh, is heated with the buffer and the ligand and to, uh, for the synthesis of the radiopharmaceutical. Finally, and then it is purified by the uh, uh, from the C18 cartridge uh, just to remove any impurities and finally it is administered to the quality control procedures. Now the next question uh, whenever a new radionuclide is introduced is that how to measure that particular radionuclide because that current you, uh, those calibrator settings may not be calibrated for that particular radionuclide. So uh, obviously we also did face the same challenge and so we need to uh, find out the cali uh, the calibration factor for which uh, the, radio uh, the dose calibrator can be calibrated by using the different calibration factors and then finding out the uh, the activity from the estimated amount of activity and the uh, the calibration factor which showed the minimum amount of error was used and so finally we could say that uh, for lead 203 for the Capentech CRC 225R the calibration factor which was used was 340 and it was 690 for lead 212. However the measurement of lead 203 was quite straightforward it was not the same with lead 212 because uh, for lead 212 first we have to measure the amount of estimated lead 212 which is uh, can be eluded from the uh, generator on the basis of the amount of radium 224 which has been loaded on the generator as you can see from the uh, chart one and then after the uh, the lead has been eluted and purified from the lead resin and the time has to be noted and the time traversed from the uh, time when it has been uh, separated from the lead, uh, eluted from the lead resin to the time when the final product has been ready. Uh, you have to measure that, uh, note, note that in that time and on the basis of then you have to find out the calibration factor depending on the time which has been elapsed. So it takes around three hours for the lead 212 to attain equilibrium and on if and uh, the, so it is advised to about, wait about two hours after the synthesis, after the product is ready so as the uh, lead attains the equilibrium, lead 212 attains the equilibrium and you have the amount of activity which can be uh, exact amount of activity which can be administered to the patient. So uh, here, yes, we need a skill scarf. There is a requirement of a radio feminist, which will be doing the labeling, the uh, procedures, the QC procedures, and the troubleshooting as and when required. And the, uh, will, as it's a very potent radionuclide and used for Heidemann administrations, the quality control procedures were done, will uh, should be done, like be it the visual experience, the pH testing, the radiochemical purity, the endotoxin uh, level testing, or the sterility test. Now, as we know uh, that the uh, till date, it was like RSO2 level was uh, required for any facility or a nuclear medicine facility. But now the uh, RSO level two has to be updated uh, to be uh, to radiation RSO level three for the nuclear medicine facility to function as an RSO for the high dose therapy facility. And now it has become a mandatory requirement. So for which he has to undergo a three weeks training program uh, with at least 10 patients of iodine 131 and at least one other radionuclide and then a certificate is issued which is then uh, uploaded on Elora. So now uh, the any any, pers any RSO to work in the new uh, high dose with therapy facility has to be updated to the RSO level 3. Coming to the radiation protection, yes, uh, since the uh, very potent radionuclide, so the ALARA principles, the cardinal principles of radiation safety, time, distance, and shielding was used. As you can see, long tubes and all the uh, procedures were done in the, uh, the uh, biosafety cabinet, in the lead shielded biosafety cabinet, and long tubes and stocks was used just as to prevent any manipulation with the, uh, uh, with the hands, directly with the hands to prevent any uh, exposure to the extremities. Now, uh, also the acquisition protocols needs to be set with the uh, 
uh, newer radionuclide. So uh, with lead 203, it was quite easy because it's a single energy window and a diagnostic agent. So we used about 279 kV with a 20% window and a medium energy collimator at a scan speed of 88 centimeters per minute. And also did the spec CT images and got a very beautiful images as can you can see where the whole body images were acquired at 2 hours and 48 hours and also the uh, spec CT was acquired with lead 203. Uh, but uh, with the uh, lead 212, the, it, it was not an easy task as uh, because as we know that the imaging with the alpha emitters is quite uh, difficult and so we need to we had to slog a lot and we finally found that the dual energy window because it also releases a 79 kV of an X-ray. So by using a 40% window at 79 kV and then 20% window at 239 kV, we were uh, and a very uh, speed a uh, very slow speed of about six centimeters per minute. We were uh, uh, we we could get a reasonable uh, images with lead 212 as you can see uh, where there is a uh, comparison from the baseline dota knock scan which was done and we can see the uh, images here and this image has been selected uh, accepted for as an interesting image in CNM in February 2024. So uh, this was uh, uh, happened after a lot of uh, hard work. And then uh, also the personal monitoring becomes important because uh, with the neo radionuclides, as we don't have any, any data on that, on the personal monitoring, so we measured the doses to the extremities and the whole body by using the while using 203 and 212 by using a, a, a pocket dosimeter. And we could find that it was a, on a higher side with about 80 to 100 microsieverts per procedure for lead 203 and uh, about 100 to 120 microsieverts per procedure for lead 212. Uh, this included the labeling, the manipulation of activity and the measurement and the administration and finally the scanning. Also, uh, since we didn't have any data on the discharge guidelines, uh, discharge criteria, we measured the, uh, the dose rates at about one meter from the patient's post-administration, and we could find that it was less than five mR per, uh, per hour, uh, even after immediately after injecting. So we could suggest that the uh, the, uh, the therapy can be done on an outpatient basis. However, we keep the patient for six hours under observation post therapy. Uh, coming to the storage and the waste disposal, uh, we followed the uh, thumb rule of delay and decay for 10 half-lives and uh, no delay tag was used for the liquid to the waste disposal. And uh, finally, the uh, what is to be done the, with the generator? Yes, it has to be sent back to the vendor and uh, it has to be transported back to the as an uh, unregistered stored and applied through the LORA. So the take home messages are that whenever we have a newer radionuclide, we need to have a guidance by the regulatory agency. We have to sort the availability of radiopharmaceuticals, have clear protocols for radiation protection, shielding, storage, waste disposal, and release criteria. And we should have training and education to the users. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Parul. You have discussed uh, very rightly and uh, all the challenges you faced and uh, led the uh, Theranostic pair combination practice in clinical medicine, you nicely overcome the challenges and come out with the solutions also. I think it's a very nice talk, nice Thank presentation. You, Can any questions are there, anyone? Anybody? Hello. You are doing the QC part with that uh, TLC and uh, HPLC, no? You said. No, so what? TLC. We have TLC. TLC. So which detector you are using basically for that? Actually, we tied with the. We have a zinc sulfide for the alpha emitter, but we found that the peak was better with the plastic, uh, plastic detector. Okay. So we had tried both the. We, because it's a learning phase for all of us, so we tried different detectors. We tried different solid and the uh, liquid phases, and so we found that the best image was with the uh, plastic detector using the Wattman paper. And uh, HPLC has never been done. Okay, HPLC. Dr. Parul, it was a nice talk. May I know how much you get exposure during one synthesis of? Uh, with lead 212, it is around 100 to 120 microsieverts. Okay. Microsieverts, when I am putting the uh, this pocket dosimeter at my hands. Okay. At the chest level, it is less. It's around 7 to 10 microsieverts. Okay, and what is the cost of uh, lead generator? It's, it's, under, uh, it's been provided. It's out, uh, free of cost. Okay, that's great. 
and how much you are charging from the patient we are not charging oh that's good <laughs> so so you can you can send the patient anybody can send the <laughs> patient send the patient <laughs> i think we have one more question the last question dhananjay singh so you mujhe bol kuch question nahi hai main puchta hu acha me bol we have a medium energy generator maybe have a medium energy collector so we have tried like for led 212 212 but no no we had tried that ha uh, with the low energy collimator we didn't get good images we tried a lot we used 20% window we used for 30% window 40% window with 40% window we get the best images by however it's it's unlikely to think that 79 kv will work better with the medium energy collimator but it is working better with the medium energy collimator with the uh, with the uh, 40% window because we have increased the width so there is no septal penetration as such because we have widened the window that is why we are getting the good images with the 20% window we are not getting good image low energy collimator and also the high energy collimator no a uh, single window se nahi aata hai <laughs> we have tried all it was very difficult to have image with led 212 so we tried many permutations and combinations and finally this was the best permutation <laughs> parol in one solution how much millicuri you can get so we have the generator is of 10 millicuri uh, which is which is estimated so we get around uh, not 10 exactly uh, like 33 34 millicuri is of radium is loaded at the source so by the time it reaches us after 3 to 4 days on the first day we get around 10 to 11 millicuri of lead to one to अच्छा ये मुझे बताओ आपकी फ्लाइट सच्ची में है या झूठ बोल रहे हैं नहीं सच्ची में क्योंकि आपने 10 मिनट ज्यादा लिए हैं ऐसा यू आर अलॉटेड टाइम मैं अभी टिकट भी टिकट भी डिस्प्ले कर देती हूं आपका टाइम आपने लिया आई थिंक विल क्लोज द सेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू सो थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीवन थैंक यू टू ऑल स्पीकर्स एंड फॉर कवरिंग एडवांसमेंट्स इन रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल्स फॉर वेरियस मेडिकल कंडीशंस Uh, including endocrine neuro uh, neurological and pediatric malignancies as well as addressing addressing challenges and solutions to led 203 and and led 212 now i request dr anurag shrivastav for uh, to present the memento to the chair persons and the speakers abhi break le raha hu sahi hai koi baat nahi sunna sandeep sir ko bahut jaldi pad rahi hai na सेवन में अरे सेवन मैंने पूरा प्रूव नहीं करा है सेवन तांजली और रोड़ा इसी में सेवन सेवन नहीं सेवन नहीं है सिक्स है नहीं मैम डॉक्टर पार मैम डॉक्टर पार पूरा ही अपलोड कर देता हूँ वहां कंट्रोल सी Let's pause for a short break of 10 minutes to enjoy a cup of tea.
break and replenish their energy. Now, coming to our next session, focusing on radio pharmaceutical in therapy and intervention, exploring their use in medical treatment and procedures overseen by session chairs Dr. Ashwini Sood, Professor at PGI MER and Dr. Harpreet Singh, Assistant Professor at PGI MER and Dr. Professor Dhanpati Halnayak from Zipmer. Over to the chairpersons. Zipmer. Zip. 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 Zip.
and uh, initially when uh, it came as in the market it was fapi 2 then fapi 4 came then fapi 46 now then now squaremide uh, fapi and the sa dimer uh, fapi the effective dose to the patient is close to the uh, its uh, sister compound like fdg and dotatet so coming to the main topic which uh, was assigned to me was the applications of the FAPI. So in oncological application, many tumors have been um, researched whether this FAPI can help more than FDG or the existing traces. The opportunity is basically it is active, expressed in the active, uh, activated fibroblast but not in the quiescent fibroblast. And this is the target for diagnosis and treatment. High FAPI uptake can be seen in the breast cancer, pancreatic, gastric cancer, colon, and head and neck carcinoma as I said, the comp it has main role as a complementary tracer for tumors known to per poorly perform the, the FDG. And the best thing is uh, to add this molecule for the therapeutic uh, intervention in the these cancers. The good advantages of the FAPI over the FDG is no dietary restrictions are required. There is no fasting. Even the blood sugar is high. We, you, you don't have to cancel the patient. There is no activity in three areas like brain, heart, and colon. And we can see this area very clearly in the oncological and non-oncological applications. Coming to the first indications, uh, I would uh, start with the breast cancer. So this is one of the recent uh, review of literature. We showed that uh, FDG PET, sorry, FAPI PET CT is good diagnostic tool in almost all cancer subtype with all molecular breast cancer subtypes. However, uh, we know that FDG still uh, is a very good tracer in, and we know the metabolic signature of the FDG. In my practice, I usually uh, insist on two things only, pretest probability and the metabolic signature, which probably I would say the FAPI is lacking. I will show some images. Uh, so metabolic signature is how you see the intensity of the uptake in the tumor and the nodes and metastasis rather than the inflammatory sites. So this is uh, one of the very nice review where they said the high sensitivity, but these... Uh, Specificity is uh, close to the FDG. And uh, the, also the another study by Elboga, they showed that it is more in the lesions are seen in the breast, lymph nodes, and bone. These were the initial studies where the biopsy was not confirmed. And probably the, uh, as the, when we know, the, when the initially FDG came, everything, I remember Dr. Anis used to go to the gynec, uh, this tumor board, and they used to say us, why the cervix cancer, the papers are citing 96% sensitivity specificity and your reports are coming wrong. So it happened initial, during initial days. And now we learn where to say these are inflammatory. So probably this was the initial reports and uh, there were no biopsy confirmation in most of the sites due to ethical issues. But these are the study uh, till now in the breast cancer and this have shown very good sensitivity. But this is the very important study I would say because in lobular breast cancer we are not good. So, till now, the FDG is not good in the metastatic lobular breast cancer because of the low expression of FDG. But this study in CNM, published in CNM, they did in just seven women, where they found out they did the FDG, both FDG and FAPI, in the metastatic lobular breast cancer. And they found it really worked well in the uh, metas, uh, lobular variant. We, we can see the image. The first one is the FDG, and the second one is the FAPI. And we can see some additional lesion which are looking very metastatic and have been identified. And it changed the management and definitely could be a potential uh, theranostic agent. We have a couple of examples. This was one of the patients, 37 years uh, female, which has obviously IDC variant, not lobular. So we can see intense uptake in the breast there is uptake in the metastatic uh, bones and also the vertebra, sorry. But now the problem is, like the uh, Sri Thana Choy, we can see the uptake is there in the opposite breast. Now we could see from the our mammography report, this was Byrates 2 and this was a fibroadenoma, but still the uptake is well above the background and could be easily confused with the metastatic or second primary of the opposite breast. There is invariable uptake in the nipple bilaterally in most of the cases. This is one another case. This case was did for the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and we can see diffuse increase uptake in the breast carcinoma. So you never know when the uptake will go to the breast. So this patient was actually during the ovulation, this scan was done. So we can see physiological intense uptake in the breast. This is another case from literature. This was from the the vertebral hemangioma, so what is the strength of FDG? Basically, we identify the liver meds, we identify the... So, sensitivity is probably not needed. Actually, we are doing contrast CT. 
already most of the lesions we are seeing why we were good it was our specificity to say it is cancer so this uh, tracer has high sensitivity but it is has lower sense specificity but as of now but probably with time we will learn and uh, this case uh, uh, we can uh, see that this is definitely a vertebral hemangioma which is showing very intense uptake and can be easily confused with mets even my colleagues have reported mets several times and we just sat together and we discussed these are uh, not this case but i will show uh, some cases how uh, wrongly we have reported those things this case actually i would say so this was a patient came to us um, probably one year back with a breast conservative surgery we can see the fdg pet city there is no uptake somehow the we don't know one year after they sent us again and now we have happy so my colleague decided to do the happy for this scan and also uh, we prefer nowadays happy so to learn what is happy so we the the tumor marker was slightly raised from the last scan we can see there is intense uptake i have not increased the intensity this is there is intense uptake in the thickened uh, skin and the breast parenchyma now if we go to the ct it's almost same breast parenchyma there is no change and there is intense uptake so uh, we decided to give this as uh, normal inflammatory uptake and we uh, did the ultrasound of this patient and it was Uh, the radiologist said that it was not uh, uh, not to concern so we it is very uh, now uh, essential to learn the pitfalls of the fapi like we learn for the fdg and again i would say this this metabolic signature is not there the metabolic signature is very essential and it was there in the fdg so we could say that this is uh, uptake is uh, pathological this was physiological this was inflammatory that is not there even the intense uptake are coming in the tv uh, the inflammatory uptakes are there so gastric carcinoma there is a good study which has had to had comparison of the fapi and fdg and they showed there are two things which we we are, are not good in the gastric carcinoma particularly in the signaling cell carcinoma so they showed it is uh, doing um, uh, good than the fdg both in the primary and the peritoneal carcinomatosis this one of the patient we did where we can see uh, we don't have the fdg image of this patient so that is intense image uptake in the uh, uh, pylorus which is seen so in the thickening there is peritoneal disease and this we can see there is peritoneal disease which is often we miss in the fdg pet scan so this can be a good trace of a response assessment where we usually don't uh can't see the peritoneal metastasis uptake this was the again uh, googly uh, from the fapi so intestinal variant moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma stomach post distal gastrectomy and chemotherapy we did both fdg and pet fapi so we can see in the fdg there is no uptake in the abdomen whereas in fapi 46 we can see there is some uptake in the mid abdomen and this was just uh, post surgery so there is this uptake was inflammatory again the uptake in the entire abdominal was inflammatory more serious was this liver lesion so this liver lesion we thought this is metastasis because it came in the fapi but not in the fdg whereas this was a hemangioma and hemangioma the uptake could be so variable from the low grade to high grade the, even we uh, search the literature it can be very intense uh, like suv of 30 35 so this was the challenge then uh, uh, with the fapi so we have to learn this uh, where or we have to do the fdg pet city along with the fapi pet this is the another case the problem with this is the false negative this is the gastric carcinoma we can see uptake in the gastric carcinoma but there are some lymph nodes which are necrotic and which are not showing up the traces so we can see there is no tracer uptake in these lymph nodes this lymph nodes and which are truly metastatic by the ct criteria because of the necrotic size pancreatic cancer we know uh, there is challenging because the low uptake in the pancreatic cancer and the fdg tumor to background is not that good but fapi has shown uh, in literature actually high tumor to background but again uh, this was one of the case from the literature uh, i i put the from where i took so uh, this uh, we can see the FAP, fdg pet city is completely normal whereas we can see in the fapi there is multiple uh, foci uptake however what we have found this is case and there are two primary in the head and the uh, tail of the pancreas but if you see the fapi carefully if you decrease the intensity there would be two foci but there are still the uptake in the rest of the pancreas which is due to tumor associated pancreatitis 
and um, some uh, seniors in our field uh, i called them and initially they told me that do a 3 hour scan we did the 3 hour scan still the uptake persisted in the rest of the pancreas so these are the cross sections image we can see there is uptake in the head of the pancreas in the tail of the pancreas but if you see fappy how you will say where is the tumor it is really difficult so i don't know how the publications are coming it is good probably it is good in the identification of the lymph nodes or mets but invariably in the pancreatic pancreatic cancer it is difficult on the fappy scan to identify the primary if you are not doing a cct or triple phase ct this is another case again you can see diffuse uptake in the pancreas this is pancreatic carcinoma periampullary carcinoma the fdg pet ct showing the uptake, uh, uptake in the uh, primary lesion and the fappy is showing good tumor to background however again the challenge is the lymph nodes the you lymph nodes you can see these are necrotic and truly uh, metastatic but on the fdg we can see the uptake in both lymph nodes but fappy is not showing any uptake so somehow the uh, we have found that the necrotic lymph nodes are not showing up fappy uptake and this are true sorry false negative again the infection is big problem there is no metabolic signature again uh, these are the uh, uptake in the fdg and rest of the pancreas showing in the fappy again as like the before cases along with that there are two cases if you can see there is uptake in the lung abscess and this one this one is bothersome because if we are diagnosing something so this was showing no uptake on the fdg pet ct however fappy showed intense uptake initially we gave as metastasis but this was basically cholangitic abscess so that's the problem with the uh, fappy we are currently facing so uh, this was uh, proven as abscess in the mr and the uh, obviously the abscess are showing uptake i'll skip this one the cholangiocarcinoma just uh, please pay attention to this box red box so the sensitivity specificity although it has been uh, given uh, higher with the fappy but still if you see the numbers are not great and definitely we see but tumor to background is definitely high with the in the cholangiocarcinoma these are the images and the uh, the uh, graph shows um uh, basically the tumor to background ratio is high in all uh, cases in the fappy this is one of the example where we can see the uptake in the uh, primary cholangiocarcinoma but it is more in the fappy the extent is looking more this is mainly because of the again the cholangitic abscess in the patient and there was lymph nodes which were detected in both so we can see this was the primary so tumor to background is high in the fappy pet ct but again this area which was negative on the fdg and was positive on the fappy was a cholangitic abscess the lymph nodes is showing the uptake the problem is the even the smallest so you see this image on uh, the mip image it is looking like very intense uptake in the Uh, something like mets but it was basically a degenerative changes in the temporo uh, uh, sorry uh, so um, uh, the uh, joint hepatocellular carcinoma head to head comparison is done in one study which showed the uh, basically fappy detected more of the intrahepatic foci rather than anything else the distance metastasis or nodes so uh, and all the cases the management was changed due to uh, detection on the multifocal intrahepatic foci the challenges are again the most challenging thing i would say the hemangioma the focal nodular hyperplasia the uptake in the inflammatory nodules because this happens in the mostly in the background of the cirrhotic uh, background uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma and the angiomyoblastoma also show some degree of uptake colorectal carcinoma is one field where this is very good actually and uh, although there are some pitfalls but uh, the colon is very clear in the fappy there is no uptake uh, physiologically so this is one area where uh, it is very good Uh, most of the articles have suggested that it is very good sensitivity and specificity although uh, the, we can't say 100% everything but it has good uh, sensitivity and specificity this is one of the image how beautifully we can demarcate the extent of the lesion uh, in the fappy so uh, the if you see the um, uh, fappy versus fdg suv max uh, in most of the uh, studies it is high uh, apart from one in 2022 so uh, the sensitivity and specificity if you see for liver metastasis it is uh, high in the fappy it is high in the lymph nodes it is high in the primary lesions and lymph nodes compared to the fdg so there is no doubt and i believe this is the one thing where we should stop doing uh, fdg and there is no need of probably fdg now than the fappy pet ct 
This is one of the example image where we can see there is similar degree of uptake in bo both FDG and the FAPI in the primary. However, you can see the liver lesions where so much of uh, metastasis is there, which is not seen in the uh, FDG. Again, another case where we can very nicely delineate the tumor. Head and neck cancer. Uh, it has superior specificity in the better tumor segmentation and RT planning uh, particularly, but more important to that, it has, uh, it can detect the cups. So we are not um, like 100% good with the FDG till now, and probably this tracer is very good in the cups, uh, just uh, two, three minutes more. So this is very good in cups and uh, most of the tumors which were not, this, this study basically took all the negative patients where FDG was negative. So this was a good study, 18 patients they took and they found seven additional primary. So the primary were uh, uh, found where we usually missed in the bilateral palatine tonsil, we say it is normal or physiological, they found some of the cases, they found some of the cases of the submandibular gland uh, primary and some the near the uh, base of the brain where the physiological uptake is the high in the FDG. So this is one of the example image where we can see the FDG is very intense uh, in bilateral, but the primary is on the right side. So the Another case where submandibular gland is not showing any uptake on the FDG, but we can see the fatty uptake on the... So uh, this is uh, these are the particularly two, three case um, uh, areas where the FAPI is really good in head and neck cancer. Although I believe that integrin receptors are far more better. We have experienced currently trihexine. Uh, trihexine. So uh, we have now biopsy reports of those patients and we have done a couple of cases. And those results are excellent, I would say, at least in the head and neck carcinoma. Um, this study again, they have showed the in the cups in the head and neck cancer, they have shown the sensitivity is about 51% compared to the FDG pet city. Uh, the pitfalls is again, um, uh, it can go anywhere like that guy, and it is the sino um, nasal inverted papilloma, which can show uptake. This is a case of um, uh, pyrotitis, which shows intense uptake. This is thyroiditis. And now coming to peritoneal metastasis, this is one area again, the FAPI is really very good and it has very high sensitivity. All the studies have shown the sensitivity of about 92 to 100% with the FAPI, whereas the FDG has sensitivity of about 0% to 87%. So, so variable with the FDG depending on the size of the meds. However, FAPI is really good in uh, peritoneal car carcinomatosis. And the sensitivity changes the management the case where we can see the response assessment, but again, any sort of infection in the lung can so uptake. So I don't know where, uh, uh, like how it will uh, pick up in this particular uh, scenario. IgG4 related disease, most of the cases which uh, FDG miss, uh, it shows uptake, like particularly they have commented the pancreas, but pancreas is still showing in all of the cases. So I don't know whether they have done biopsy or not in all the cases. Rosite Hoffman's disease, it can show uh, uptake in most of the lymph nodes, most of the spleen and sp liver, whereas the FDG was uh, not very suggestive and uh, they suggested the hepatosolysis carcinoma. This was published as a case report in EZ and MI. Erdem Chester disease, uptake in, so you can map the disease wherever the histocytes uh, over the XTBT is there. Uh, Takayasu atresis, this is the false uh, negative case in the FDG pet city, but we can see there is intense uptake uh, so, sorry, this slide, so we can see there is uptake in the most of the uh, carotids, subclavian, and the uh, thoracic and dorsal uh, abdominal outer. So this was uh, type 5, Takayasu arthritis, sarcoidosis, again, FDG was not very, uh, uptake was there, but most of the lesions were seen in the FAPI. 
uh, neuroinflammation this case just we last week we did so if uh, this patient was young patient who was in the icu for the brain stem involvement with paraplegia paraparesis actually and we can see there is no uptake in the lesion actually mri suggested there was lesion in there and how clearly we can delineate the lesion and we can uh, do for response assessment for these patients this was a case of neuromelidosis actually uh, granulomatosis again it can go to tb so Thank you very much. So we have to be careful with the FAPI. That's what the, my message is. We have to be very careful. And song by Manade, you have to remember, e bhai jara ke chalo. Thank you very much. And the, coming back to the, uh, um, this guy, this Thana Choy, what happened is actually he died because of his karma. But again, at the last uh, prank he made by walking like this on the knees, he told the king to come to his grave by pranking so at final stage also he pranked the king he also died and the king also kicked out uh, him of the, his kingdom so we have to be careful otherwise the fapi will also go and we also will in the trouble thank you yes sir all the cases so particularly colorectal i'm saying so if you have a like i'm um, two scenarios i think the where in the oncology where if the cases are referred particularly to see the peritoneal disease then probably fdg has no role and the fapi is very good and the colorectal probably we can avoid crohn's though uh, we have seen couple of crohn's cases where there is uptake we have taken a project on that so crohn's disease we are correlating with the colonoscopy but still, I would suggest uh, uh, colon cancer, probably we can avoid this. But the uh, necrotic lymph nodes are new. We, we, we are writing a series on that. So, so still we have a lot of learning phase Yeah, there is a learning curve, sir. There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sir. Fatty. No, sir, this patient already had the breast conservative surgery. Oh, final, you're saying the final one. Final Finally, one. we have not done biopsy, sir. Okay. So, this was my first question. My second question is that you know that uh, you don't like the other part of the high culture. How much sensitivity is in that? You started with sensitivity and specificity. How much is specificity of that? Let's come down. Sadina time, we'll talk about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shamim Muhammad Shamim. So he is a very interesting speaker and humorous speaker. His topic is on radiopharmaceuticals for transarterial radionuclide therapy in hepatocellular carcinoma. Dr. Shamim has a very great sense of Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. सर आपका ये स्लाइड्स एंड प्लस इसमें आपकी वो है इमेज प्रेजेंटेशन प्रेजेंट में है ये प्रेजेंटेशन से सर आपने एक्चुअली जितना दिया था ना सारा कॉपी कर दिया इसमें मैंने ये प्रेजेंटेशन से ओके और वीडियो भी सर में भी हाँ चल ठीक है बस हाँ गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी फर्स्ट ऑफ़ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक्स डॉक्टर � and giving this opportunity. Mereko Dhanpati sir pooch rahe thai raste mein ke PGI wale itna achha hospital ti kaise dete hai. To mene un koi Dhanpati sir koi bataya, even Mithil sir koi bataya ke hum Mithil sir joh hai logun ko dene mein vishwaas rakhte hai, hum log joh hai apne aap ko rakhne mein vishwaas rakhte hai. To ye difference hai, that's why he give lot of hospital ti aur itna achha मतलब मजा आता है यहाँ पे आके पीजीए में कभी भी कोई कॉन्फ्रेंस होती है तो हम सोचते हैं कि हमें जरूर बुलाएंगे और आने में मजा भी आता है। तो आज तो मौसम इतना बार अच्छा था कि मुझे पता नहीं इतनी इंटेंडेंस कैसे हो गई है वो भी मित्र सर वजह की वजह से होगी अदरवाइज तो इतनी इंटेंडेंस नहीं होनी चाहिए क्योंकि मौसम बहुत सुहाना है बार बारिश भी है बादल भी हैं वो उस मूवी का गाना भी याद आ गया मुझे उस मूवी क्या था उसके पाकिजा मूवी का मौसम है आशिकाना ऐसे में या दिल तो उनको ढूंढ लाना तो इस वक्त उनको ढूंढने का टाइम था हम यहाँ पढ़ाई कर रहे हैं बट चलिए ये भी ठीक है इसका भी कुछ फायदा होगा हमको सो आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल फॉर ट्रांस आर्टेरियल ट्रांस आर्टेरियल रेडियो न्यूक्लियर थ्रेबी न पेटोसेल 
so tear is indicated in both the conditions like in primary as well as in secondary in primary it is uh, it is actually used for a petrocellular carcinoma and uh, in sometime we also do it, it for cholangiocarcinoma but primarily it is used for hepatocellular carcinoma for metastatic purpose it is done for metastatic colorectal carcinoma and neuroendocrine tumor metastatic so these are the indication where the tear is done so brief about hepatocellular carcinoma it actually globally constitutes 7 percent of all occurrence of the cancer reason to sabko pata hai main khane jane ka reason hai sabse bada to uski wajah se ye hoga bhi to isme mujhe lagta nahi hai kisi ko itna bura lagna chahiye kyunki ye to bahut acha life deta hai uske baad aa jaye to koi problem nahi hai to in developing country it is also associated with hepatitis b and hepatitis c most of the patient jo hai they present in the later stage like 40% of the patient present at the stage of vclc d and 28% present in vclc c stage uh, diagnosis of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is very easy it is actually done initially with ultrasonography if there is mass on the ultrasonography in the liver so you need to do the alpha fetoprotein if alpha fetoprotein high there is no need of going for further investigation like ct mri or any other or any other investigation directly this patient can be assessed for the surgery or for the further therapy if there is uh, alpha fetoprotein is normal then the patient should be subjected for ct and an mri if there is any if uh, that is characteristic for the hepatocellular carcinoma then directly the patient can be treated if the, if uh, ct and mri are it, having some doubt then major diagnostic uh, investigation may be taken or we can go for the biopsy that is done only in 3% of the cases so in hepatocellular carcinoma biopsy and other investigation don't have much of role even pet ct don't have much of the role ct and mri is sufficient to make the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma this is how the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma look like in uh, ct like we can see the hypodense lesion as we can see from here this is in the non contrast images in arterial phase it show intense enhancement and during the portal venous phase it show a uh, washout and during the delayed phase there is further washout from the center of the tumor and there will be only peripheral rim of activity or we say contrast enhancement so treatment of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma depend upon the stage of the tumor like during the early stage i can say stage 0 or stage a uh, they um, the intent of the treatment is curative and that is done with the help of ablation resection transplantation so this all depend upon the early stages of the tumor during the uh, advanced or we can say intermediate stage and advanced stage uh, they are treated uh, their goal of the treatment is to downgrade the staging of the tumor and then do the palliative treatment in these patients while in patient those are having the advanced disease like stage d disease they 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 are treated symptomatically or we can say best symptomatic care is given in this patient uh, in local regional treatment we have uh, two three option like ablation taste they they have overlap with each other and they are used depending upon the stage of the tumor uh, the rationale for the embolization is that the liver tumor they gets 100% their supply from the hepatic artery so if we will inject any antineoplastic uh, agent or any thromboembolic agent into that artery that will block the artery and that will kill that tumor cells and that is used for uh, treatment of the hepatocellular carcinoma coming to radionuclide embolization in this the radioactive is trans, uh, they are delivered to the tumor with the help of the catheters and that will that will kill the tumor cell and the indication is in bc lcc b stage and c stage where there is a portal vein thrombosis particularly these patient are the right candidate for the uh, this uh, trans uh, arterial radionuclide embolization uh, coming to the tear agent we have commonly used uh, four radio tracer which can be used for treatment of the Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma these are uh, most uh, common one is the yttrium microspheres it is available in two form therospheres and surspheres iodine 131 lipidol homium microspheres and different agent of uh, this uh, rhenium 188 Uh, the first one is yttrium microsphere it is very ideal radio isotope for the hepatocellular carcinoma because of it uh, purely beta emitter and uh, has half life of 64 uh, hour approximately and penetration is 11 mm which is sufficient for killing the tumor cell it has approximately 95% of radiation dose delivery by 11 day of treatment uh, 
So these, this is available in two forms, that is in Sersphere and Therosphere. Both have some differences with each other. Otherwise, both any of them can be used for a petrocellular carcinoma like Sersphere and Therosphere. Their cost is slightly higher, like Sersphere is available uh, in our institute, we get approximately 7 lakh, but in uh, in case of Therosphere, we get approximately 10 lakh. So the uh, Therosphere is a bit costlier, Sersphere is a bit cheaper as compared to Therosphere. And uh, they have uh, activity in the case of Sersphere is 3 gigabicurel, while it is available in different doses like 3, 5, 7, 10, 15, 12, 20. And we can uh, this uh, uh, split this Sersphere dose. We can use this dose for two patients. Like sometimes we get a patient having low uh, tumor volume, then we can split the dose and uh, we can give to the two patients. Sometimes we get six millicurie and that can be given to the to the two patients. But this is not possible with the case of Therospheres. And shelf life is less in case of Sersphere as compared to the Therosphere where it is 15 days. Uh, Sersphere indication is approved in other tumor like metastatic colorectal cancer and metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor as well in addition to the hepatocellular carcinoma. This is how uh, this uh, yatrium thyrospheres are prepared. This is glass particle. In this, the yatrium is actually, inactive yatrium is uh, taken into that, and then silicon and uh, aluminum are taken into these uh, spheres. The, the heating is done, and then the neutron bombardment is done. In these thyrospheres, the inactive yatrium will be converted to active yatrium, and that can be uh, then uh, further uh, uh, packed for the different centers, and then that will be supplied to the different center. So before injecting, it is important to do the tumor mapping. It is done with the help of triple phase MRI or CT. Like here we can see, this is the triple phase CT of the patient having the tumor in the right lobe of the liver. It is involving segment uh, uh, segment 5, 6, and 7, and uh, this mapping is actually done in the angiographic suit, mostly in the radiology department, where the after femoral puncture, the catheter is in, inserted into the targeted artery, like as we can see that this catheter is going within the ta targeted artery. This is the catheter. This is after injecting this, and the contrast is injected into the uh, catheter, then that tumor will get flush. Uh, blush of that tumor will be detected, and we can know from that this the catheter is within the tumor, and uh, before that, it is important to do the mass scanning. Mass scanning will help in dose calculation and uh, also help us to detect the pulmonary shunting. And with the help of dynamic CT, which we take during this process, we calculate the tumor volume. This will help us to calculate the dose. This is how the tumor volume is calculated, calculated like the contrast enhancing area will be marked and the volume will be calculated from this. And that volume will help us to decide the dose of the patient, that particular patient. There are four different methods of dosimetry calculation in the patient of a petrocellular carcinoma, and the, they are like empiric method where there we can give a fixed dose of uh, radioactivity depending upon the involvement of the tumor in the liver. And number two method is body surface area method, and third one is the partition method, and the fourth one is the direct Monte Carlo based approach. Each method has different advantages and different advantages. This empiric method was used where if there is uh, liver involvement is more than 50% by the tumor, three gigavicurel is given. And if the liver uh, the tumor is involving 25 to 50% of the liver, then the 2.5 gigavicurel is given. But this method is now abandoned because of non-specific uh, uh, liver damage because of this method. Uh, number two is the body surface area method. This method is used only when we have uh, when we have uh, this uh, multifocal lesions or there is advanced liver disease. But commonly used method is uh, this, uh, I will skip this slide. This is for this. And now this method is most common method that is partition uh, model method. In this, uh, MUD method is used for this most useful in treatment of single and few liver lesion. In this, the radiation is, uh, the SMA is injected into the patient and three compartmental dosimetry is taken into the uh, consideration like liver, tumor, and lung uh, dosimetry is taken. And after that, drawing the ROI in this region the, and uh, putting this into the formula, we get uh, dose for each tumor. So in this, we, after deciding the dose, we can, divide, uh, we can, we can, we can plan uh, 
by three way like one is radiation segment segmentectomy where we will only target the segment particular segment where the tumor is uh, located and number two is radiation lobectomy when the tumor is larger than the segment when the tumor is uh, bigger than the segment then the uh, radiation lobectomy can be tried and in patient those are having uh, portal vein thrombosis or bipolar diseases when these patient palliative intent is used and the, the different arteries are targeted for the uh, tear Dose delivery is uh, actually again after doing this tumor mapping. Dose delivery is done similarly uh, with the help of dose delivery. This uh, uh, equipment and this is uh, supplied by the vendor. In this, there are three uh, uh, line in this uh, dose delivery system. One is for saline, other is for radioactive uh, this uh, radioactive substance like yttrium, and the third one is for contrast. So this is post uh, therapy uh, PET images. Uh, we can do uh, Bram Starling in this patient, and also we can do the PET CT. And this is the PET images, which is done after the therapy to see whether that particular medicine is properly localized to that tumor or not. Like as we can see, this patient having uh, tumor in the right lobe of the liver. So we can see this patient that there is a proper localization of the medicine in this lobe. This is the problem. So there are many recommendations how much dose should be given to the tumor. So this is the European, uh, this publication, I think the most uh, accepted publication where we can see they have given more logical dose uh, which need to be delivered to the tumor. They have, they in this, they have concluded that 40 gray of uh, activity should uh, be to the liver, normal liver. It should not exceed 40 gray, while for the tumor, 100 to 120 gray is sufficient for destroying the tumor cell. Drawback of yttrium therapy is that uh, there is a, we need to do pre-therapy angiographic, which is a cumbersome procedure, and uh, post-therapy imaging. I knew that this time will come. I have told you earlier that you will not kill the bell. So, you have killed it in the middle of the bell. So, we'll try to finish fast. So, what is the disadvantage is that we have to do it two or three times each time. So pre-therapy imaging is actually where imaging with post-therapy imaging is also difficult because it's pure beta emitter, Bram Starling, it's a long procedure, it's a long time for the images. And up to 10 times more costlier than the therapy with iodine-131 lipidol. So it is actually we get this in 7 lakh and iodine-131 I think 1 lakh ki aaj jati hai, so it's difference between both these therapies. So next one is holmium. It is not commonly used. I will not uh, uh, go in further into the detail because already there is bell, I think, uh, in their hand. And I think now the other people will wait for when the bell will be played. Now it's only one thing. So iodine lipidol tear, what are the benefits? It is also used for that, but it has advantage, disadvantage because radiation hazard for the hospital patients. Long isolation is required. Smaller dose administered because uh, it can it can emit the gamma emission, which is actually uh, uh, force the radiation to the other people and healthcare worker as well as the other patient. It required thyroid blocking with potassium iodide, so that it it, it uh, these are the disadvantage with iodine therapy. These are few dis adverse effect with the iodine therapy. Now coming to the rhenium, which we have also worked on the maximum, Jaya Madam has also worked on the maximum, and Jaya Madam has also worked on the paper that I have coded here, that rhenium 1 HSC, that it is not the microspheres, so otherwise the labeling of FEKC was very good, that was more than 90% and there is radioactive chemical purity was more than 90% in the rhenium, that was more than 90% in the rhenium, that was more than 90% in the rhenium, that was more than 90% which is excellent for this radio pharmaceutical. So, uh, I think this, uh, this is, uh, Madam has done a tremendous job by, uh, by inventing this for uh, all of us. And I think in future we are going to use, we are getting the rhenium generator, uh, hopefully soon in this uh, uh, next uh, uh, May. Abhi tak to atka hua tha, bal sar ni lana chate the. Wo purchase order ni de rahe the, keh rahe the, isme fayda koi nahi hai. So hopefully ab aaya jayega, kyunki wo mene ICMR se process kiya hai. So we will try this uh, for that. So HDD is commonly used, uh, uh, since long, but it has a labeling efficacy of 50 to 60 percent, which is not 
so great we lose lot of activity with this we, if we will put 200 milli curie we will get only 100 milli curie of activity for injection so we will lose 100 50 percent of the activity can be lost so there is actually this disadvantage with this this was the trial which was done actually this was the largest trial in uh, in 93 patient this was ia he is sponsor uh, project in different center in different countries. So they concluded that uh, patient actually show good uh, response. Uh, and uh, they have shown 8% of the patient has shown complete response. 17% have shown partial and 23% has shown stable disease. This is another uh, rhenium based uh, uh, chelating agent where we this is super six sulfur lipidol. It has also good property like uh, labeling efficacy and uh, uh, yield. And there are a few study on this also. This is DEDC, which is established by Bark, and we are using this. Uh, in a, and I have also given thesis to one of my PhD student, and uh, Bark people has helped in this, particularly Dr. Madhavan. And I will. I'm really thankful to him. He is giving this kit free of cost to us, and he is supporting us. Bark people are also sitting here. So future में मुझे लगता है ये उनको बोलेंगे कि जाके के वो उनकी मामले हम उनका पूरा मतलब एक्नॉलेज करते हैं उनको so please एक्नॉलेज करना सर को कि we are thankful to him तो ये study we have published in 31 patient we have actually done tear in this patient so in 31 patient में से we have seen uh, we did response evaluation with m resist and alpha phytoprotein. We have seen five complete response, seven partial response, eight patient has stable disease. In seven patient, there was disease progression. This was one of our patient which we have done. So it, this was a 70-year-old male having hepatocellular carcinoma. As we can see, this was the lesion. This was the post-therapy scan. This was the contrast enhancing lesion in prior pre-therapy MRI and the post-therapy, there is no contrast enhancement. Patient has shown complete response in, in, in this case. And this patient lived for four years. So, उसके बाद फोन उठाना बंद कर दिया था। चार साल के बाद इसकी रिकरेंस आई तो फिर इसने दोबारा फोन ये लुधियाना का पेशेंट था। इसको बीच में फोन करते रहे हम। तो ये फिर आया नहीं हमारे पास। चार साल के बाद रिकरेंस हुई तो फिर फोन किया। फिर बोला हमने हमने ट्रीट करेंगे इसको। फिर � the post therapy scan and post therapy MRI showing complete response. So I will go. I will skip this slide. Otherwise, I will be exceeding the time. I think Rath will have to go. Thank it's you. Very informative this one. Thank you. I think that. everybody will ask you question during the dinner time. <laughs> that is the best time, I think. <laughs> Thank you. One, yeah, one question. Ha, ha, that's correct. Yeah. Ah, people, I have asked a question. So it means that you have to ask me. This is not important. <laughs> what is your experience with the UTC-PRRD? We have not done a side-to-side comparison with the PRRT versus... How many Greeks have started giving the PRRT versus the PRRT? Yes, they are sitting here. They have said that we will give them. No, we have not used it yet. But now we have not given it. Yes. As they have given it, they have said it. Today they have promised it. Now they have on the phone, sir. So hopefully he will give it to us. They are ignoring the knowledge, maybe. But I think we will get him from him. Any further question? Thank you, Dr. Shmi. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. I would like to in, thank you, Dr. Shmi. Thank I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Rajinder Kumar. Uh, Dr. Rajinder Kumar is a renowned personality in the field of intervention nuclear medicine, not just in India but globally. And he will be presenting <coughs> his uh, experience on radio pharmaceuticals in intervention nuclear medicine. Intervention. Okay, it is radio pharmaceuticals for breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Harpreet. And uh, uh, my both uh, previous speakers are versatile speakers. They spoken a lot. I think uh, we, yeah, everybody enjoyed that. And uh, all of them, uh, all of the audience are right, right now. Right now, like, I'm not speaking on intervention today. I'm speaking on radio pharmaceutical and breast imaging. So uh, now uh, the brief overview of breast cancer. The uh, worldwide, the breast cancer is the leading cause of uh, cause of uh, cancer in females. And uh, is the fifth leading cause of the cancer related death in the worldwide. But in India, the scenario is a bit different. Around 30% of the uh, all cancer in the cancer, female cancers are breast cancers. Now, I'm coming to the brief overview of uh, radiopharmaceutical used in breast cancer. We have spec based radiopharmaceuticals and pet based radiopharmaceuticals. Spec based radiopharmaceuticals, we have molecular breast imaging, central nephrod imaging, uh, assessment of the bone metastasis, 
and for uh, pet waste ready pharmaceuticals we have metabolic uh, metabolic tracers sodium fluoride pet and hormonal receptor based tracers and miscellaneous and newer tracers so i'm going one by one on each and every tracers the first i will be covering uh, the spect based tracer the first radio tracer used for breast uh, cancer is p32 that is that was used first in 1940s and after that muga muga was used for breast cancer it was not used for uh, imaging the breast cancer but used for uh, assessment of the cardiac functions and it uh, has a very high reproducibility with intra observer variability is less than uh, 5% and smo and snm guidelines recommend muga for assessment of the cardiac function in breast cancer patient after doxorubicin therapy but ncn guidelines do not recommend muga for uh, assessment of the cardiac function in uh, function in breast cancer patients so the next uh, scan is uh, MD, uh, mdp bone scans it is a powerful first line staging uh, treatment uh, staging and treatment response evaluation tool for breast cancer imaging and it has a very high sensitivity and specificity and most of the guidelines ismo guidelines ncn guidelines and even AUC, auc recommend bone scan for uh, in breast cancer and when uh, when the stage increases the uh, chance of detection of the uh, of the bony lesions will increase in the stage 4 the chance of detection of the bony lesion is more than 40% and the only one limitation for the uh, bone scan is osteolytic lesions the next is molecular based imaging the radio pharmaceutical over here is technetium mb and the detector is cjt detector the sensitivity and specificity of the uh, molecular based imaging is uh, almost similar to that of mri and enm guidelines and snm guidelines are in favor of molecular based imaging but ncn do, do not recommend a molecular based imaging for uh, breast cancer and uh, it is a versatile tool when uh, uh, mammography is negative and it it can pick the lesions like like we can see in this image there is a mammography showing uh, no disease but uh, molecular based imaging showing a focal of the, uh, focal trace uptake in the breast and that is correspond to the mri next is sentinel lymph node scintigraphy ready for us over here is, here we use is sulfur colloid technetium nanocolloid antimony trisulfide and tilmanosept it, it is a stable standard a standard of care in early breast cancer and clinically negative uh, axilla and it is a uh, excellent technique for uh, the patient who are planned for mastectomy in dc uh, dcis and in patient with n1 disease that were down stage to n0 disease after new urgent therapy it is an excellent technique and uh, study has suggested that it has significant uh, lower morbidity morbidity than axillary lymph node uh, dissections and consistent guidelines recommend sentinel node lymph node uh, imaging next is uh, roll and snol the roll uh, the uh, red tracer over here is technetium uh, radio labeled human albumin that is localized on the non palpable breast lesion the, the tracer is injected to the breast lesion with the help of uh, ultrasound guidance and the image can be taken at the, the non palpable, palpable lesion can be uh, can be identified with the help of the gamma probe and sentinel lymph node can also be identified now coming to the pet pet based radio tracers we have plenty of pet pet based radio tracers we have glycolysis for uh, we can use fdg pet and for angiogenesis we can, uh, we can use uh, gallium rgd and we also have ps gallium psma for gestin re uh, receptor releasing peptide we have gallium R rm2 for pr based receptors we have ffnp and for uh, estrogen receptors we have fes for uh, cxr4 imaging we have gallium pentaxa4 for androgen receptors we have fdhd and for her2 uh, two receptors we have copper 60, uh, 64 gallium 68 and zirconium labeled trastuzumab and we also have fab uh, agents like uh, dr kanaiya discussed a lot of about fab agents so i'm uh, not going to detail the fab agents and uh, we also have hypoxia imaging we have mijo f faja and nitrimidazoles and we also have self proliferating uh, agent like uh, f18 flt so first coming to the metabolic traces the dedicated breast imaging so we have mami fat and pem the mami fat uh, pet is uh, dedicated breast imaging camera and pem is also a breast imaging camera but uh, they have slight difference the in mami pet the breast is lying uh, freely in, but in pem the breast is not lying freely it is fixed in a cup in the in, in the uh in a cup and it uh, they have both have a high spatial resolution the detection rate is almost equivalent to that of mri and it and the uh, breast dedicated imaging is more useful when mri is contraindicated and now uh, in the recent years pem and pet guided biopsy is uh, picking up for doing uh, in, in in case of uh, diagnosis diagnosis of primary breast cancers uh, 
Uh, now coming to the whole body FD, FDG PET CT, most of the guidelines are in favor of doing PET CT for clinical stage 3B and onward, and uh, it it is a good uh, good sensitive for detection of the uh, species of risk, uh, recurrence for assessing that uh, treatment uh, treatment response, and it it is a better tool for predicting the pathological re complete response in local regional disease, and uh, the study has suggested that metabolic best evolution. Has, has shown a superior predictor of the uh, PFS and disease-free survival than as compared to uh, conventional imaging. Uh, this is a, pet, a patient with the uh, uh, with the T1 uh, M1 MX uh, stage. Uh, this is clinical resectable uh, disease. After PET, we can see there is appearance of supraclavicular nephrodis also there. So the disease is upstage and it becomes non-resectable. Uh, next is sodium fluoride PET. The most of the guidelines are in favor of doing uh, uh, sodium fluoride or uh, uh, MDP MDP spec, MDP uh, bone scan, and they recommend uh, recommend fluoride PET or MDP bone scan in breast cancers. And sodium fluoride is uh, much better; it has a better image quality and tracer, kin uh, tracer kinetics are also better as compared to MDP. The next radio tracer is ER and PR imaging. The, uh, for ER receptors, we have uh, fluoroestradiol, and for uh, PR receptor imaging, we have norprogesterol FFNP receptor imaging. Uh, the uptake of ER and uh, uh, PR, the tumor uptake of these uh, tracer is correlated with the re uh, relative expression of these receptors. They can predict uh, the res uh, response to the endocrine therapy. They can identify the tumor heterogeneity with, uh, with these receptor expressions, and we can select the biopsy site. And they confirm the uh, expression of this receptor when biopsy is not possible. And development of ER antagonist th theranoistic agent is also uh, also a concern in these cases. Now, uh, the Dr. J also developed this uh, technetium labeled uh, tamoxifen. Uh, this is in our in-house product. Uh, now, coming to HER2 receptor imaging, around 15 to 20 percent of the breast cancer they express HER2 receptors. The HER2 receptor expression is associated with the tumor uh, tumor aggressiveness. And poor clinical outcome. Uh, 99 technetium, uh, 90, uh, 90, 89 zirconium uh, trastuzumab uh, can be labeled with, uh, can be used for, uh, for, for HER2 receptor imaging. And uh, people also you have used copper 64 Dota trastuzumab for uh, PET CT imaging for uh, breast cancer imaging. And the Dr. J also developed a new tracer that is uh, trastuzumab fab receptors for uh, breast cancer imaging. For integrin and neovascular density, we can use uh, we we have uh, gallium RG, uh, technetium uh, hyaluronic RGD and gallium RGD, and there is a new tracer that is integrin antago uh, antagonist carbamate derivative that that is gallium 68 IAC. The we all know that PSMA PET CT is a versatile uh, PSMA is a versatile agent and it can be used in uh, not in not on in uh, prostate cancer patients, but in multiple other cancers also, and it has shown uh, good results in uh, breast cancer also. And uh, the PSMA PET uh, has shown uh, good uh, good uh, diagnostic in triple negative breast cancer patients, and it could be a th theranostic tool in these patients also. Uh, gallium FAPI, uh, Dr. Kanaya discussed in detail about the uh, gallium FAPI, what are the foot pitfalls and uh, uh, use of gallium FAPI in uh, PET CT, and this is a case uh, where uh, in th there is uh, Local recurrence in the breast cancer uh, in the after uh, the FDG PET showing, showing no uptake and but uh, gallium FAP is showing increased uptake over there. Other novel PET tracers in trials and ongoing research for proliferation we have FLT for metabolic uh, lipid uh, we have FLT uh, uh, C11 choline for amino acid metabolism we have FLT in fluoroclovins uh, for hypoxia imaging we have FLT in mijo and for cell membrane synthesis we have FLT in choline. For uh, chemo, uh, chemokine receptors, we have gallium pentexa 4. Now coming to therapeutic options. Based on uh, the, uh, these images, we can decide therapeutic options in the breast cancer. So we have HER2 receptor based uh, therapy. Uh, HER2 receptor, uh, HER2 uh, can be labeled with the lutetium and can be used for heart, uh, can be used for therapy. This is a case from our department. Uh, uh, this patient was administered for 44, uh, 404 megabucrol of lutetium trastuzumab, and after five days. Uh, there is, we can see still uptake in the um, breast lesion is there, but uh, the, uh, there is a main concern for lutetium transuvab therapy is liver lesions and the liver functions. Uh, lutetium dota FAPI and lutetium FAPI uh, 99 uh, 90 uh, yttrium FAPI can also be used for uh, therapy purposes. 
and lumer trial uh, trial is a phase one of phase two trial study that evaluated the safety and uh, dosimetry pharmacokinetics and preliminary uh, anti tumor activity in lutetium fab in patients with advanced metastatic cancer this is a patient treated with uh, lutetium fab and we can see there is significant decrease in uh, the lesion uh, lesions after the therapy this is study from the aims Uh, this is FDG PET CT. This is the FAP PET CT after TMS, TMAC, and uh, the patient are given three cycle of FAP and interim uh, PET. So there is slight decrease in uh, FAP uptake, and after FAP fifth cycle, there is significant decrease in the FAP expression is there. So FAP is also good uh, radio tracer for uh, therapeutic purpose. Other novel uh, tracer for uh, uh, tracer and ongoing trials research in uh, thrombotic is lutetium PSMA and uh, Arden 125. PARPI1 lutetium RM2 therapy lutetium RGD therapy and uh, for neurocan tumors we have lutetium dotate and uh, chemokinetic receptors we can uh, lutetium pentaxofor can be used i'm not covering the radionuclide for bone uh, bone pain palliation so the future uh, we uh, with the novel treatment options like immunotherapy and upcoming research on genetics and breast cancer micro uh, environment newer tracer to identify candidates and assess the response to novel treatment are being developed Novel radionuclide therapy for breast cancers are being developed. The future holds a lot of potential for uh, thrombotics in breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a nice and comprehensive presentation. Any questions from the audience? uh the psma in triple negative patients the psma is more expressed in triple triple negative patients and the stud that study had shown that uh, psma in triple negative patients is uh, going to the metastatic lesions is uh, in th these patient triple negative patients fdg is a good imaging modality and fdg is going to the metastatic sites but uh, the psma has shown much more metastasis in triple negative patients as compared to the fdg any other questions okay uh, thank you dr jinder so i would like to invite our next speaker uh, dr anurag shrivastava and he is the professor and ex head of the department of the uh, general surgery in aims new delhi and sir will be talking about future of cancer theranostics over to you sir thank you namaskar i am really grateful to all of you especially prof samittal sir and her team dr jaya shukla and the entire team and experts from brc dr pillai and dr chakravarti dr sudipto chakravarti dr shamim is humorous talk so uh, i am speaking from outside the field of nuclear medicine i am a consumer of the facilities and services that you render to us for care of patients especially patients with suffering from various cancers so uh, my thoughts are based on the experience of treating patients uh, for various cancers especially the cancer of the breast so <clears throat> i started my research uh, career in university of wales in cardiff um, Uh, where we conducted some studies on tumor induced angiogenesis so we studied the angiogenesis in uh, human melanoma in breast cancer so the story is like this pointer hai kya pointer pointer ya cursor yeah yeah okay i have got the cursor cursor acha theek so the most solid tumors go through two phases the initial avascular phase initial avascular phase where the cells will grow to a tumor mass or sphere for up to 1 to 2 mm in size measuring about a tumor mass of 10 to power 3 to 10 to power 5 cells about 1 million cells 1 lakh cells you can say so till that stage uh, there is no need of new blood vessels so the cells will perfuse from the local tissue fluid and um, but if the tumor wants to grow beyond this stage of 1 to 2 mm it has to develop and acquire new blood vessels which grow as mostly from the surrounding venules 
under the response of various angiogenic stimuli and the VEGF vascular endothelial growth factors are the main stimuli for this new blood vessel growth. And here we have there is a scope of inhibiting this process further by various anti-angiogenesis molecules. So we can render the tumor dormant if we stop this process of angiogenesis. So it's a very crucial and essential feature of tumor growth. Most solid tumors grow through this avascular and then vascular phase. Once the vascular phase ushers in, it ushers in a rapid phase of rapid growth, invasion, and propensity to metastasize. So because you have these vascular channels, which have plenty of arteriovenous communications, and they, they lack the smooth muscles, they lack the alpha and beta receptors, and there are a lot of arteriovenous communications. The tumor blood flow is a high flow, low impedance circuit with plenty of arteriovenous communications. And this is the difference between the normal vasculature, which is a high peripheral resistance circuit because of alpha and beta receptors they, they undergoes vasoconstriction, whereas tumor vessels lack that alpha and beta receptors and any smooth muscles. So it is a high flow circuit. And because of these communications, tumor cells can easily get access into the venules from there and develop into hematogenesis spread. So that's the main difference between vascular tumors, especially the malignant tumors. Benign tumors like uh, lipoma, fibroadenoma, they may not have that. And this has been extensively studied on a chick chorioembryo embryonic membrane, on a chick embryo, where you can see, you can put a drop of tumor extract, and within seven to 10 days, you can see the new blood vessel formation around that chick embryo. So this is, was the main model for the studying angiogenesis in tumors, developed mostly by Dr. Falkman in Harvard Medical School, who is considered the father of angiogenesis research. <clears throat> and later it was been found that this growth is mostly by vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. So we studied the angiogenesis in melanoma. Melanoma is a rapidly growing malignant neoplasm arising from the melanocytes in the skin. And we found that on a histological section, we can see large blood vessels, which on a high power view look like this. They're just thin line of endothelial cells, no muscle layer. And these are large vascular channels, mostly occurring in the base of the tumor, at the edge of the tumor. And these are large tumor-induced blood vessels. So based on that, because the growth was later found to be due to VEGF and other such molecules, uh, scientists developed uh, inhibitors of the angiogenesis. And monoclonal antibodies have been developed, which are commercially available by this name, bevacomizumib or Avastin, and especially mostly against VEGF-A. And it has been used in many tumors with the idea of inhibiting the microvascular growth and angiogenesis, and thereby inhibiting the growth of the cells. And FDA has approved the anti-VEGF therapy for the following cancers, cervical, metastatic, colorectal, glioblastoma, all rapidly growing tumors which have profound neoangiogenesis. However, it has never been uh, the, a success story with anti-angiogenic markers. And even if there is initial response, tumor in most cases grows back. So tumor develops resistance to this anti-angiogenetic growth. And why this happens? So the later scientists have found that besides this neovascular growth, there is another process going on like called vasculogenic mimicry. And vasculogenic mimicry is a very unique property in many rapidly growing malignant neoplasms where an alternative pathway for blood vessel is formed. And I will follow Dr. Shamim's uh, humorous story. So, as you go to a city, it's a very well-planned city. So, there's no chaos, there's no traffic, water supply, it's a very good sewage supply. And the other thing is that the unauthorized colonies are made in the city, the jugi jopdi. So, there's all chaos, there's a lot of chaos in the city. So, the vascular mimicry is like that unauthorized colony where there is no system and they have developed like unauthorized colony. Because, अच्छा देखिए जब आपके सिटी में तो सब सब्रांत लोग रहते हैं वो कोई बदमाशी चोरी नहीं करते लेकिन जुग्गी जोपड़ी में कौन रहते हैं यू नो दैट ठीक है तो 
झुग्गी झोपड़ी में जो रहने वाले हैं वो ज्यादातर क्रिमिनल्स होंगे और ड्रग एडिक्ट होंगे एल्कोहल इस तरह के लोग तो उसी तरह से जो मेलेग्नेंट न्यू प्लाजम्स हैं विच आर रेपिडली ग्रोइंग दे हैव दिस अनथराइज कॉलोनी एंड दे वॉन्ट टू ग्रो बाई हुक और दिक्रो साम दाम दंड वेद किसी तरह उनको रो करना है एंजियोजेनिसिस नहीं होगी ना हुआ करे मैं अपनी नाली अपनी सड़क बना लूंगा <laughs> तो वो जुग्गी झोपड़ी वाले अनथराइज कॉलोनी वाले दे हैव दिस वेस्कुलर मिमिक्री एंड दे आर वेरी स्ट्रेंज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग ग्रोथ एंड लॉट ऑफ रिसर्च इज बींग डन ऑन दिस वेस्कुलर मिमिक्री एंड दिस इज मोस्टली सीन इन रेपिडली ग्रोइंग ट्यूमर्स and this has many unique properties it causes stemness in the cancer cells which means it uh, persistent growth of the cells so it makes the cancer cell like behave like stem cells increase metastasis increase recurrence and this process is not inhibited by anti angiogenesis inhibitors because it is not dependent on vegf it is not dependent on regular angiogenesis it is something else and it has been mostly observed in rapidly growing tumors of melanoma breast cancer brain tumor prostate ovarian liver cancers which usually lead to death so what is the difference this is the normal blood vessel where you have a layer of endothelial cells and a basement membrane outside and a cell called pericyte which is outside is a very well behaved like city of chandigarh and lymphatics also have the same endothelial cells but there is no basement membrane in capillary in the lymphatic capillaries that's the main difference between blood vessel capillary and lymphatic capillary on the other hand in vasculogenic mimicry there is no endothelial cell at all cancer cells sadak ke kinare reh rahe hain sadak ka pani ya nahar ke kinare samajh lijiye reh rahe hain so cancer cells are virtually bathed in the blood तो ये ब्लड फ्लो ब्लड फ्लो की एक पाइप है वेसल है और उसके जस्ट बाहर सीधे कैंसर सेल्स हैं वो सीधे शहर नहर के किनारे से सीधे पानी पी रहे हैं उन्होंने कोई पाइपलाइन नहीं बिछाई है सो दिस इज अनिक प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ वेरी एग्रेसिव कैंसर सेल्स कॉल्ड वेस्कलोजेनिक मेमिक्री एंड हियर आई पुट अ चैलेंज टू द न्यू यंग जनरेशन ऑफ न्यूक्लियर मेडिसिन साइंटिस्ट दैट डेवलप सम मॉडल्स ऑफ फर्स्ट आइडेंटिफाइंग बाई रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल्स for diagnosis of vascular mimicry and then develop some inhibitors or blocker of the vascular mimicry now we come to the another prob problem that leads to recurrence and failure of cancer treatment that is stem cells this uh, stem cell is like uh, asuri pravarti which is stated in our vedantic philosophy you know there are two type of human beings devi pravarti and asuri pravarti so they are bad demonic or bad people and uh, so you give some treatment to cancer it will stop for some time and then um, it will grow why because these stem cells the resistant cells they will produce another population of cancer cells and after few years tumor will recur so we have to develop a policy where we attack not the normal cells but the stem cells and stem cell treatment again is being is a field of intensive research and this is a picture of showing cancer stem cell which has large number of pathways being activated tyrosine kinase pathway angiogenesis nf kappa b pathways and so many pathways and the unique property of these cancer stem cell that is they are hiding like terrorist they are hiding in the perivascular niche so outside the vessel there is a cell called pericyte और ये वेसल के बाहर छिपे हुए हैं जैसे डाकू लुटेरे टेररिस्ट छुपे रहते हैं चंबल की घाटी में छुपे रहते हैं डाकू वो पुलिस को भी मिलते नहीं कभी बस्तर की आप वादियों में जाइए तो वहां नक्सलवादी छुपे रहते हैं तो इट्स लाइक दैट द टेररिस्ट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दीज कैंसर स्टेम सेल्स आर हाइडिंग एंड वेन वी गिव कीमोथेरापी रेडियोथेरापी यूजली दे रिमेन हिडन एंड देर फोर वो पुलिस की और आर्मी की नाक से बच जाते हैं और फिर कुछ साल में वो ग्रो करके रिक्रेस कर देते हैं सो अगेन वी हैव टू डेवलप सम मार्कर्स फॉर आइडेंटिफाइंग वेयर द कैंसर स्टेम सेल इज एंड देन अटैक देम बाय रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल दिस इज अनदर चैलेंज एंड वी हैव टू डेवलप थेरेपी व्हिच इज टारगेटेड एनिंग द स्टेम सेल नॉट जस्ट द नॉर्मल कैंसर सेल्स नॉर्मल कैंसर सेल तो 80 टू 90% इन एनी ट्यूमर सॉलिड ट्यूमर दे आर डिवाइडिंग सेल एंड दे विल डाई देयर ओन डेथ After eight to ten divisions, they will die. So, मरे को क्या मारना? असली तो है वो stem cell है जो शेर की तरह बैठा है घाव की तरह उसको मारना है हमें क्योंकि normal cells तो वैसे ही मर जाएंगे. Next is 
tag radioisotopes which have high EPR phenomena. And we have been working on this molecule called fluorescein, which has enhanced permeability and retention property, the, which means basically uh, the cancer blood vessels, malignant angiogenic vessels, have a very leaky, they are leaky capillaries because there is a lot of a space between the lymph, these uh, epithelial, endothelial cells. And the molecules which leak in large amount will easily pass through these capillary gaps. And once they have leaked out, then uh, if they are able to stay in their tissues for a long time, so that is called EPR phenomena. They leak out because there is increased, increased blood flow in the tumor. Having leaked out because of increased permeability, then they stay. And fluorescein is one such molecule because it binds to the heat shock protein, HSP protein present in many tumors, especially in breast cancer. So that is, we have to develop those molecules and fluorescein is one such molecule and I am told that Dr. Jaya's uh, group, Dr. Arti particularly is working on fluorescein, but I will suggest that work on fluorescein sodium, not an FITC because FITC is mostly used by histopathologists for staining the tissues. So we did work on fluorescein sodium at ACTREC in Tata Memorial Research Wing and for sentinel node biopsy and later on it has been used for margin assessment. So if we have this advanced cancer, in spite of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgery, and other targeted therapy, half of those patients will die in three to four, five years. Those remaining half will live with big scars, painful shoulder, swollen arm, and a huge cost, cost to the exchequer of the country. So therefore, we feel that treatment of advanced cancer is a societal waste. After initial Poisoning. Chemotherapy is like virtually poisoning the system. You know, entire cells, whole body is poisoned. And then extensive surgery is like chopping the part of the body. And radiotherapy is like roasting the body. So after initial poisoning, chopping, and toasting, uh, 70 to 80 percent of them will either die or live with scars and huge cost to the exchequer of India. So we have to develop some neoadjuvant therapies like. We give neoadjuvant therapy for breast cancer and other many tumors, oral cancer and GI cancer also being used. So we, similar to that, we have to now develop neoadjuvant um, radiopharmaceutical therapy so that because when the tumor is intact in the body, it has intact vasculature. The oxygenation is good. So hypoxic cells are more resistant to any kind of therapy, especially radiotherapy. So we have to treat the tumor when it is in situ with its intact blood vessels because then the drugs or the radiopharmaceutical molecules have greater chance to percolate through and reach the tumor. Because once we have done the surgery, we have removed the tumor, then there's a lot of fibrosis and some stem cells, etc., are there hidden or surrounded by fibrous capsule. So there, the excess of the drug or the radiopharmaceutical molecule to those remaining residual cancer cell will be less. So treat it before uh, we remove it surgically. And now there are some ideas, uh, radioactive, new radioactive therapy. Then we can also develop photodynamic therapy because the problem with radiotherapy is that we cannot repeat it. It causes persistent or prolonged mitotic arrest. The cells go in the Z0 or G1 phase and they remain in that mitotic arrest for a long time. Therefore, in most cases, radiotherapists say, no, we have given full dose of radiotherapy, six to 7,000 rats. We cannot repeat at least two to three years. Otherwise, the whole cells will die. There will be radionecrosis. So that is another challenge. For radio pharmaceutical may be may be repeated or similarly photodynamic therapy can be repeated. So tag, there is one such molecule which is very gentle chemotherapy. It is it's a pro-drug for 5-FU, capacitabine. It can be given orally. It's very safe. Toxicity is much less because it is acted upon by a molecule which is a uh, which is an enzyme thymidine phosphorylase which is present in tumors. So you give this capsule which is a pro-drug it will not act on the normal cells. It will go through the circulation to the tumors where it will be released and converted to the active drug 5-FU and then will kill selectively the cancer cells. So we have to probably tag such molecules like capacitabine with some radiopharmaceutical beta or alpha emitter which can kill those cells selectively. Lepatinib is another molecule which is a dual EGFR and 
human epidermal growth factor receptor blocker. Again, we have a possibility of tagging such molecule to, again, it is given orally. So we can tag this with some radio pharmaceutical with beta or alpha emitter and then have some beneficial effect. So we have to probably develop more of drugs which can be given orally because systemic chemotherapy is very difficult. Uh, the, all the veins get sclerosed and patients really are troubled. They say, Ki, Dr. Saab, kuch bhi kar lije, chemo nahi lagwaenge. Roti hai wo, pair pagadate ge, or kuch kar lije, chemo nahi lagwaenge. So it is so toxic, it is so poisoning the system. So we have to develop more gentle systemic therapy and radio pharmaceuticals can be, uh, can have a better chance and replace more toxic chemotherapy. Another area that we can venture into is use some Ayurvedic herbal properties. There are about 10 or 12 um, uh, herbs which are strong anti-mitrotic action. So one such plant is called Sadabahar or Periwinkle. Many anti-cancer drugs like Vinca, Vinca, Vincristine, Vinblastin is derived from the, this plant. Taxane is another plant from where uh, it is derived from the, the bark of the tree. Uh, it is like a conifer. And similarly, there are other, cannabis is another plant where it contains tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidol. Both are strong antimitrotic action. In many animal models and some human studies, again, it has shown beneficial effect. Bhang, this is called bhang in Hindi. Uh, Dr. Shamim, <laughs> So uh, this also prevents tumorigenesis. So we should again uh, uh, try to develop some radio pharmaceutical tagged to the extracts of these herbal properties and com compounds because they have themselves antimitrotic action. And if this antimitrotic action is combined with the radio pharmaceutical beta or alpha emitter, it will probably potentiate their effect or augment their effect. And a lot of research is going on on cannabinoids. In fact, there is a university in Mississippi, there's a Marijuana University. The whole university is dedicated to, uh, you know, Marijuana research. And uh, many states, uh, they have uh, approved the legal use of Marijuana. It's an over-the-counter medicine. Aloe vera is another plant which has a strong anti action. And um, it, it, in fact, it has a natural occurring anthracycline, like andriamycin, doxorubicin, it has a natural occurring anthracycline. And Ayurveda Char also used the extracts of aloe vera. So again, you have a chance. So there are many such plants where we can develop some, um, you know, uh, this uh, tag checkpoint inhibitors, you know, like the immune checkpoints, again, they induce apoptosis, they induce autophagy. So again, we have to do research where radio pharmaceutical could induce apoptosis, induce aut autophagy, and thereby achieve tumor cell kill. So these, are, so these are some of the thoughts. And develop radioactive molecules against specific receptors. There are already a lot of research is going on. And again, develop targets against the vascular uh, tumor vasculature, especially vascular mimicry. Develop targets against the cancer stem cells. and in some tumors, we use interstitial brachytherapy, which is a type of radiotherapy, uh, like interstitials in uh, oropharynx, tongue, palatine tonsil, and in uh, cervix, we use interstitial brachytherapy. It is like some radio radioactive substance. So instead of radioactive substance, we can use radiopharmaceutical injected into the tumor to achieve tumor cell kill. The advantage would be that radiotherapy cannot be repeated at the same time, after two, at least for two years or so. Radio pharmaceutical perhaps could be repeated if there is a recurrence or residual tumor. So a few years ago, we wrote an um, interesting essay. Cancer cells are derived from our own body. They are not foreign. Coronavirus to foreign cell, tuberculosis bacteria foreign cell. Cancer cells have developed from our own body. So, as a child is a little indisciplined, a little bit of a badmashi, you can understand it, you can take a child psychologist, you can't kill it, you can't kill it from your house. So, in that way, cancer cells are your body. 
वो उनके अपनी जो शरीर के जो नियम थे नियम डिसिप्लिन थी वो उसको भूल गए हैं उस डिसिप्लिन को छोड़ के वो जैसे टेररिस्ट जैसे बन जाते हैं टेररिस्ट चाहे मार्क्सवादी नक्सलवादी वो अपने ही सोसाइटी के हैं अंग हैं वहीं से डेवलप हुए हैं क्योंकि वो हमारे समाज के जो नियम है डिसिप्लिन है उसको पालन नहीं कर रहे उसी तरह कैंसर सेल भी उसी तरह टेररिस्ट की तरह है जो हमारे सेल्स की जो नॉर्मल डिसिप्लिन है प्रोग्राम सेल डेथ है उसको भूल गए हैं तो टाइम हैज कम वेन वी शुड डेवलप सम साइकोलॉजिकल मैन्यूवर टू ब्रिंग दोज सेल्स बैक इन टू नॉर्मल सी राद एन किलिंग देम वो आपके दुश्मन नहीं है वो आपके अपने शरीर के अंग हैं तो वी शुड ट्रीट देम विथ टेंडर लविंग केयर एंड बेनिवलेंस एंड नॉट किल देम एज इफ दे वर एर एनिमी थैंक यू वेरी मच as a very different therapy as a paradox rather than keeping it as a loss or you are thinking it as a loss i think it is a good idea for everyone to think about it thank you we extend our gratitude towards all the speakers for their insightful knowledge and thanks to all the chair persons for guiding the session and next i request professor and head we uh, are mithil sir to present the memento to all the chairpersons and speakers coming to the last session young india future is bright which underscores the optimism and potential of the younger generation in the realm of radio pharmacy led by our esteemed chairpersons dr rajiv kumar assistant professor at indira gandhi institute of medical sciences patna and dr dhananjay singh consultant medical physicist come rso professor adjunct at yashoda hospital and research center gaziabad ncr So our first speaker is Dr. Nitanji Arora. Uh, our topic is synthesis and fusion of effective dopa and effective choline. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'll be discussing today about the synthesis aspects of two F18 label traces, uh, dopa and choline. Starting with dopa, uh, dopa is a precursor of neurotransmitter uh, dopamine and is transported across cells via amino acid transporters. It therefore reflects the functional integrity of presynaptic dopaminergic synthesis. it has found application mainly in uh, the evaluation of neuropsychiatric diseases and movement disorders uh, it has also used the, in uh, diagnosis of brain malignancies neuroendocrine tumors and pheochromocytomas coming to the synthesis aspects uh, the uh, whenever uh, a synthesis for a particular radio tracer is designed there are certain important considerations to be kept in mind Uh, such as uh, reaction yield radiochemical purity molar activity 
and ease of automation, especially for pet traces, uh, given the high radiation exposures involved. Besides these common factors, there is one factor that is specific to DOPA, and which is uh, uh, enantiomeric uh, purity. Uh, DOPA actually exists in uh, two enantiomeric forms, D form and L form, of which D form uh, has a very low affinity for uh, amino acid transporters and is therefore uh, not usable for PET imaging. Ideally, only L form should be synthesized, but since practically this is not achievable, so the objective is to keep the D form to a minimal level. Keeping all these uh, considerations in mind, two to three automated uh, methods have been developed so far. I'll be discussing here the ABX method that we are using uh, at our uh, institute. The main steps of the synthesis are trapping of uh, F18, elution, evaporation, then fluorination, which is the main uh, synthesis reaction, followed by oxidation, hydrolysis, and purification. This is how the cassette looks like, DOPA cassette looks like after preparation. So uh, the F18 from the cyclotron is first trapped into this uh, uh, QMA cartridge and is then eluted with the tetrabutyl ammonium or TBA into the reaction vessel. It then undergoes evaporation. Then the precursor is added to the reaction vessel. Precursor in this case is basically a derivative of phenylalanine, which has four protective groups and one leaving group. The leaving group is the nitrogen dioxide, which is subsequently uh, uh, replaced with fluoride ion. This uh, fluorination process takes over uh, around eight minutes at 110 degrees Celsius. Uh, the intermediate, the fluorinated intermediate that we get after this uh, uh, reaction is then passed through this C18 cartridge for purification and is brought back to the reaction vessel with ACN. Then oxidation takes place. Oxidation uh, takes place with the, in presence of a benzoic acid derivative. What oxidation does is uh, this, this carbonyl group here, the CO group, is changed to the CO group, the carboxyl group. This change basically facilitates the subsequent step of the uh, synthesis, which is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis takes place with ethanolic HCl over 20 minutes to give us the final product. Now, this final product then sequentially undergoes purification using a set of four cartridges, starting with the C18 HRP and then wax and alumina. The final product is received in the product vial uh, uh, through a millipore filter in a citrate buffer. This entire process takes around 90 minutes. The final product volume is around 24 ml. Radiochemical yield is only 5 to 7%, which is a consistent challenge with uh, DOPA synthesis. However, the enantiomeric uh, purity of the product is very high. It is almost 99%. The reason for which is the uh, is, uh, precursor used in this method is uh, enantiomerically pure. Coming to choline. Uh, choline uh, is a natural ammonium salt and is a precursor for biosynthesis of phospholipids. And is, uh, its uptake is therefore increased in rapidly dividing cells, mainly the tumors. It has found uh, application mainly in diagnosis of prostate, lung, brain tumors. More recently, it is used in uh, parathi parathyroid adenomas as well. The main steps of synthesis of choline are trapping of F18, uh, elution followed by evaporation. Now, unlike DOPA, choline uh, synthesis uses two precursors, primary precursor and a secondary precursor. The main reaction, fluorination, occurs with the primary precursor. The product of this fluorination is then made to react with the secondary uh, precursor to give us the final product. This is how the uh, Choline cassette looks like uh, after preparation. The initial uh, steps are exactly the same as that of DOPA, uh, that is trapping with the QMA uh, cartridge, then elution into the uh, reaction vessel with TBA, followed by evaporation. Then the primary precursor is added. Primary precursor is basically dibromomethane, which undergoes fluorination at 120 degrees Celsius over five minutes. 
Now, the product of this fluorination is then uh, passed through a set of four silica cartridges and sent to this C18 cartridge. A C18 cartridge is preloaded with the, the secondary precursor, and which is dimethyl amino ethanol. Now, here in this cartridge, the fluorinated product reacts with the secondary product, with the secondary precursor to give the final product that is F18 labeled choline. Now, uh, one thing of note here is that the this reaction is not taking place in the reaction vessel. This reaction is actually happening inside a solid support cartridge, which is basically a C18 cartridge. Now, the product from this is eluted through a cation exchange column into the uh, product vial with a normal saline. Now, this synthesis takes around uh, 60 minutes. The product volume is around 3 ml. And the radiochemical yield is slightly better than that of DOPA, around 10 to 12 percent. Coming to the quality control aspects of these uh, radiopharmaceuticals, the routine tests include the visual inspection, the pH test, uh, which can be done using a litmus paper. Radionuclide purity can be tested by testing the half-life of F18. And uh, radiochemical purity, which can be uh, done using thin layer chromatography. In this, the stationary phase is silica gel strips. And the mobile phase is acetic acid methanol solution for DOPA and uh, normal saline ACN solution for choline. Both of them are uh, clear colorless solutions, which are free, which should be free from uh, any particulate matter. The pH of DOPA varies from 4 to 6, while that of choline varies from 5 to 7. The radionuclear, uh, the radiochemical purity for both these products is usually very high, around 98%, given the series of purifications that these two undergo while uh, synthesis itself. Uh, the RF for DOPA is around 0.2 to 0.3, and choline is around uh, 0.5 to 0.7. Now, due to the uh, procedural complexities, inherent procedural complexities of both these syntheses, there are certain challenges that we face. First, both of uh, them are time-consuming procedures. Second, uh, they have low chemical yield, which further necessitates the need for a longer bombardment. So it further increases the time of synthesis. So from the start of bombardment to the synthesis, end of synthesis, it is around uh, three to three and a half hour procedure. The inherent procedure complexities uh, also make it necessary to prepare both the cassettes and the kits very carefully. So things that should be checked carefully are uh, tubings should be checked for any pinching. Both the reaction vial and the product vial should be inspected properly for any damage, such as cracks or something. All the connections should be properly finger tightened. Now, there are certain uh, 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 failures that are because of manufacturing defects as well, for example, for faulty cartridges. And then uh, and there is need for a power backup because both the procedures are long, as I discussed. Uh, a power failure or power cut uh, during the synthesis will definitely lead to a failure. So having a power backup always uh, is always safe. I would like to thank uh, Mittal sir and Jaya ma'am for giving me this opportunity and congratulate the entire team for organizing such wonderfully curated uh, lectures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gitanli, for a nice lecture. I would like to add something. Actually, there is the evolution of synthesis of F-DOPA. We have uh, started from liquid target. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sorry, gaseous. Mm -hmm. So before we were doing from gaseous, yeah. and there are lots of tedious process during the gaseous synthesis. Yeah, we have to use tedious. liquid nitrogen, and uh, we have to be very careful about the leakage of gases. Yeah. Uh, from 2007 to I think 2012, we did uh, from uh, gaseous synthesis, and after that, Neptis module came, and uh, we are we were uh, started with uh, liquid uh, uh, target and liquid synthesis. Uh, there is a problem with uh, Neptis module; we can't push from. Uh, uh, module to hot cell yes. because they don't generate so much pressure so we have to collect it 
in the within the heart cell. So over to audience. Any question from the Dr. Gitanjali? Uh, so, Sage uh, <laughs> explains so well. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Gitanjali. Within a time, you have saved four minutes. Yeah, thank you. thanks for save the time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, I'd like to thank uh, this opportunity to invite Dr. Ram Ekwanda. And uh, I no doubt that I'm <laughs> So uh, it's a great privilege for me to invite Raksimat sir to deliver a talk on challenging and troubleshooting in the city of Pharmacy. So good evening, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Jaya Ma'am, Mittal sir, and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And it is really a uh, honor for me because I have learned from this institute and I, I will be sharing my practical experience about the challenges which we face uh, while doing the radio labeling. So uh, I will be speaking about the uh, challenges and troubleshooting for the therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals. And I, uh, in the slides, I will be giving brief introduction about the therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals followed by the radio labeling methods. And mainly, I will be focusing on the radio metal labeling, their challenges, and how to overcome them. So uh, radio pharmaceuticals, as we all know, they are a special class of pharmaceuticals, which are tagged with the radioisotopes. And uh, this is the era in which we are giving much emphasis on the uh, targeted therapy. And nuclear medicine definitely has immense potential in this field. Uh, to grow. So uh, f when we talk about the radionuclide therapy, we are basically using the isotopes uh, which emit particulate uh, radiations. And we tag them with a, vec uh, with a biomolecule, peptide, or uh, a chemical. And then we use it to target the uh, receptors or a particular uh, process uh, and to kill the cells. So similar to chemotherapy, uh, radionuclide therapy, it is also a systemic treatment in which uh, the radio pharmaceuticals uh, deliver the cytotoxic radiation dose to the cells. And the application of uh, radioisotopes in therapy date back to 1940 when radioiodine was first used for treatment of benign and malignant thyroid disorders. However, uh, in the recent years, after the uh, good results of uh, lutetium dotatate and PSMA therapy, a tremendous increase in the interest of the therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals have been observed, not only in the uh, academics, but also uh, from the commercial point of view. Uh, and there are certain advantages of the radionuclide therapy, uh, like, uh, unlike in case of uh, the external beam radiotherapy, uh, High dose is delivered for a very shorter time, and multiple sittings are required. So in case of radionuclide therapy, a low dose uh, is delivered to the tumor, but uh, it is delivered for a longer period of time. And uh, radionuclide therapies, they can be used both for the localized and metastatic tumors. However, uh, the uh, radiotherapy, external beam radiotherapy, it cannot be uh, used for uh, the diseases which are uh, widely spread. So uh, this is the table which is showing uh, the characteristics of different uh, radioisotopes which are being presently used or currently in development or clinical trials. So uh, from this, mostly uh, we are clinically seeing iodine-131, Y90, lutetium-177 uh, uh, more prominently than the uh, other tracers. And uh, this is another table which is showing uh, the characteristics of different uh, alpha emitters, of which actinium is now being widely used, but uh, there are cer certain uh, availability uh, issues. And apart from this, now we are also seeing uh, trials on uh, lead 212. Other uh, uh, radioisotopes, they are still under development. There are some uh, production issues or the uh, logistics issues. So. Uh, for uh, radionuclide therapy, the radio, uh, the radio pharmaceutical, it can be chosen on the basis of the physical and biological uh, properties. The physical properties include uh, half-life type of emission, the energy emitted, 
the daughter products which are produced, the method of production, and the radionuclide purity. And uh, you can see here a schematic diagram in which uh, different uh, LEDs are shown for alpha and beta emitters. So depending upon the disease volume, uh, we can choose which uh, isotopes uh, to uh, use, whether alpha emitting or beta emitting. And the biochemical properties, it includes the tissue targeting, the retention of the radioactivity in the tumor, in vivo stability, and toxicity due to the radiopharmaceutical. Now, uh, there are different radio labeling approaches which can be used. It depends upon the radioisotope also. So, uh, direct radio, for direct radio labeling, the radionuclide itself, it is uh, incorporated in the biomolecules. And uh, for indirect radio labeling, either prosthetic groups or biofunctional chelating agents, they can be used. So, uh, I'm not going into the details of the radio labeling procedures. So, uh, this is another table which is showing the most commonly used uh, radio pharmaceutical. So, here you can see that most of the radio pharmaceuticals like ID, iodine 131 sodium iodide, MIBG, or Y90 theraspheres, or samarium EDTMP, they are mostly available in uh, the commercially available. So, we are getting directly from the market and we are injecting in, into the patient. But in case of uh, lutetium, so most of the time we are doing the labeling in-house. So I am uh, restricting uh, my discussion mainly on the lutetium and uh, actinium labeling. So uh, in comparison to halogens, where direct labeling approach is more beneficial, the radio metals, they have reduced uh, activity. So, most of the time we are using the indirect method by using bifunctional chelator. So, it is very well known that a bifunctional chelator basically uh, performs the dual purpose in which uh, at one end it is binding to the radioisotope and at other end it is binding to the targeting vector. It can be a peptide or uh, antibody or a biomolecule. And depending upon the pharmacokinetic of pharmacokinetics of the uh, molecule, a linker may or may not be used. So usually, if a linker is used, uh, polyethylene glycol or some amino acids, they can be used to provide the stability or to uh, uh, enhance the pharmacokinetic property. So while uh, radio labeling, there are two main conditions that need to be taken care. So first one is the stability to the hydrolysis to prevent formation of insoluble collides. And second is the in vivo stability of the radio pharmaceutical, uh, basically the radio metal and the biofunctional chelate, so that once when we are administering the radio pharmaceutical, the isotope, it is not exchanged by any other ion in vivo. If it is not stable, so our whole purpose, whether we have a very good yield, so uh, it will not be achieved. So we will end up in exposing the patient unnecessary. Apart from this, while uh, Optimizing uh, radio labeling uh, for uh, any pharmaceuticals, the reaction pH, reaction temperature, buffer, and the amount of peptide to the metal. So that also uh, plays very important role. So uh, in case of lutetium, as it is discussed, we are uh, doing the radio labeling with uh, the help of bifunctional chelator. So a number of bifunctional chelators, acyclic and cyclic, are present. So uh, this is the stability constant uh, values for different different chelators, but most of the time we have observed, and it is very well known that DOTA is used for radio labeling, whether it is uh, lutetium or it is uh, actinium. So the protocol for radio labeling varies depending upon which type of lutetium we are using. As it is discussed in earlier uh, sessions also that lutetium, it can be produced uh, via direct uh, method in which we are uh, irradiating lutetium 176 with N gamma, or it can be uh, it produced by indirect method uh, using GWM 176. So when we are uh, using lutetium 176, so we are getting the carrier added lutetium, so the specific activity is less. And if we are using uh, the indirect method, so we are getting uh, very high specific activity lutetium, and there is a significant difference. So uh, for the non-carrier added, the specific activity can go up to 80 curies uh, per gram. And in case of uh, 
non uh, non in case of carriers added so the uh, specific activity is around uh, 20 millicurie per microgram so depending upon the type of lutetium there are different different la radio labeling methods the buffers used that can be changed so basically uh, the basic uh, protocol is first we have to uh, prepare the buffer and we have to maintain the ph of the buffer the hydrolysis for uh, lutetium it occurs above ph 6 so usually the reaction ph it may range from 4.5 to 5.5 it depends upon the protocol which we are using and there are different different buffers like ammonium acetate sodium acetate sodium ascorbic acid or ascorbic acid and along with this sometimes gentesic acid is also used as a stabilizer so once the ph of uh, buffer is maintained then we are adding the peptide to the buffer and then this reaction mixture it is added to the radioactivity after uh, adding the active uh, the buffer and peptide to the uh, lutetium activity so ph should be measured because lutetium is uh, coming in uh, hcl so slight variation can happen in the ph so uh, that has to be taken care after that we can incubate it for 30 minutes or 45 minutes depending upon the protocol and then after qc we can inject it into the patient now moving on to the challenges and uh, trouble shooting so first one is the specific activity it really really uh, affects the radio labeling so when we are getting the carrier added lutetium due to uh, logistic issues we can get less specific activity and according to the uh, eanm iaea guidelines maximum of 250 microgram of dota tate can be administered to the patient and we are usually using uh, 2.5 times of the uh, molar mass of the lutetium which is present in the reaction mixture so uh, in that case what we have observed is that in instead of using ammonium acetate buffer if we are moving on to the sodium acetate buffer good radio labeling yield is achieved with the same amount of peptide uh, if we are using ammonium acetate we might have to uh, increase the uh, peptide amount apart from this uh, since the activity uh, and the use of lutetium is increasing so there is a very common question which is asked that can we use the automated modules for uh, labeling with carrier added lutetium because most of these modules they are uh, standardized uh, with non carrier added lutetium so uh, the answer is yes we can use it uh, with the non with the carrier added lutetium but we have to uh, adjust some of the parameters first we have to adjust those in the manual labeling and then we can replicate it in the uh, automation but yes it can be possible and other thing is how to minimize the colloid formation so uh, reaction ph should be maintained uh, and apart from this it is always uh, suggested that rather than adding first buffer to to the radioactivity and then adding peptide uh, it is better to add Uh, buffer and peptide simultaneously or we can uh, first add the peptide to the buffer and then we can uh, transfer it to the reaction vessel uh, then it can uh, significantly reduces the chances of colloid formation and apart from this uh, from radiation safety point of view we have observed that uh, the lutetium it has uh, severe contamination can happen if we are negligent i will take two more minutes sir uh radiation concern so uh, whatever activity we are uh, handling so it is suggested one person should handle the activity and all the equipments like pipettes they should be separately marked for lutetium and once you have touched the activity you should not uh, do any uh, non radioactive work so a separate person should be there who should handle uh, the other things that way we can definitely uh, reduce the activity apart from this i also want to uh, uh emphasize on that that while we are doing the qc so it is important that if we are using any volatile uh, solvent so that should be prepared freshly otherwise there will be variation in the uh, concentration if we are using the old prepared uh, reagent and that can definitely affect uh, the uh, rcp and apart from this if we are uh, using uh, either itlc paper or uh, the silica gel paper that should also be standardized because we can have different result in one solvent our product it can move uh, to uh, 
the solvent and uh, other time it can be at the base so uh, that is important apart from this uh, on actinium uh, i would like to just mention that measurement of radioactivity is a challenge for actinium because the doses are very very less so for that uh, we can measure the dose by first calculating uh, whatever the calibration date uh, is there so we can calculate the theoretical uh, activity and then we can accordingly adjust our dial settings and we can check it that whether it is near to uh, the calibrated activity or not and apart from this it is very often asked that uh, uh, is purification with c18 mandatory in case of actinium because the activity is very very less and uh, it is very uh, costly so uh, we have chances of uh, like losing the activity while we are doing uh, the all purification and things so if we are getting a single peak immediately after reaction we should not go for c18 purification but you can see here on the left hand side there are two peaks so if we are encountering any such peaks apart from the main peak so then we should definitely uh, go for the purification and apart from this another important uh, aspect for actinium is that at what time you are doing the qc because uh, you can see here the graphs a and b so this is the peaks of free actinium immediately and after 2 hours and uh, the recoil effect it is well known for alpha emitters so it is suggested that we should immediately do the qc once the reaction is completed and once you have the qc you should immediately inject it into the patient so uh, you can see here in the uh, see image there is a single peak and the same qc for the radio pharmaceutical it was uh, done after 15 minutes and we can see here the required daughter product and if we are again scanning the strip at after 2 hours so we can see a single peak which shows that uh, the daughter radionuclides they are uh, again decayed so that is why it is important that we should not wait uh, for uh, the qc after once your incubation time is uh, over so uh, that is all so thank you very much uh, for this and i'm sorry i have taken a few more minutes yeah. thank you very much for your excellent presentation hall is open for one or two uh, people yeah i just want to ask that uh, when they are getting there uh, i going closely observe lutetium uh, dota and psma which we are getting from bread in the packing note as per enm guidelines psma is meeting the criteria of 1 to 2 mg per microgram so maximum 200 to 250 micrograms in but in dota we are matlab i have not seen more than 0.79 mg per microgram to usme to sir nahi. but for it i am not sure whether they are writing the specific activity after radio level i also have the same question Haan. in mind Kyunki so but... mail to dala hai apne logo ne par abhi wo samajh mein nahi aa raha mujhe kaisa kyun hai dota mein koi challenge hai kya aisa aapko lag raha hai kya ki psma mein mil ja raha hai 1 to 2 mg aur dota mein nahi mil pa raha kuch aisa unhone kuch sir this is i also don't know the exact but we have also observed that the radio level, although the chelator is same dota for psma 617 and for dota 8 but in case of dota there are labeling issues when the specific activity is low so if we are using higher amount of peptide then we are getting good radio labeling result i am also not sure what is the reason for that but yes it it happens so, yeah. thank you So our next next speaker is Dr. Priyanka Gupta. Uh, she will talk on clinical application of rhenium 188 radio pharmaceutical. Ma'am, uh, this is your second. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, rhenium has around 33 known isotopes of which only two are radioactive that is rhenium-186 and rhenium-188. But there have been production hassles with rhenium-186 uh, because it requires uh, high epithermal cross sections for production uh, in a nuclear reactor and for cyclotron it requires high proton energies. So rhenium-188 has been more widely used because of its easy availability from the tungsten rhenium generator. It has favorable physical characteristics, a half-life of 17 hours and emits beta of 2.12 MeV. Also, it emits imageable gamma. So whenever we use it for therapeutic purposes, we can also image it along with. Now, rhenium decays to osmium by beta decay. Now, the main advantage of using rhenium is its easy availability from the tungsten rhenium generator. Once you get the generator, the generator survives for around four to six months and it provides consistently high yields of uh, rhenium-188. So this diagram depicts a generator. We have tungsten 186, which undergoes double neutron bombardment and forms tungsten 188. This tungsten 188 is loaded onto the alumina column and this becomes our generator. Tungsten 188 decays by beta emission to rhenium 188, which can then be eluted from the generator by using saline, uh, just the normal elution process as that of a technetium generator. This is the pictorial uh, depiction of the rhenium generator. So the clinical applications of rhenium-188 radiopharmaceuticals include bone pain palliation by rhenium, HEDP, and DMSA, radiation cyanovectomy by rhenium-10 colloid, treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma by rhenium lipidol and by rhenium-188 microspheres, treatment of basal cell carcinoma and keloids by rhenium label patches, uh, tumor therapy by rhenium label antibodies and peptides, and EVRT by rhenium label uh, angioplasty balloons. The first application is bone pain palliation for which rhenium HEDP and DMSA5 both have been used. Now rhenium HEDP has been used for treatment of metastatic bone pain from METS due to lung, breast, prostate cancer. Rhenium MDP has also been labeled but it has shown less uptake in the skeleton and high uptake in the soft tissue. So the basic reason for this could be uh, like though rhenium and technetium they are in the same group but still due to the large size of the atom of the rhenium there may be some minor differences in the chemical properties and rhenium HEDP has shown to have high labeling efficiency and uh, increased up in the skeleton and once it is taken up in the skeleton it is retained for a longer time in bone metastasis because of which it carries out its therapeutic effect. Response rates of approximately 80% have been achieved using rhenium HEDP without any severe side effects. And uh, in many studies, repeated treatments have been given with rhenium HEDP, which have led to increased uh, those increased response. So rhenium HEDP has been used for treatment of uh, bone meds due to lung, uh, breast and prostate cancer and almost 75 to 80% of the patients report uh, pain relief and with uh, higher doses or with repeated treatments, increased response has been noted. Now this image shows uh, technetium MDP and rhenium HEDP uptake in the patient with bone meds. The A and B image are the anterior and posterior projections of the technetium MDP bone scan, while C and D is the anterior and posterior images of HEDP scan. We see that rhenium HEDP has similar uptake as that of technetium MDP. It has increased uptake in the bone metastasis. Also, it washes out faster from the normal skeleton. And so it's like it is taken up more in the bone meds and the stay or the retention is also more. So it brings out its clinical efficacy. The next is rhenium 188 uh, DMSA. It is used for treatment of medullary carcinoma of thyroid or uh, metastasis from breast carcinoma or prostate carcinoma. It has a problem of high renal uptake. So uh, uh, 
in one study, the synthesis was done using sodium metabisulfite instead of stannous ions as reducing agent, and that complex showed less renal uptake. Next application of rhenium pharmaceuticals uh, is rhenium antibodies. Now, rhenium-188 can be incorporated into the antibody either by reduction of disulfide bridges or through bifunctional chelating agents or by forming a rhenium tricarbonyl core. Now, rhenium label antibodies have been used for treatment of gastrointestinal cancer and in high-risk leukemias. It has also been used for treatment of malignant gliomas, where it has shown delayed survival of the patients. The next is rhenium peptides. These are basically somatostatin analogs. And uh, here the disulfide bridge linking the two cysteines is reduced, and this is used for complexing with rhenium. But uh, nowadays, uh, lutetium is the isotope of choice for labeling peptides. The next application of rhenium is in endovascular radiation therapy. In endovascular radiation therapy, rhenium perinate or MAC3 filled angioplasty balloons have been used to inhibit coronary re restenosis following high pressure angioplasty. And here, basically, radioisotopes are either coated on the stents or they are filled into the liquid, uh, or the liquid is filled into the balloons, and then this is used for the uh, angiography, angioplasty. So, uh, using rhenium coated stents, um, the target vas vessel revascularization rate was significantly lower, and restenosis was also lower in case of rhenium uh, 188 um, coated stents. The next application is rhenium 188 uh, tin colloid for cyanovectomy. Now, uh, rhenium 188 tin colloid has been used extensively for treatment of inflammatory knee joint conditions specifically for those joints which are refractory to the conventional treatment. And uh, the procedure involves first preparation of the rhenium tin colloid. And it is instilled directly into the synovial cavity or the joint space. Here, the radio label colloidal particles are phagocytosed by the inflamed hypertrophic synovial lining. And uh, once phagocytosed, it causes the subsequent cell damage and sclerosis of the synovial membrane. The clinical effects seen are reduction in pain, swelling, and effusion. Now, after, uh, after injecting rhenium tin colloid into the joint space, we transfer the patient for imaging. And this is a typical inverted U shape, uh, which we see on imaging, which shows that there has been no extra articular distribution and no activity in the puncture channel. This is a blood pool scan of a patient with uh, a refractory rheumatoid arthritis in both the knees. Uh, only right knee was treated, and we can see reduced activity in the right knee post-therapy while the left knee was untreated. The next is rhenium lipidol. Um, Dr. Shamim has already spoken about rhenium lipidol, so I won't go in details. Lipidol is a iodinated and esterified lipid of uh, poppy seed oil. It is used as an embolic agent because of its high viscosity. Initially, uh, TDD lipidol and HDD lipidol, lipidol were used, but they had their own problems, uh, which were like lower retention in TDD lipidol and lower yield in HDD lipidol. So acetylated HDD kits were developed, and rhenium-188 labeled uh, AHDD lipidol was synthesized. It had increased uh, yield of up to 78 to 80 percent, but practically we never got 78 to 80 percent yields. The latest one is DEDC complex, which is used for labeling of rhenium 188 with lipidol. It has a labeling yield of more than 95 percent and high in vivo stability. Also, the retention is very high. The major advantage is, as Dr. Shamim has said, that it is indigenously produced and easily available from Brit which reduces the therapy of cost of the therapy. The next application of rhenium-188 is rhenium-188 microspheres. Uh, rhenium-188 microspheres have been used uh, for treatment of HCC or liver meds from other carcinomas. 
the microspheres have less excretion as compared to lipidol based agents and a higher effective half life because of which their therapeutic effect uh, could be much more there as compared to lipidol but it may also exert an embolic effect on the liver and hence its safety is uncertain if the patient has portal vein thrombosis so i'm not sure if jaya ma'am has done any patients with pvt yes we are doing a better response in pvt because the size of microspheres not embolic not giving embolic effect okay so initially these were done but uh, there was no favorable response but recently uh, jaya ma'am has again dr jaya shukla has again reinvented them and uh, she has also got the patent for rhenium microspheres i believe and uh, uh, it has a very high labeling yield of more than 90% and very good response in patients with hcc The last application is patch radiation therapy which is used for treatment of basal cell carcinoma in keloids. In this a customized radioactive patch is uh, made which can be applied like a mold for a predetermined time and once the radiation dose is delivered it can be uh, removed over from over the lesion. It treats the lesion by direct radiation and an important point to note is that since the patch is sealed so the radioisotope does not come in contact with the lesion. it is only the beta particle that is released from the uh, isotope that uh, interacts with the layers of the skin and brings out the therapeutic effect so for basal cell carcinoma biopsy proven patients with bcc have been taken and we give around 100 gray per centimeter square in 5 fraction on alternate days now we have reduced it to 3 fractions and in 12 weeks uh, there has been complete clearance of the tumor initially hypopigmentation and atrophy is seen which gradually subsides and i believe jama must have also seen this they make patches with rhenium colloid we use rhenium uh, per unit only and uh, the best part is there has been no relapse of uh, tumor with this treatment this is a patient with bcc at right nasolabial fold and after uh, therapy we see complete healing of the lesion uh, though has Though, though we can see uh, areas of increased hypopigmentation but in a later picture we can see the hypopigmentation is reduced the bottom two slides are the pre treatment and the post treatment biopsy slides of this patient the purple areas they are the these are the carcinogenic cells while the other slide it has mostly the pink stain which shows it is the healthy tissue for treatment of keloids patients with clinically diagnosed keloids are taken and we give 50 gray per centimeter square and response is assessed on the basis of reduction in uh, percentage reduction in size of the lesion and patients and physicians global assessment and even with treatment of keloids we have not seen any relapse this is the first image is the patient is of the patient with keloid lesion on the shoulder and we see it was almost flattened after the therapy the patient also reported symptomatic relief the uh, second image is the patient with the initial keloid lesion on the chest and the lesion was again flattened after the therapy and the patient reported symptomatic relief so to conclude rhenium 188 can be used for almost all the therapeutic applications in nuclear medicine except for thyroid cancer and p vera and since it is easily available from the generator that is once we get the generator it is easily available from the generator and that makes its usage very convenient and cost effective thank you thank you for well within the time so hall is open for a quick comments and a one or two questions uh, if there is no Thank you uh, thank you audience <laughs> uh, so uh, with this uh, we uh, would like to conclude this session before concluding this session i would like to thank uh, mittal sir and ja sukla ma'am to uh, uh, introduce a new session uh, young india future is bright at least it is a uh, motivating and we hope we do hope that in future it will be continuing by our leaders थैंक यू सर लेकिन फ्यूचर ब्राइट उन्हीं का होगा जो अभी तक टिके हुए हैं जो चले गए उनका फ्यूचर ब्राइट नहीं होगा
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू मैम एंड टीम पी डी आई वी एक्सटेंड अवर ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ऑल द स्पीकर फॉर देर इनसाइटफुल प्रेजेंटेशन कवरिंग टॉपिक्स सच एज द सिंथेसिस एंड क्वालिटी कंट्रोल ऑफ एफ एटीन डोपा एंड एफ एटीन कोलिन चैलेंजेस एंड ट्रबल शूटिंग इन थेरापूटिक रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल्स एंड क्लिनिकल एप्लीकेशन ऑफ रीनियम वन एट ट्रेटेड रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल्स एज वेल एज टू द चेयर पर्सन फॉर देयर गाइडेंस थ्रू आउट द सेशन नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर अश्वनी सूद टू प्रेजेंट द मोमेंटो टू द चेयर पर्सन एंड स्पीकर contribution throughout this event with this we now conclude the cme and cordially invite all distinguished faculties and delegates to join us for a